welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense, to the fear you can hear. I have a story for you about a writer, a writer of books. We all know what it is to read a book. We all read, sometimes to learn, sometimes to pass the time, sometimes to experience a life unrelated to our own, and sometimes to surrender ourselves to the fantasies of a person we have never met and will never meet. But what is it to write a book? Ah, that's another thing altogether. But what difference does it make? All the difference in the world. Well, it's not as if it were real. It is real. Don't you see that? Well, uh, I mean, it's not real life. It is real life. It's a life more real than yours or mine or any life that anyone will ever live. How can you say that? It's just a book. Our mystery drama... Three Women was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Ruth Ford. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll return shortly with Act One. What is a book? Two, three, four hundred pages of words lying side by side in rows. That's all. Words we all know. Many of them we use. Nothing mysterious about the words themselves. But they are not thrown helter-skelter on the pages, are they? No. They lie there in a certain order. Each one following on the one before. And who prescribed that order? Who put this word here and that word there? A writer. And this is the story of a writer named Stephen Lake and the book he wrote. Yes? Uh, does Mr. Lake live here? Yes. Is he home? Yeah, he's home. Um, could I see him? Well, he's working. Well, could you tell him, please, it's Mr. Higgins to see him? Higgins? I'm a publisher. Look, could I step inside? It's terribly cold out here. Well, I guess so. He really is working, isn't he? I mean, I hear him. He's a typewriter. You're a publisher, you say? Yes, that's right. If you just tell him... You can go on up. Up? Yeah, up that ladder. That's where he works up there. Oh, thank you. You get to the top, just bang on the trap door. Where? Yes, thank you. Bang hard so he'll hear you. Yes, all right. He heard you. Mr. Lake, I'm Albert Higgins. Albert Higgins? Not from... (laughs) Yes, from Higgins and Hart. All right to come up the rest of the way? All right. Well, I should say... Uh, Can you make it? Can I help you? I think I can. Yes. Here we are. Uh, I can't believe it. Mr. Albert Higgins. Very same. This where you work? Uh, Yes, it's the only place I can get away. I live with my wife and my mother-in-law. That was my mother-in-law who let you in. Well, it's nice and secluded up here anyway. Uh, May I take your coat, Mr. Higgins? Oh, thank you. No, uh, actually, I I think I'll keep it on. You're cold. Well, it's awfully cold outside. Well, I think it's even colder in here. (laughs) I get where I don't notice it. You have a stove, I see. Yes, but sometimes I forget to put wood in. Uh, just a second, I'll get it going again. That's a real old Franklin stove, isn't it? Genuine article. I haven't seen a Franklin stove in years. Well, they're great. If you remember to keep them lighted. Uh, please sit down, Mr. Higgins. All right. Well, now, I'd better explain what I'm doing here. I'd sure like to know. My secretary handed me your manuscript just as I was leaving the office for the weekend. We have a little ski lodge up here, my wife and I, right up the road from you, as a matter of fact. Yes, I think maybe I've seen it. Right off Route 7, about a mile north. Yes, that's it. Well, I was coming up by myself, and on the train I read your book. When I got to the lodge, I read it again. I like it a lot. Except for one thing. What's that? 
You've made one grievous error, Mr. Lake. Or, or may I call you Stephen? Call me anything. What's the mistake? You've killed off the most attractive character in the book. You mean Clarissa? <laughs> you can't do that, my boy. Why, nine-tenths of the book's appeal is the charm of that girl. She, she's another Scarlet O'Hara. You can't spend 200 pages making us fall in love with this marvelous creature and then, poof, just like that, have a die on us, go out of our lives. Well, you, you just can't do that. But I have to. Well, you don't have to at all, Stephen. You've written a marvelous book. I want to publish it. All I want from you is ten new pages, the last ten. Write me ten new pages at the end and let Clarissa live. I can't. I can't. Now, Stephen, that isn't asking much. It's everything. I can't do it. She has to die. She has to. Why does she have to die? Because... Because if she doesn't die, I don't know what will happen to me. Mm-hmm. Dinner ready? Just about. Mm, do you call Stephen? He gets so wrapped up in his writing. Well, he's not wrapped up now. Listen to him. He's thinking, Mama. He's walking up and down to help him think. Well, he can't be putting words down every single minute. He's been walking up and down like that ever since that man left. What man? What? Was somebody here? A uh, Mr. Higgins. Higgins? Albert Higgins? From Higgins and Hart? I believe he did say he was a publisher. Oh, Mama. It was our last hope. You know, every other publisher turned down Steve's novel, and he sent it to Higgins and Hart. But, but Mr. Higgins was here? They were up there together for about 15 minutes, and then the great Mr. Higgins came tumbling down the ladder like the devil himself was after him. Very red in the face. Looked at me like everything was my fault and catapulted it out of here. But you didn't ask Steve what happened? Loretta, when have I ever asked Mr. Genius-type novel writer Stephen Lake anything? He feels like telling me, he'll tell me, which he never does. I'm going to find out. Uh, good luck is all I can say. Stephen? It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. Stephen! Impossible, Clarissa, I can't... D darling, are, are you all right? Loretta? You just get home? Mm, Mrs. McGinnis wanted her windows washed. Uh, darling, Mama said... I don't want you washing windows. S uh, Stephen, Mama said there was a man here today. A Mr. Higgins? Albert Higgins. He really was here? He has a ski lodge up the road. Well, he didn't just uh, drop in, did he? What did he want? He read my book. He wants to publish it. Oh, Stephen, well, why didn't you say so? He wants me to change it. Well, uh, does he want you to, to change it a lot? Completely. Oh. Well, would that be a lot of work? The last ten pages. He wants me... He wants me to let Clarissa live. <laughs> is that all? Oh, Stephen. What do you mean, is that all? Clarissa is supposed to die. It's all been decided. She has to die. I can't let her go on living just to please Mr. Higgins. But it's not just Mr. Higgins. Oh, Stephen, I, I, I wasn't going to tell you yet, not for a while. But I can't go on doing housework for other people much longer. I never wanted you to do housework for other people. But pretty soon, I won't be able to. I'm... I'm going to have a baby, Stephen. You're not. You, you must be wrong. Oh, no, I'm not wrong. Not about this. You must be. Well, Stephen, aren't you glad? Just a little bit and coming right now. What with Mr. Higgins wanting to publish your book? Why, in the spring, we'll both be having babies. You'd be having your book, and I'd be having... I can't let Clarissa live. I can't do it. She has to die. Just the way I wrote it, she has got to die. Stephen, you're frightening me. I'm sorry. What difference would it make if you let Clarissa live? 
all the difference in the world. But it's not as if it were real. It's just a book. It's not just a book. Loretta, I, I, I can't talk about it anymore right now. Well, you think about it, won't you? About rewriting it? I'll think about it. <laughs> well, Mama says dinner's almost ready. I'll be right down. Well, don't be long. I won't. Clarissa. Clarissa, I can't let you live. Oh, yes, you can, darling. I can't. You can do anything you put your mind to, Stephen. Anything at all. You're such a great man, darling. You can do anything. Absolutely anything at all. You know you can. Mr. Higgins, this is Stephen Lake. I have to see you, sir. No, right away, if that's possible. I'll come to your place. Yeah, yes, it's better that way. In an hour. All right, sir, I'll be there. Oh, that's my sweet Stephen. My dear love. My own brilliant boy. My Stephen. I'm glad you called me, Stephen. I must say I was a trifle perturbed at your outburst this afternoon. It seemed such a little thing I was asking to kill off a character like Clarissa in the last ten pages when you've spent the entire book constructing her, her, her magnetic personality. It's not right. I have to do it, sir. But it's cheating, leading your readers up the garden path. I'll tell you something, which perhaps I shouldn't, but anyway, I discussed with my wife the possibility of a sequel to this book, using the same central character. Clarissa? It's a shame to waste a character like that on one book. There should be another, and perhaps another. How can we do that... If you kill her off at the end of your first book... Mr. Higgins, I've been writing for seven years steadily. I've never sold anything. Six years ago, I got married. My wife, Loretta, has been working as a domestic all these years. And her mother goes out every day to do other people's laundry. I haven't brought in one red cent in all that time. But now you will. Lots of red cent. The house we're living in, that's an abandoned one-room schoolhouse. We bought it a year ago with every cent we had in the savings bank. Four hundred dollars. At a county auction. The room where I work used to be the place where they stored supplies. We got the Franklin stove from a junkyard. If you want the truth, we stole it. Young risers never have it easy, Stephen. My wife has never complained. Never once. She's scrubbed other women's floors. She's washed their dishes and dusted their furniture and scarred their bathtubs and polished their silver. Well, in view of all this, I should think you'd jump at the chance to have your novel published. I do jump at it. I am jumping at it. Only... I can't let Clarissa live. She's got to die ten pages from the end of the book. But that's unreasonable. Don't you think I wanted her to live? Don't you think I kept her alive as long as I could? You think I wanted to kill her? I had to. I can't for the life of me see why. Because... Because... I'd fallen in love with her. <laughs> oh, come now, Stephen. Deeply, hopelessly, irrevocably in love. Now, now, my boy, I've been a publisher a long time. I've talked to dozens of authors. They all fall in love with characters they've created. It happens all the time. Clarissa isn't just a character. Well, of course she is. She didn't exist before you created her, did she? She exists now. Good heavens, man. She came out of your mind. She has no life except the one you gave her. Maybe she did come out of my mind, but now she's got a life of her own. Well, in a manner of speaking, of course she has. And I want to prolong that life, Stephen. I predict great success for Clarissa and for you. You and Clarissa are one, you might say. No. No, we are not one. We must never be one. I want her dead. And out of my life. <sighs> On my word, I can't follow you. Mr. Higgins, if Clarissa is allowed to live, I shall desert my wife. Desert your wife? My wife is going to have a baby. 
Well, then why on earth would you desert her? Because I love Clarissa. I love her with the kind of love I never knew existed. A love that has more power over me than I have over myself. I can't fight it. I can't escape it. It haunts my waking hours and my dreams as well. Those last ten pages of the book weren't easy to write, Mr. Higgins. But I had to write them. I had to free myself somehow from a love that was destroying my soul, my life. I don't think you're quite sane, Stephen. Neither do I. Suppose... Suppose we were to publish the book as it is. Oh, if only you would. And Clarissa dies. What then? Why then? She'd go back to being a character in a book. And if you let her live... Then... Then I would follow her. My life. My body. Even my talent would belong to her. I myself would belong to Clarissa and to her alone. Everybody talks about love, but nobody does anything about it. Now, here for the first time, we have a man who wants to do something. He wants to kill the lady. It may not be the perfect solution, not one to be universally recommended. Still, it's something. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. It was an American writer who said it, and not so long ago. Novelists, whatever else they may be, are also children talking to children in the dark. Listen with me now to the second act of Three Women. Stephen is talking to Clarissa, a character he created in one of his books, In the Dark. Clarissa, I can't let you go on living. But I want to, Stephen. Of course you want to. We all want to. But I want to so badly, and it's your fault, Stephen. <laughs> Why is it my fault? Because you gave me such a wonderful life in your book. I enjoy it so much. I can't bear the thought of giving it up. Neither can I. Neither can I. To have had a life like that and then to die ten pages from the end of the book. I know, I know. When the book is published, you'll be dead. I don't see why, Stephen. I really don't. Because till now it's just been you and me and this room... And words on paper, but after the book is published... What will it be, then? It'll be something that sells for seven ninety-five, dollar fifty in the paperback edition. My goodness, you're counting on a big sale, aren't you? Just hoping. But it won't have a big sale if you kill me off, sweetheart. It might. What was that? Who came in? Probably my mother-in-law. She gets home early to get dinner ready. Will she come up here? I don't think so. She hardly ever does. Oh, then let's talk some more about how much you love me. She, she is coming up here. Oh, bother. Well, we'll talk some more later. I am not going to let you kill me off, Stephen. It's too cruel. Uh, just a minute. All right, to come up. Of course, Mother, give me your hand. What? Please. How do you stand it? I like it. It's cold, too. The fire's gone out. You been working? Oh, uh, no, not much. Well, what have you been doing? Figuring something out? Well, uh, trying to. Figuring out what to do with the last ten pages of your novel? More or less. Stephen, it's not up to me to tell you what to do. Then don't. I don't know one book from another, but this book of yours, it's a novel, isn't it? It's a novel. About made-up people, right? Yes. So what's the difference? You can do what you want with made-up people. They can live as long as... <laughs> as long as you're alive to write about them. True? Is that true? Yes, yes, that's true. So, if Mr. Higgins says you should let this character, this uh, Clarissa, go on living, what's the difference? Let the lady live. Who cares? Also... And I don't mean this as a reproach. We can use the money. Believe me, I know that. So, if a little lady is worth more alive than dead, I say let her live. Yeah. Not a lot of work. 
the way I understand it from Loretta. I mean, you don't have to write the whole book over. Just the last ten pages. Well, what's that? You can knock that off in no time. Well, I better be getting on down and get dinner started. It'll be ready in about half an hour. I'll be down. tasted it. Well, what I did taste was awfully good. Mm, nobody's going to eat anymore, I'll clear. Well, let me help, dear. Oh, don't be silly, Mama, and I'll finish up. You go back to work if you want to. Well, all right, I I guess I will. Poor Stephen. He looks awful. He hardly eats anything anymore. I had a talk with him today about changing a book. What did you say? I said, what's the difference? Character in a book can be alive or dead. Who cares? Stephen cares. Well, why should he? Oh, Mama. He's a writer. Writers care about these things. It has something to do with, um, artistic integrity. You think maybe somebody's putting things into Stephen's head? Artistic notions, things like that? Who would do that? Mr. Higgins wants him to change the book. I wasn't thinking of Mr. Higgins. I was thinking of some woman. What woman? I don't know what woman. I don't suppose I should say this, but lots of times I hear him talking up there. Uh, oh, Mama. Steve talks to himself all the time when he's trying to work things out. This isn't talking to himself. This is talking to somebody. There's a big difference. And another thing, that that mattress he has up there, it looks to me like there's two people been lying on it. Mom! All right, all right, all right, all right. I told you I shouldn't say it. Now I'm sorry I did. He didn't seem very happy about the baby. I should have kept my mouth shut. Oh, that's all right. You finish up the dishes. I'm going up to talk to him. Don't say I said anything. Don't tell him we've been talking. I won't. Yeah, just a second. I'm not disturbing you, am I? Of course not. Well, I didn't hear the typewriters, so, uh... Stephen, do you love me? What kind of a question is that? <laughs> it's the kind of question wives are always asking, even if they never say the words. Yes. I love you. Are you glad we're going to have a child? Yes. Yes, I'm... I'm glad we're going to have a child. <laughs> well, ask a straight question and you get a straight answer. That's the way it should be. So, I'll ask you another one. Why don't you want to change the book? <sighs> Retta, I... I just don't. Well, it's not a straight answer. I know it isn't. I, I, I just can't. Stephen, I'm going to ask you another straight question. Are you interested in some other woman? Interested? Mm. No. Because if you are, I'll go away. No, I don't want you to go away. I'll go away and have the baby someplace else. Oh. Do you get over this other woman, then I'll come back. Or if you don't get over her, I'll stay away. Oh, Loretta. Stephen, can you swear to me that there's no other woman in your life except me? Can you promise me that? Loretta, I swear to you, I promise you that I love you. 
that I love you, that I want you for my wife for always, for as long as we live. I guess I'll have to be satisfied with that. It's the truth. <laughs> All right. I'll let you work now. Oh, I thought she'd never leave. Please, Clarissa, I don't feel like talking to you right now. Why didn't you tell her about me? How could I tell her about you? She wouldn't believe me. Nobody would. Darling, you know what I was thinking while Loretta was going on and on about herself and you and the baby she's going to have? I was thinking, why don't I have a baby? Oh, not in this book, of course, but later on in some other book. I'll have this perfectly gorgeous child who will have my sweet disposition and your marvelous grace. How about that? Mama, I asked him if there was somebody else, another woman. Oh, well. He said he loved me and wanted me for his wife for as long as we live. Well, I still hear him talking up there, and it certainly sounds to me like he's talking to somebody. Oh, Mr. Higgins, come in before you freeze to death. Winter's closing in on us. It sure is. How are you, Mr. Higgins? Hi. Hi, and I thrive on the cold. Uh, Mrs. Lake, mm -hmm. your husband's in, I hope. Mm -hmm, he's up there, working, I guess. Has he talked to you about, uh, you know, about Clarissa keeping her alive? He just says he doesn't want to. All right to go up and see him? Oh, sure it is. Good luck, Mr. Higgins. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Higgins. Okay to talk to you for a few minutes, Stephen? Uh, I, I guess so, sure. I, uh, I thought I'd like to see how you're getting along. I'm not. You haven't done any work? None at all? Oh, a few pages. They're over there next to the typewriter. Okay to have a look? If you want to. Mr. Higgins, if you're here to talk to me about letting Clarissa live... I most certainly am. I'm not sure I can take it anymore. My mother-in-law is talking to me about it. My wife talks to me about it. Stephen, this is very good so far. And the hardest thing of all is Clarissa talks to me about it. Do you know what she wants now? She wants a baby. My baby. We could probably work in a baby later on. Mr. Higgins, if Clarissa has a baby... Am I going to love it more than Loretta's baby? Stephen, these pages are very good. Now write the last couple of pages. I've got to kill her off, Mr. Higgins, and never write about her anymore. Never. Oh, now, Stephen, stop it. Calm down and try to be reasonable. I can't be reasonable. I love my wife, Mr. Higgins. I want to live with my wife and our child. I can't live with her and Clarissa, too. No, Mr. Higgins. Clarissa has to die just the way I wrote it in the first place. If she dies in this book, then I can't write about her anymore. And if I don't write about her anymore, she won't exist. Stephen, I won't publish the book if Clarissa dies. I put it to you straight. Don't you think you owe it to your wife, to your mother-in-law, to yourself? To make this little concession? Concession? What will happen to them if you don't? What will happen to them if I do? Money is the root of all evil. And killing is certainly evil. Yet, here we have a man who wants to kill and is letting himself be talked out of killing for money. It leaves us with the perplexing question, what is evil? Maybe we'll find out when we return shortly for Act Three. Pity the poor novelist, alone with his thoughts, his visions, his conceits, his fancies, his only solid substantial companion, his typewriter. Stephen? What is it, Clarissa? 
Everybody wants me to live except you. I know, I know. And you're the one who loves me. I know. Nobody else even knows me. Except from reading the book, and that's not really knowing. Carissa, I wish you'd let me work. How am I doing? You're living. Oh. Just barely, but you're living. I thought I was. Because I was feeling so warm and loving about you. I know the only reason you're keeping me alive is for the money. You can't fool me, Stephen. If there was a way to kill me and still make the money, I bet you'd take it. There ought to be a way. Clarissa, you've given me an idea. Oh, it makes me very happy if I've given you something. You've given me everything. It's about time I gave something back to you. Uh, Mr. Higgins, Stephen Lake. Yes, uh, I have an idea. Uh, I have to talk to you about it right away. Can I come to your house? Well, that's all right. I have snowshoes. I'll be there in, uh, say, uh, half an hour. Thanks, Mr. Higgins. What kind of an idea have you got? Never you mind. I'm coming with you. No, I don't want you tagging along. I want to tag along. Where are my snowshoes? Right there. Now, what's this big idea you have to tell Mr. Higgins? None of your business. Is it about me? As a matter of fact, it is. So then it is my business. Stephen, you're not going to kill me off, are you? I thought that was all decided. Are you? Now, my idea is this, Mr. Higgins. I'll finish up the book just the way you want it. Good, good. Clarissa stirs and comes to life. Whatever it was she was dying of, she only went into coma, et cetera, et cetera. I'll work it out. I'll give you the book in a couple of days, maybe by tomorrow. Good. Then, if you still like it... Oh, I like it. It's yours. Only, I want it in my contract that whatever money the book makes goes to my wife. I want her to get all the proceeds. But it's your book. Why, well, I, I just happened to write it, that's all. And writing it... I nearly ruined my wife's happiness and my own. I don't want any money for that. Stephen, it seems to me that you're simply feeling guilty about your feelings for Clarissa. I am. Guilty as hell. And about the other books, the ones after this one. You're not going to tell me you don't want any of that money either. I want somebody else to write those things, not me. You're joking. Mr. Higgins, I've got to get Clarissa out of my head. And the only way to do that is to put her into somebody else's head. Let somebody else keep her alive, not me. Well, uh, I suppose we could find a ghostwriter, but... At least let me have those last ten pages with Clarissa alive. Mr. Higgins, you'll have them. Tonight. My, you are busy, aren't you? Very. You're working on the new ending to the novel, aren't you? That's right. And I get to live... And live and live and live. Clarissa, it's and... cold in here. Why don't you do something useful like putting some wood in the stove? I don't know how. Uh, you don't know much, do you? <laughs> Enough. Okay, I'll do it. Make a nice big fire, and then we can sit and talk about what's going to happen next. What do you mean by next? In all the other books, the ones you're going to write after this one. Yeah. Now blow on this fire, will you? Oh. At least you can do that. Okay. Go on, tell me about the other books. I don't know anything about the other books. Would you like to hear some of my ideas? Not really. Well, that's enough. You can stop blowing. It's caught fire. Ah, that feels good. I think the next novel ought to be in Venice. Clarissa, I have made a deal with Mr. Higgins. When I finish these ten pages, thereby keeping you alive, mm -hmm. I shall turn them over to him to replace the original ten. And then I shall write no more books. Well, no more books about you, anyway. 
But Mr. Higgins thinks I'm wonderful. He wants lots of books about me. He's going to get lots of books about you, but they won't be written by me. But who'll write them? A ghost. A ghost? I don't want to be written by a ghost. I'm part ghost myself. Oh, he'll be a real live man. A ghost writer. That's what they are called in the publishing business. But it won't be you? Definitely not me. But it will be a real live man. Yes. And now, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to get back to work. I wonder, will he be as handsome as you? Handsomer, probably. I wonder, will he love me the way you do? For his sake, I hope not. I wonder, will I love him? Why should you love him? Why not? You never loved me. That's the way you wrote it. I couldn't love anyone. Except yourself. But he might write me differently, mightn't he? He shouldn't. He should follow the character exactly as I've set it down in the first book. But if he falls in love with me, he might want it changed so I could fall in love with him. It would be so much more convenient for everybody. Clarissa, you wouldn't. Wouldn't what? Fall in love fall in love with the ghostwriter. Would you? How should I know? Well, you... You wouldn't have his child. You wouldn't do that. I think I'll put another piece of wood on the fire. Or would you rather do it? Clarissa, would you have his child? There. Oh, look. That's a nice fire. Lovely. Answer me. Would you have his child? Well, Stephen, if that's the way he writes it, I guess I'll have to. Stephen, what are you doing? Oh, no, no, you're not going to have his child, no. Stephen. You're going back to where you were in the original. You're going to die ten pages from the end of the book. You're not going to burn the new pages, Stephen. You're not. Don't. Uh -huh. Help. Help! Someone help me! I'm on fire! Help me! The quilt! Get me the quilt, please! Help me! Ah! I'll get it, Mama. Mrs. Lake. Mr. Higgins. It's Mr. Higgins, Mama. Oh. I haven't seen you since the funeral, Mr. Higgins. Thank you for the beautiful flowers. May I come in for a minute? Why, of course. Come in. Would you, uh, like a cup of tea, Mr. Higgins? I was just about to put the kettle on. Uh, thank you, no, Mrs. Lake. I, uh, I haven't wanted to intrude before this on your grief. Such, such a terrible accident. Mama and I can't figure out how it happened. You know, Stephen knew that Franklin stove so well. He, he'd used it for years. And then... It was like it sort of blew up in his face. Mrs. Lake, he was working on the new ending for the novel when he... when it happened. At least I think he was. Well, I don't know for sure, Mr. Higgins. He promised me I'd have the new pages that same night. He he acted as though he couldn't wait to get started. Well, then I imagine that's what he was doing. Mrs. Lake, would you mind if I'm not intruding? Could I go up and take a look? You see, if I can find them, I can just substitute them for the original last ten pages, and we can go right to work. I think we might be able to publish the book this spring. Why, that would be wonderful. At least you'd have a little money coming in. Mm, Stephen would have liked that. So is it all right if I take a look? Why, surely. You don't mind if I don't go up there with you. I haven't wanted to somehow since the fire. No, 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 that's quite all right. I'll go up by myself. Trap door is not locked, Mr. Higgins. Make it all right? 
Yes. Thank you. Fine. Oh, I suppose I should have cleaned up that place, but I just couldn't. No hurry. When the time comes, I'll do it. Never entered my head to look for those ten pages. No, never mind. Mama, if he if he finds the pages and publishes the book, and if it's a success, that'll be nice, won't it? Mrs. Lake. What is it, Mr. Higgins? You found them? I found something. I found these. These ten pages. Oh, thank the good Lord. All neatly stacked beside his typewriter. Oh, I'm so glad, Mr. Higgins. Glad? Have you read them? Well, no. Well, listen. Lovely, gorgeous Clarissa lifted her beautiful head. She wasn't dead after all. Well? But, but that that's not the way Stephen writes. I could hardly believe my eyes. That creamy complexion was beginning to pinken. Pinken? There's no such word as pinken. My adorable sweetheart had only fainted and wasn't dead at all. My goodness, but I was happy. Now I ask you... Stephen didn't write that way at all. Nothing like that. And who did? Who did write this awful trash? Mr. Higgins, you don't... Think that... Well, somebody wrote it. It's typed on his typewriter. You... You don't suppose it is possible that Stephen went mad and wrote this awful stuff while he was unbalanced? Mr. Higgins, if Stephen was a certified lunatic, he couldn't write ten pages like those there. Do you want them to keep for any reason? Oh, I don't think so. Well, I'll take them home with me and burn them. Mr. Higgins, does this mean that uh, that there won't be any book at all? Why, uh, I hadn't thought... I would so like to have a book of Stevens published. Tell you what we'll do, Mrs. Lake. We'll go ahead and publish the original version, the one where Clarissa dies. Oh. You say something? Mm, no. Sounded like a ghost, kind of. It really does sound like a ghost. Must be the wind. Huh. Well, I'll be getting along. And don't you worry, you two. There'll be a little money coming in. It's still a good novel, even with Clarissa dying. Too bad, though. I'd hoped Clarissa would have a long and happy life, but such is fate. And the moral of the story is... What is the moral of the story? How's this? Lie if you like, but never believe your own lies. Or, the man who fools himself is a fool indeed. Well, something like that. You figure it out. I'll be back shortly. The gift of youth is ours for just a little while. Fame is capricious. And money slips through our fingers. Health is a godsend subject to recall. Even the benison of love can elude us. Or it can wither in our hearts. But the blessings of imagination... Ah, they belong to us forever and ever. Our cast included Ruth Ford, George Petrie, Elspeth Eric, Joan Loring, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis. And that's the top of the news as it looks from here. Come in. Welcome. 
I am E.G. Marshall, and I have a ghost story to tell you, but a most unusual ghost story, since it violates all the established rules. You know the rules for a ghost story. It must be set on some desolate, windswept moor, or perhaps in a ruined, isolated mansion, or a lonely, deserted castle. However, this spine-tingling tale actually takes place in a modern, luxury, high-rise apartment building, and... In broad daylight. I don't want to die, George. Please. I don't want to die. Margaret, darling, listen to me. No. No. Margaret, it would be better. Better for who? For you, dear. For you. I have very little left, George. Please, just let me live a little longer. Margaret, life means nothing to you now. I know, but just let me live a little bit longer. I can't, Margaret. I can't. Our mystery drama, The Man Who Heard Voices, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hi, son. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Junior. Kellogg's Special K presents... Junior gives up. Junior, why aren't you eating your special K? It's your favorite cereal. Oh, just because. Just because why, honey? Just because Darla said some evil things about it. That's just because why. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Hi Darla. Darla. Hi, sis. Hi, Junior. Uh, Darla, what did you tell Junior about his special K? Daddy, all I told him was that special K is good for him. Yeah, and anything that's good for me never seems to taste good. But, Junior, you already know that special K tastes good. Who do I believe? Darla or my taste buds? Uh, what's that, son? Oh, nothing, Dad. Uh, son, special K is American. America's favorite high-protein cereal. It's got minerals, vitamins, iron, and all those good, nutritious things. But it got to be so popular over the years because it tastes good, too. You mean it's good for me and tastes good, too. Right, son. Right, Dad. Right, Junior. Right, Mom. Right, <laughs> right, indeed. Start your balanced breakfast with Kellogg's Special K. It's nutritious and delicious. Right, Dad. This is WOR New York, your station for the Mystery Theater. <laughs> No matter what you're saving for, that's what suburban savings for suburban. Suburban Savings offers you a regular savings account with flexibility. You can add any amount to your account whenever you wish. Withdraw whenever you want. Suburban Savings pays a 5.25% annual interest rate on regular savings paid quarterly, which earns an annual effective yield of 5.47%. Interest is compounded continuously from day of deposit to day of withdrawal, as long as $50 is maintained in the account to the end of the quarter. Come into Suburban Savings and open an account with flexibility. Our regular savings account in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. At 42, George Wesley Sanderson is handsome, intelligent, and wealthy. He is married to a most beautiful woman. He is a partner in a prestigious law firm. He has a host of friends because he is gracious, considerate, sensitive, and obliging. And so, you look at him sipping his morning coffee in his luxurious apartment in New York City, and you say to yourself, here indeed is one of fortune's favorites. How wonderful life must be for George Wesley Sanderson. But we have invaded his privacy. We have caught him alone and off guard. And so we see a look of terror in his eyes. And no wonder, because George Wesley Sanderson hears a voice. A woman's voice. It's time for my pills, George. The voice is clear and distinct. May I have my pills, George? But George is alone in the room. My pills? George? Not only is George Wesley Sanderson alone in the room, but the voice belongs to a woman ten years dead. Margaret. Margaret. George, you must give me my pills. Oh, no, no, no. no. George. Oh, George, I have my pills. 
Yes, yes, I'm, uh, I'm here, Sally. We all decided that you should be down here. Well, I, uh... Well, you what? Are you all right, George? Yes, yeah, yes, I'm fine. Good. Get on the plane. Well, well, darling, somebody has to work. Oh, come on. That silly place runs itself. Goodbye, dear. Georgie, are you sure you're all right? Yeah, yes, yes, I'm, I'm fine. And, uh, really, I, I have to get to the office. I notice you'd rather get to the office than fly to me. Darling, it's not what I'd rather do. It's what I have to do. My next husband will be a man with absolutely no ethics at all. Goodbye. My name, as you know, is George Wesley Sanderson. And I must talk to somebody, unburden myself, but there is nobody. Oh, my wife loves me. My father-in-law is most understanding. I have good friends. I could confess to a priest... Is it a psychiatrist? But you see, each in his own way would fail me because no one would accept the basic point of my problem. No one would ever believe that that I'm a man who hears voices. There are times when I can hear what people think, what they're going to think. And there are times when I can hear people who are miles away or, or even dead. It started, oh, 15 years ago. I was married to my first wife then. Her name was Margaret. She was 23 years old, vivacious, active, loved sports. She could even beat me in tennis, but she did it with such charm, I didn't mind it a bit. That's out. Oh, that looked in to me. Okay. <laughs> if you want the point, you can have the point. You should have a handicap anyhow. Okay. Just look out for this ace. Ha! <laughs> huh, an ace. How'd you like that, huh? I say, how'd you like that? Margaret? Margaret, is something wrong? No. I'm fine. Well, you had a funny look on your face. Did I? <laughs> it's just... Just what? Nothing, nothing. I... I I just had a funny little twinge in my back. But it's gone now. Your sir. Then and there, I heard a voice. It was the voice of our doctor. You both should know the truth. We don't know what's wrong with Margaret. She won't be able to walk. She'll have to stay in bed. For a while, anyway. These pills will keep her alive. Exactly one year later, the doctor spoke those very words to us in the hospital. Sent for me, Mr. Cartwright? Yes, George, sit down. Thank you, sir. George, I, uh, I read your brief on the Hollingsworth case. Brilliant. Is that what you'd like to specialize in? Criminal law? Yes, sir. Good. This firm could use a crackerjack trial lawyer. Uh, let's have dinner one night this week and start making some plans for you. Well, sir, I, uh, really can't go out much at night. You know? No, you see, uh, my, my wife is, uh, bedridden. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, we, uh, we don't even know what it is. One of those uh, mysterious ailments. Anyhow, she uh, has to have constant attention. I have a woman who stays with her during the day, but at night, I can't leave her alone. Hmm. Well, that's too bad. We'll arrange for lunch, perhaps. Then I heard his voice. His silent voice. But to me, it was crystal clear. Uh, that's all for now, George. I just wanted to let you know how pleased I am with your work. And the other partners are, too. Well, thank you, sir. Hi, 
Dad. Your secretary said you were busy, but I'll only be a minute. <laughs> well, hello. Who is this? Uh, this is one of our new young attorneys, George Wesley Sanderson, and my daughter Sally. How do you do? George Wesley Sanderson. Even sounds like a great lawyer. <laughs> now, dear, save that ravishing smile for where it'll do you some good. George Sanderson is a married man. And once again, I heard a voice. Sally's voice. I don't care if he is married. I want him. I never believed it, but now I know it's absolutely true. There is such a thing as love at first sight. I love him. Oh, thank you, dear. But I don't want any more. It's time for my pill. Oh, yes, so it is. I'll, uh, I'll get it for you. Those pills, they're like a lifeline. Well, let's be thankful they work. Oh, poor George. You've become a full-time nurse. And in addition, you've got a full-time job. You really don't get much sleep, darling. You have to set an alarm every two hours to give me my pill. Darling, we stood up together and we took a vow for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. In sickness and health. Till death do us part. Let's, uh, change the subject, huh? Okay. Well, how'd it go at work today? Oh, uh, everybody flipped for the way I handled the Hollingsworth case. Oh, will it mean a promotion? Well, maybe, but more important is the additional money. Oh, George. Now what? If you become important, we'll be expected to entertain Oh, no, and... no, nothing of the sort. I'm going to run my business the way I want I intend to do my work during the day, in the office. I don't have to socialize with people. Merit, ability, that's what should count. And for the third time that day, I heard a voice. This time, Margaret's. Oh, Lord. I want to live. I'm not much use. I can't do a thing. I'm a drag of a man I love. I'm good for absolutely nothing. But I want to live. And we have a clear precedent here. When Theodore Roosevelt was a uh, police commissioner of the city of New York, a question of injury incurred while making a citizen's arrest... Do you always uh, talk to yourself? Oh, I happen to be dictating into this recording. How did you get in here? <laughs> Being the boss's daughter ought to give a girl certain privileges. I came by hoping you might have pity on me. Pity? I'm famished. You might take me to lunch. Well, uh... Well, what? It wouldn't hurt you with the chief. Might even pave the way to a promotion. Well, on the other hand, it might backfire. How? Well, how does your father regard married male employees who take his daughter to lunch? I don't know. It's never happened before. As you legal types might say, there are no precedents. Come on. Take a chance. Live dangerously. I'll give my hat. <laughs> Darling, I'm sorry. I need my pill. No, it's okay. It's okay, darling. Here you are, dear. Thank you. There. Now, just uh, let me set the alarm again. You must be exhausted. No, 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 not really. Are you uh, feeling any better? Yes, a little. I was so tired when you came home, though, we couldn't even talk. And I look forward to our talk so much. Anything interesting happened today? Uh, no, no, just a lot of routine. What did you have for lunch? Lunch. Uh, lunch, let's see, uh, I just had a sandwich at the desk. Oh, George, you should go out. No, no, dear, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> She would drop by two, three times a week. And it just became, well, a, a thing we did. We were friends, that's all. I knew she was in love with me, but I was discovering something else. Something very unsettling, very disturbing. I was falling in love with her, too. I tried to fight it. Hop out right here. Okay. 
There. Well, now that uh, we've scared away every fish between here and Europe... <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do with a fish if I caught one. Well, uh, let's just drift for a bit, huh? Oh, you didn't have to say that. Say what? Drift. Haven't we been doing just that since the day we met? Yes, yes, I suppose we have. What are we going to do, George? I, uh, I don't know. I'm willing to settle. Settle? For half a loaf. Oh, no, 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 that, that wouldn't work. After a while, you'd get to hate me. No, George, I wouldn't. Well, I'd hate myself. Do you still love her? No. No, it's a terrible thing, but I, I don't love her anymore. You know, that happens to people. Just as they can fall in love, they can also fall out of love. It's, it's just that the timing and the circumstances are bad for Margaret and for me. But if you no longer love her... Well, how could I ever divorce her? Hey, hey, where are we going? I don't know. But the one thing I can't do is just to stand still. Nothing. And no one in this world ever really stands still. Wheels are always turning. Gears are shifting. Minds are changing. Perhaps slowly, imperceptibly, subtly. Even a marriage vow contains the seeds of its own dissolution. For it says, Until death do us part. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. Thank you, thank you. More than 75,000 letters, and they're still coming in. I am High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater. You've said such beautiful things, like bravo, 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 a breath of fresh air, and superb production. I love you, but there's one problem. So many of you ask questions, it's going to take weeks sorting through all that mail to give you an answer. So, if you need a quick reply to a specific question, please write again, and we'll try to answer promptly. Write Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. That's Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. And please, do keep listening. We hope... Radio Mystery Theater is here to stay. W.O.R. New York, your mystery theater station. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Hey, Ma, what you got? Hey, Ma, will it be much longer? My hunger getting stronger and I can't wait. She loves her family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets shop right do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Hey, Ma, what you got? Here's a dinner suggestion from your ShopRite supermarket. Grade A rock Cornish hens, just 59 cents a pound. U.S. number one Idaho baking potatoes, five pounds for 79 cents. And for dessert, Flavor King ice cream, half gallon, 69 cents. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. George Wesley Sanderson is in a motorboat just off Long Island on a beautiful day with a beautiful woman who loves him. And to make it perfect, he also loves her. However, there's a complication. George Wesley Sanderson is married, and he takes his vow seriously. We'll do something, Sally. You'll have to do something, George. People don't stand still. Yes, I know. You can't freeze a relationship. It grows better every day or it becomes worse. You fall in love because another person has something you need. And sometimes it's the terrible truth. When that person loses what attracted you in the first place, love also goes with it. I know, I know. So many people can't face up to it. They're unable to end a thing that really no longer exists. I love you, Sally. I love you, George, but... 
I'm human. If I can't have you, sooner or later, I'll face it, and then I'll make other arrangements for my life. Sally, wait for me. Oh, I'll wait, George. But I can't promise to wait forever. Just then, I heard another voice. It was a voice I'd never heard before, but there was no, no mistaking who it could be and what the meaning was. And do you, George, take Sally for your lawful wedded wife to have and to hold? Oh, Sally, darling, don't ask me how or when or why. But... <laughs> George, look out. You'll upset the boat. Who cares, Sally? It's going to happen. <laughs> What's going to happen? You and me, we're going to happen. We're going to be married. But... No buts. Just believe me. I believe you, George. I believe you. Mm, that was good. I was so hungry. Oh, well, Margaret, that's a good sign. Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I just wish... What? What do you wish? Oh, nothing, nothing. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Well, now, you must have had an interesting morning. Oh, just so-so. Well, what was it? What did you have to do at the office? You never did tell me. No, no, I didn't. Well, uh, we had to take a deposition. Oh? And uh, we just spent the morning listening to witnesses. And, uh... Margaret? Margaret? What? Oh, dear, what is it, George? Don't close your eyes yet. Time for your pill. Here, take it down with some juice. Oh. You know, that's all we'd have to do, just forget one pill. Oh, George. Darling. Maybe we'd both be better off. Hey, good morning, George. Good morning, sir. Yeah, sit down. Thank you. Now, George, I, uh... I want you to go to Washington. I know you have personal problems. Yes, sir. I want you to argue the Stillwell case before the Court of Appeals. Well, sir, You I... can win this case for us. You're a natural. Lawyers like you come along once in a generation. Yes, but, Mr. Cartwright... The trial date is in six weeks. Now, I'm sure you can find a way to, uh, resolve your problem. You can buy nursing care while you're gone. Sir, it's more than that. I'm sure it is. Now, I don't want to intrude in your personal affairs. Although I understand I'm indirectly affected. My daughter, evidently, is uh, quite taken with you. Well, that's between the two of you. I assure you. Of what? The two of you are in love. It's a very difficult situation. But it's your situation... For my part, I need you for the Stillwell trial in Washington. Now, don't don't give me your answer right now. And then I heard a voice. And this voice I knew very well because it was my own voice. And I could hear myself say... If it please the court, the prosecution claims that the defendant at the Stillwell has committed the crime of high treason against the government of the United States. George? Mm -hmm. George! Oh, what, what, what? Well, that's what I want to ask you. What happened? You turned pale. Is, uh, is everything all right? Oh, uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir, everything's fine. Just fine. I, uh, I mean, I, I, be I believe that I will be able to plead the Stillwell case after all. Has she been taking these pills regularly? Oh, religiously, Doctor. The woman we have here in the daytime is absolutely trustworthy, and of course I'm here all night. And he's a tyrant about it, Doctor. Well, he should be. Uh, Doctor, what about Margaret? Well, for the first time since... since this thing struck, I have good news. Uh, good news? I, I say good. These words, good and bad, are relative. Yes, but what do you mean by good? Well, for the first time... I can detect no further signs of deterioration. I see. Uh, unless some other complication occurs. Margaret can live on indefinitely, provided she takes her pills on a regular basis. Oh, we'll, we'll see to that, Doctor. We'll see to that. Well, uh, keep in touch if anything unusual happens. 
And I'll be here again next week. Yes, I'll uh, see you to the door, Doctor. Goodbye, Margaret. Goodbye, Doctor. Oh, a lovely day, isn't it, George? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, uh, about those pills, George. Make sure you never run out. And she must have one every two hours. That's what his speaking voice was saying to me. The little amenities, the weather, don't forget her pills, and so on. But there was another voice. His inner voice. And I could hear it so clearly, so plainly. Poor kids. I'm glad I don't have to decide. She's in such terrible pain. Constantly. Well, that's between the two of them. Or maybe it's up to him. I only know I wouldn't want to be in his shoes for all the money in the world. Goodbye, George. Goodbye, Doctor, and uh, thank you for everything. George? George? Oh, uh, yes, dear. I like a pillow. Yes, dear, I'm coming. Here we are. Now, mm. does that feel more comfortable? Mm-hmm, I think so. Margaret, look at me. I'm looking at you, darling. <laughs> I wanted to hear her voice. Not her speaking voice, but her thinking voice. Her feeling voice. The way I'd heard it once before. But this... This ability, this this gift, this talent, call it what you will, doesn't work at my command. It comes and goes of its own accord. I wanted to know how she felt, what she really wished for. If a certain decision was to be made, I wanted her to share in it. But try as I might, I, I simply couldn't hear her inner voice. And I knew that... The decision, one way or another, would have to be mine. All mine, mine alone. I'm looking at you, darling. Margaret, are you in pain? Oh, doesn't matter, really. The pill takes care of it. Oh, it's such a miraculous pill, it takes care of everything. Oh, I think I'd better sleep for a while, George. I, I, I just want to sleep. Margaret, what do you mean? Please tell me, what do, you, what do you mean by by sleep? Margaret? Oh, no, I'll get that. Uh, hello? George? Oh, yes, Mr. Cartwright. Uh, can you arrange to fly to Washington a week from Friday? Uh, a week from Friday? Yes, uh, for a pre-trial on the Stillwell case. Well, sir, I hadn't expected well, to... Well, uh, you told me just yesterday in the office that you'd handle it. Well, yes, sir, but that was uh, because I, I, I thought I had six more weeks. Well, you do. This will just involve you down there for a day or two this time. I understand. I'll have Miss Gordon book your flight. Well, uh, a week from Friday, that's uh, that's about ten days, isn't it? Yeah, well, we'll have all the papers for you at the office tomorrow. And I'm taking you off everything else. Just remember, we want this case. Yes, sir. Goodbye, George. Goodbye, sir. George? Mm, oh. Oh, darling, I thought you were asleep. <laughs> the ringing of the phone woke me. I thought it was the alarm for my pill. Oh, no, no. We still have another hour for that. Now, what's supposed to happen a week from Friday? Hmm? Oh, oh, uh, just a lunch date with Mr. Cartwright and uh, a client. He must like you a lot, doesn't he? Well, I'm not really a bad lawyer. <laughs> oh, George. I wish I could be of help to you. I wish there was something I could do. Here I am, George. Oh, hi. I'm sorry I'm late. Dad tells me how busy you are. I ordered you your extra dry gimlet. Thanks. I could use it. Dad also tells me you're going to Washington. Yes. Uh, that is, I think so. You think so? I understand the plans are all set. Well, the fact is, I uh, know I'll be going, but... Uh... But what? Oh, nothing. Once the trial begins, there's no telling how long it may run. These government things can go on for months. Yes, I know. How about... How about Margaret? Yes, Margaret. Let's not talk about Margaret. But, George... Please. I said I'd be satisfied with half a loaf. Right now, I don't want to talk about it. But, George, I'm in time... There are things I must decide. I want to help no, you. No, no, no. But when people are in love, there should be no barriers. Nothing held back. Sally. Sally, you have a lot to learn about love. 
George, I won't be spoken Please, to. Please, Sally, like don't press me. Don't push me, huh? I don't care who you are, how deeply you love. There are certain things I must decide on my own. George Wesley Sanderson is faced with a decision. And it's a decision a man doesn't make lightly. Nor does he make it every day. Because what George must decide is whether or not to kill his wife. We shall return shortly with Act Three. Ever had a tall, frosty glass of amplitude? Well, if your beer is Budweiser, you've had it often. Amplitude is a fancy word for the entire taste phenomenon, the total experience of flavor. Next time you take a healthy swallow of Bud, watch what happens. Think about the sensations you're experiencing. Notice how the flavor of Bud comes on nice and easy. Not too strong, not too quick, just right. Notice the clean, crisp togetherness of Bud's taste. Everything in perfect balance, with no single element jumping out at you. And there'll be no aftertaste either, no hanging on. And you'll be refreshed and ready for another glassful. Actually, bud drinkers have been experiencing amplitude for years. But they never phrase it that way. They just say, Budweiser. And that says it all. Anheuser-Busch. St. Louis. WOR New York, your station for the Mystery Theater. Vacancy Decontrol in New York. You've heard about it, haven't you? Tonight you'll hear more about it on WOR, on the Wingate News Digest, 10 o'clock. I'm going to take a microphone and talk to a man who rents apartments. He's a real estate agent. And oddly enough, he is very much on the side of tenants. He says you can take an apartment that had been rented for $250, you move out, and if you can get it, fine. You've got $500 a month. What's it doing? Driving young people, old people, out of the city, he says. That has got to be repealed. Also, a visit with Oscar the Butcher in Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. He says you keep hearing from government officials that the cost of beef is going down, and he's going out of business because it's so high he can't charge his customers that much. John Wingate, tonight, 10 o'clock, WOR. It is one minute before two in the morning in the apartment of George Wesley Sanderson. An alarm clock is set to go off exactly on the hour. It must awaken George so that he can give his wife, Margaret, a pill. A pill she takes every two hours. Without her regular pill, Margaret will die. George? George, wake up. Mm. George? Oh, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, I was afraid for a minute that the clock wouldn't wake you. Yes, I'm sorry. I was sleeping pretty soundly. Poor George, you never get any rest. It's all right, it's all right. Here, darling, take your pill. Oh. Thank you, darling. Thank you. And now go go back to sleep. Well, I uh, better reset the alarm. You're so good to me, George. There. There it is. I've said it for four. Good night, darling. Good night. I turned to look at her. Her eyes were closed. She was only 28. But her face was lined. Her skin was drawn and flushed, and she looked old. Old. Where was the pert, vivacious Margaret who only a few months before had been bursting with life? Wasn't she as good or as bad as dead already? Wasn't it a mercy to end her suffering? Wasn't her living merely a sham and a pretense? Suppose I I would somehow forget to give her the next pill. What would I be ending? And then once again I heard the voices. But these were voices from the past. The recent past. This firm could use a cracker jack criminal lawyer. I love you, George. I love you. We have plans for you. I'll wait for you, darling. But I can't promise to wait forever. We're all pleased with your work. Why hold on to a relationship that no longer exists? I can't do a thing. I'm 
George? George, the alarm. George, wake up. George, it's time for my pill. George, wake up. You must wake up. George? I heard the alarm, Margaret. I heard it. George, you must wake up. Please, Margaret, I'm doing it for you. George... George, I must have my pills. George, wake up. Oh, believe me, Margaret. Please believe me. It isn't Sally or the job. I admit they both kept me, but I don't want to see you suffer anymore. Aren't you going to give me my pills? George, let me live. Just a little longer, please. And I'm so tired, Margaret. So tired. George... George, please. So mixed up. George, don't pretend to be asleep. I'm doing it for you, Margaret. Maybe for me, too, but mostly for you. Oh, George. Darling. I forgive you. I forgive you. Sit down, George. Sit down. Now, you didn't have to come into the office today. Yes, I know, sir, but she's been dead a week, and, uh, well, things go on. I'm due to leave for Washington tomorrow. Yes, uh, we, uh, well, we wondered whether under the circumstances to ask for a delay. Well, there's no point to that, sir. What I need now is lots of work. Well, <laughs> we have lots of work around here. George... I've been trying to reach you to tell you how sorry... Sally, it's all right. Now, there is a possibility that you people have something to discuss. Excuse me for a moment. Well, Sally. Here we are. Yes. How did it happen, George? Oh, it's something that could have happened at any time. She just, uh, fell asleep and, uh... And she didn't wake up. And now what, George? And now... We can be married. That is, if you'll still have me. Oh, darling. I have to go to Washington. I'll go with you. And you know, of course, what Dad's been talking about. Well, actually, I don't. Well, we're fairly direct people, all of us. Dad was saying that since you and I would be married, there'd be a partnership in the firm as well. Mm-hmm. Well, as long as we're fairly direct people, I may as well tell you that I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, do you know that this is the first time I've ever seen you smile? Oh, I smile all the time. You listen to me, George Wesley Sanderson. You're going to live. You're going to travel. You're going to mingle with all the people worth knowing in government, politics, mm. the theater, art. Wait, wait, wait. Now, when do I work? Oh, you can work as hard as you like. As long as you remember, you have to play hard, too. When do we start? Right now. That was, uh, what, 15 years ago? I was 30, she was 25. And the years haven't changed either of us. Well, not very much, anyhow. Life has been full of excitement, zest, and, of course, satisfaction. Because I've won some very well-publicized cases in this talk of a judgeship, but that's all for the future. The important thing is that for almost 15 years since she died, I haven't heard voices. You know, those voices. Until... Until last week. And it happened when I was alone in the morning at breakfast. May I have my pills, George? My pills. I want to live. Please, George. My pills. <laughs> And I've kept hearing them. I don't know what to make of it, because after all, she did say she's forgiven me. Why should I hear her now? Why? I don't understand it. Why now? (laughs) 
In the case of delay versus international power, the precedent is clearly stated. Sally. Sally, what are you doing here? I'm here to tell you about a precedent which is going to be established right now. Oh, I thought you were in London. I was, and then I decided to come back here for some litigation. Litigation? With whom? With you. Oh, what, uh, what kind of litigation? I want to review the basis for our marriage. It is rooted in the factors of common interests. We're both alive. We like to do things, go places. Do you agree? Sure. So why aren't we going and doing? Well, we, uh... Well, we what? Do you realize that for the past year you've been working day and night? Well, darling, it so happens we have some crucial cases. Do you want our relationship to change permanently? Do you want us to drift apart? Do you know you're a nut? Darling, a long time ago we talked about this. Nothing. No one ever stands still. People change. And if they do, so does the basis of their relationship. All right. We'll go skiing. Turn your work over to the bright young eager beavers and let's you and I start having fun again. And we did. We traveled, we played, we danced, we enjoyed ourselves. And I even managed to get some good work done, too. We were never so happy. There was, of course, one small, dark cloud for me. I could hear Margaret's voice. I need my pills, George. Aren't you going to give me my pills? Please? Penny, for your thoughts, George. Mm. Oh, well, you couldn't buy my high-priced thoughts for a penny. You seem to be in a state of reverie. I was? As if you were listening to something. Oh, must be your imagination. As if you were listening to voices. Voices? Are you sure you're all right? Positively spooky. Spooky? Here in our apartment in the bright sunlight? Oh, no, you've got to look for your spooks in the dead of night. Well, I know what we both need. All right, tell me. A good, hard hour of tennis. Oh, now, darling, I have to be at the office. You don't have to be anywhere except with me. Okay, you're on. For one hour. Ha. Ha, that's out. <laughs> this set has one more game. Your luck won't hold forever. Oh, no, I don't need luck. I happen to be good. Oh, that was definitely out. Uh, I think I'm going to break your uh, service. Uh, oh. Oh. Well? Oh. George, what's the matter? It's nothing, dear. Well, I'm waiting, sir. Oh, God. Oh. Oh. What is it, George? Is uh, something wrong? No, 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 I'm fine. You have a funny look on your face. Have I? Are you sure you're all right, yes, dear? Yes, yes, I'm sure. It's, it's, it's just... Uh, just what? Oh, it's nothing. I, uh... I just had this little twinge in my back. But it, it's gone now. But it wasn't gone. It wasn't much, but it didn't go away. And so that afternoon, instead of going to the office, I went to the doctor. I can't see anything. Could be a muscle strain. Uh, try a little heat at home. If it persists, we'll give you some physiotherapy. Doctor, it's uh, nothing serious, would you say? Well, right now it doesn't look serious. I looked very hard at the doctor. I tried to listen for another voice. His inner voice. Perhaps, perhaps a voice he didn't even know he had. The voice I'd heard 15 years before with Margaret, when he predicted. But no, there was nothing. I sighed with relief. Pour me a cup of black coffee. Yeah, sure thing. How's the back this morning? Oh, fine, just fine. How about some Janet? If you'd like. Sure your back's okay? I said so, honey. I found out you'd seen the doctor the other day. Oh, well, it was uh, just a checkup. And the back? Oh, a twinge now and then. Oh, everybody gets a twinge now and then. Dinner tonight at the Caswells. I better call her. And then we'll try a few sets. Do you love me? I think so. I think I love you, too. She left the room. I was all alone. For a week now, I've been hearing Margaret's voice. But now there wasn't a sound. I listened. 
but as mysteriously as it had begun. Perhaps it was coming to an end. Maybe I was losing this... this ear I had for voices. And then I heard it. A voice. It was very indistinct at first, but I recognized it. It was my own voice. But I couldn't believe what it was saying. I didn't want to believe what it was saying. Sally. Oh, please, Sally. Sally, give me my pills. Please. Sally, I, I must have my pills. Sally, aren't you going to give me my pills? Sally, don't kill me. I don't want to die. Sally, my pills. George. George, what's wrong? Sally. Sally, it's my back. I'll call the doctor. Yes, Sally, quickly. The pain is terrible. Sally, please. You won't kill me, will you? What are you talking about? When, when the time comes, you won't kill me. You won't. You won't, Sally. Or will you? Will you? Who knows? George and Margaret, that's one story. George and Sally, that's another Yes, we often think, many of us, how wonderful if we could only hear voices from the future. Voices that could predict our fate. But maybe it's not such a good idea after all. Maybe it's better never to know. I'll be back in a moment. And now, with another story of mystery and intrigue, here is Commander Neville Putney to keep you in... Anxiety. What's this story about, Commander? Well, it concerns a middle-aged business executive named Fremont Witherton, who, after spending his entire career with the same firm, returned home one evening with his dreams suddenly shattered. Is that you, Fremont? It's me, Erica. Fremont, you look so peaked. Erica, I've been fired. That new plant manager, he's been trying to cut me out, and today he succeeded. Well, you don't need to give me that hangdog look. Just go out and get another job. I'm through, Eric. I'm 58 years old. Nobody will hire me for half the salary I've been making. My only hope is to kill the plant manager. Fremont, I hate rough stuff, but if you've decided, your Ross goes upstairs in the trunk. You load it, and I'll warm up the getaway car. Hey, young man, how about that for a story? Well, that was a dilly, Commander, but you just can't leave us this way. How did it all come out? Time's up for now, but tune in, Bob and Ray, on WOR 315 to 7, and maybe you'll find out. This is WOR New York, your station for the Mystery Theater. This is Mary Helen McPhillips. I hope you'll join me tomorrow morning at 10.15 on the Martha Dean program. My guest will be John Alexander McMahon. He's president of the American Hospital Association, and we'll be talking about the cost, quality, and quantity of health care, a concern to all of us. That's tomorrow morning at 10.15. Voices. What are the voices we think we hear in the night? Are they merely dreams, fantasies, or our own wishes? Or are they real? And why shouldn't they be real? After all, reality is what we think it is, and ever so often, what we want it to be. One reality that you can count on is the absolute fact that we will be back here again with other voices to tell you another tale that will excite and amaze and perhaps cause just a tiny, delicious tingle of terror. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Augusta Dabney, Leon Janney, and Suzanne Grossman. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I want a baby. Get on with whatever you have to do. First of all, this talisman. You must wear it around your waist. This package contains herbs. A special combination to relax you. That's the secret. To relax. That's all. For now. But one thing I must add. On the birth of the child, I will ask you one favor. You must promise to grant it. Take the talisman and the herbs. And don't be alarmed if... Certain unusual things happen in the next few weeks. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant 
dreams. WOR Mystery Theater was brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Now, let's listen to a few moments from tomorrow night's suspenseful drama on the WOR Radio Mystery Theater. But one thing I must add about our arrangement. Yes, on the birth of the child, I will demand one favor. You must promise to grant it. A favor? What? I shall ask it when the child is born. But I can't promise that when I don't know what it is. It's a very small favor, but it is part of the bargain. And believe me, Mrs. Richards, if you do decide to bargain with me, I warn you to be ready to keep your part of it. Mother Love stars Joan Hackett. Hear the entire exciting drama tomorrow night, right after the Fulton Lewis News commentary at 7 o'clock. Marshall. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the sounds of suspense, to the terrifying world of your own imagination. And I hope you won't hold it against us if we scare you a little with a tale that really could happen, I suppose. But when you hear the outcome, you'll hope it never does. Consider the case of Paula Richards, age 24, who put her future in the hands of an old fortune teller and a dealer in the macabre. But one thing I must add about our arrangement. Yes? On the birth of the child, I will demand one favor. You must promise to grant it. A favor? What? I shall ask it when the child is born. But I can't promise that when I don't know what it is. It's a very small favor, but it is part of the bargain. And believe me, Mrs. Richards... If you do decide to bargain with me, I warn you to be ready to keep your part of it. Our mystery drama, Mother Love, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Joan Hackett. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. Some research experts say you can't taste the difference between beers. Well, if they're right, then Anheuser-Busch wastes a barrel of time beechwood aging Budweiser. Only they don't think so. Brewing beer right does make a difference. And they're betting a bundle that you can taste the difference in Bud. When it comes to brewing Budweiser, the Anheuser-Busch choice is to go all the way because they still care about quality. Look at it this way. If the Bud people have a choice between what some experts say and what beer drinkers say, well, you'd better believe they'll go with you beer drinkers every time. When you say Budweiser, you said it all. Anheuser-Busch. St. Louis. This is WOR New York, your station for Mystery Theater. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has a beautiful buy to help you serve dinner. Fine imported porcelain china. 
It's a beautifully crafted love lace pattern by Crown Victoria. An elegant white-on-white platinum banded pattern to complement any table. Now available only at ShopRite. The basic place setting pieces, dinner plate, cup and saucer, dessert plate, and bread and butter plate, are just 39 cents. 39 cents each with every $3 purchase. A different place setting piece is featured each week at this special price. You'll want to collect all the magnificent completer pieces and matching ovenware available every week at low prices, too. Visit ShopRite and start your set of lovely porcelain china today. It's a beautiful buy. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. Offer not available in Westchester, Ulster, Orange, Dutchess, and Columbia counties. doctor's waiting room is not the most pleasant place to spend a winter morning. And for Paula and George Richards, this morning is a very fateful one. What's taking him so long? Easy, honey. Dr. Morton has other patients, sick patients. Why can't Dr. Morton say yes or no? Why does he have to keep us waiting? He wanted to see us together in person. I understand how he feels. Sometimes a doctor's word can make or wreck a life. This waiting is making a wreck out of me. I'm, I'm going to call Mr. Jordan. I'll tell him I won't be in today. I told him I'd be late, but I'm... I'm just no good for work today. I'm sure the doctor won't mind my using his phone. Jordan Electric. Oh, Mr. Jordan, I didn't expect you to answer. Oh, Millie's not sick. What's the verdict, Paula? Uh, I don't know yet. That's why I'm calling. I'm just... I'm too upset to come in today. Is it all right? Sure, sure, I understand. The books can wait another day. No audit till the end of the quarter, anyway. Thank you. What's the holdup? The doctor's busy. We're next. Courage up, Paula. I've got my fingers crossed for you. Thanks, Mr. Jordan. Goodbye. Bye, Paula. He didn't mind, did he? No, no, he didn't. He said if I wanted... Mrs. Richards, Mr. Richards. Hello, Doc. Oh, thank heavens. Will you step inside, please? Come right in. Take those chairs by the desk. Thank you. I'm sorry you had to wait. Doctor, I'd like... I know, Miss Richards. You're anxious about the tests. Oh, you have no idea. Easy, honey. I'll come right to the point. I think that's what you want. Yes. Please, doctor. All right. I can't sweet-talk my way through to make it easier for you. The results are negative. I'm sorry, Mrs. Richards, but from my examination, Dr. Field's examination, and the lab tests... You simply cannot ever hope to bear a child. Oh, George. It's certain, then. Absolutely certain. Yes, it is. Would artificial... No. The trouble lies with Mrs. Richards. <laughs> She's physically incapable of conceiving or bearing a child. I was, I was trying to prepare for this, but it sort of hits you right between the eyes. Take me home, George, please. <laughs> I hate to leave you alone today, but I have to get to the studio. It's all right, George. You know that I'm I'm not going to love you any the less, Paula. Darling, I just wanted to give you a son. So it's not in our cards. We have each other. That's the main reason we got married, to be together. A baby would have been extra icing on the cake. Don't stop loving me, George, please. Please, George, don't stop loving me. I told you I won't, honey, and I meant it. You'll be okay today? I'll be okay. I won't be singing around the apartment, but I... I won't be jumping out the window either. I hate like the devil to leave you, honey, but I'm due on the air with the new news. I'll be all right. See you at seven. <laughs> Edna, would you have lunch with me today? I know our date isn't until Friday, and I know that it's snowing awful hard, but of if you could just... Of course I'll have lunch, but... But get me down off the ceiling. What did the doctor say? I'll meet you at the towers. One o'clock? Oh, of course. Paul, what happened? Bad news? Yes, bad news. <laughs> oh, I, I can imagine how tough it is for you, Paula. No, you can't. 
I'm going to lose George. Did he say that? No, just the opposite, but... Oh, and I know I have a feeling. Oh, now, Paula, honey, don't start planning your own downfall. I'm afraid it's all planned. It's it's all in the cards. In the cards? Yes, you know, it's just an expression. Well, honey, I don't know whether I should suggest this. What? Well, you're just mentioning cards. It, it seems sort of frivolous at a time like this, but... Well, there's a woman down in the East Village. She tells fortunes, you know, with cards and tea leaves. <laughs> and what could you do for me? Tell me what I already know. Well, this woman specializes in herbs. She calls herself Mother Love. <laughs> Mother Love? Well, now, mind you, I'm, I'm, I'm just suggesting, but maybe, just maybe, this woman could help you. How? Sometimes these old crones can read things in the future. Maybe a baby is in the cards for you. After the doctor said that well, there it's wasn't... just a... an idea. Well, how do you... How do you know this mother love? Oh, quite by accident. About, oh, six months ago. Henry and... Well, maybe it was Ed. I... Anyway, it was the current one at the time. We were bar hopping in the village when we came on this fantastic storefront. The window was painted green and purple with red curtains, and it said, Mother Love, in orange letters. Fortunes told secret herb remedies. Seemed like a lark, so we went in. And all I remember from then on was mumbling and incense. And being told, one, I'd never marry. Two, that I was too fickle and flighty. And three, <laughs> that my mother had had a ward on her right thigh. Oh, <laughs> Darned if the old crone wasn't right about that, too. Edna, the idea that a fortune teller spell can help me have a baby is just nonsense. Well, looking at it in the cold light of day, you're right. It's just a thought. Oh, something to say, I guess. Oh, honestly, Pa, I feel so uncomfortable. I mean, what, what do you say to someone in your predicament? Hello? Edna? Oh, hi, Paula. Edna, look, last month you mentioned a woman in the village. She works with herbs. Uh, Mother Love? You, oh, Paula, you don't mean you've been thinking seriously about that? Not until now, not really, but I'd... Look, I'd, I'd like to know how to find her. Well, I... I seem to remember it was on 8th Street. No, no, it was 9th. Yeah, 9th, near 1st. Well, that's about all I'm sure of. 9th, near 1st. Now, Paula, I wasn't really being serious that much. Well, I can't do any harm. Right now I'm ready to grab at any straws. Well, when are you going? Saturday. Have you told George? No, he'd be furious. Do you want me to come with you? Would you? I'd feel a lot better. Now, Paula... Let's, let's not go too far. Well, what does that mean? Well, we all laugh at fortune-telling and spells and brews, but sometimes when we want to believe, well, things happen. I'm going to this mother love because I... I want something to happen. Maybe she can't do anything to help me have the baby, but I'm going to try. Look, it was all your idea, Edna. I... I think it's at the end of this block. What a neighborhood. Mm. Makes my skin crawl. That's it. I see what you mean about those red curtains and orange letters. <laughs> Looks like a Coney Island transplant that failed. Mother, love, fortunes, toll, secret herb remedies. Well, mother, love, here I come. Good heavens. I never expected anything like this. Mm, it's not what I remember. Oh, but then I'd been bar hopping. Oh, this rock. It must be worth a fortune. Edna, mm. look at the paintings. Mm. There's too much incense, though. Ah, Mother has company. Good morning, ladies. Come in. How can Mother serve you? Your fortunes, perhaps? Maybe an ailment? Well? Uh, uh, 
<clears throat> I would, uh, I'd like uh, to talk to you. It will cost you. Mother's time is expensive. Oh, I'll pay. Are both of you? Oh, no, I'm, I'm just along for the ride. Come then. We'll go into my studio. Edna, I'll be here. This way, my dear. Through the curtains. It's a little dark, but I like it that way. Mother, is that you? Mother? Of course, Claude. Mother, is that you? Don't be alarmed. He's harmless. He's my son. What's the matter with him? He's blind and feeble-minded. Oh, I'm so sorry. Come, sit down at the table. What will it be? Cards, tea leaves, crystal ball? Uh, no, I I'm more interested in uh, herbs, I think. What is it you want? I want to have a baby. I was told that you might be able to help. Who told you I can do things like that? A, a, a friend. That one out there? No, 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 someone else. Mother, is that you? Yes, Claude. Everything's all right. I tell fortunes. I give herbs for minor complaints. I do not deal in that sort of thing. Is there a herb that might help me? Of course not. Not without... A spell. Forget it. I've said too much already. Mother love, I want desperately to have a child. The doctor says that I can't. The problem is my fault. I'll try anything. Even if a spell is necessary. It would be expensive. I don't care. There may be a way to help you have a normal baby with your own husband. Please, that's all I want. It will cost you $1,000. I have that. Plus... Another 5000 when you have conceived. 5000 I said it would be expensive. And I guarantee nothing. With these things, we can only try. Will you tell me one thing? Perhaps. Perhaps not. Have you ever done this? Or this sort of thing before? I... cannot answer that. <laughs> Quite a gamble for Paula. $6,000 and no guarantee. A long shot if there ever was one. Will she take the gamble? Is she desperate enough? We'll soon see. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. And now another tale of the ball and chain. At Kellogg's Special K. Presents Overweight on an Overnight Train. Is the seat taken? Please, sit down. Mm. You have exceptional legs. Oh. Uh, but why is one of them attached to a ball and chain? This ball and chain? It's a symbol. Funny, I would have sworn it was a ball and chain. I mean symbolic. Because carrying around a few extra pounds can be just like lugging around this ball and chain. I see. May I suggest something? Uh -huh. Try a bowl of Special K skim milk, orange juice, and coffee. It's the Special K breakfast. Will it make me lose weight? No. Oh. You must also exercise and eat smart at every meal. I see. Do you know the Special K breakfast is less than 200? 140 calories, 99% fat-free and delicious? No, but if you hum a few bars... Mm -hmm. And that's another tale of the ball and chain. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. That's Kellogg's Special K. Mm -hmm. Good night. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. Uh -huh. What you're saving for That's what Suburban Savings for Suburban Suburban Savings offers you a regular savings account with flexibility You can add any amount to your account whenever you wish Withdraw whenever you want Suburban Savings pays a 5.25% annual interest rate on regular savings paid quarterly Which earns an annual effective yield of 5.47% Interest is compounded continuously from day of deposit to day of withdrawal, as long as $50 is maintained in the account to the end of the quarter. Come into Suburban Savings and open an account with flexibility. Our regular savings account in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta.
welcome again to the studio of Mother Love in a dingy part of New York City. A strange and eerie place where strange things are said to happen. Let's see if they do. As Paula Richards considers a bargain, a bargain for a baby. I'll, I'll have to think this over. I admit that I am desperate, but I, I'll just have to think about it. It's for you to decide, of course. Mother, who's there? Who I, is that? Hush, hush, Claude. I'll be with you in a moment. I'm sorry. He's very ill. Thank you. Anyway, I'll, I'll be in touch with you if I decide that... You'll be in touch. Yes. Claude, what's the matter now? Mother's here. Mother is always here. Well, I thought you'd never come out. What happened? Let's get out of here. really said that? Well, she said she doesn't guarantee anything. Palmer, now listen to me. Forget it. She's a fraud and you know it. Well, you can't throw away $6,000 on a phony fortune teller. But if she could possibly... Oh, what? You'll have to tell George about oh, this. Oh, heavens, no, 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 no. I, well, he'd think I... Uh, he'd think I was completely crazy. You know, I'm sorry I ever brought this up. Don't be, Edna. Look, I won't lose my head. Well, now... Where would you get the money anyway without telling George? Well, I have a thousand dollars and a personal account. It's, it's all that's left of my father's inheritance. I'll worry about the rest later. Ah, mother has company. Ah, it's you. I have the thousand. I want to try. Come in, come in. This way. I thought you'd be back. Mother love knows. Mother, is that you? You, you have the money. Here, in cash. Good. I need it. Claude. He needs medicine so badly. Poor Claude cost me so much. Are you sure you want a child? I want a baby. Get on with whatever you have to do. Yes, of course. Excuse me, I have to get some things... I had them already. I knew you'd be back. Now, first of all, this talisman. You must wear it around your waist. This package contains herbs. A special combination to relax you. That's the secret. To relax. Half a teaspoon in a cup of boiling water once a day. In the morning is best. That's all? For now. But one thing I must add about our arrangement. Yes? On the birth of the child, I will ask you one favor. You must promise to grant it. A favor? But what? I shall ask it when the child is born. But I can't promise that when I don't know what it is. It's a very small favor. Don't worry. But it's part of the bargain. Very well, it's a long way off. Yes, it is. Take the talisman and the herbs. And don't be alarmed if certain unusual things happen in the next few weeks. Unusual things? What kind of things? You'll understand. You'll recognize them. They will mean things are working. Have you told your husband about this? No. Good, good. Tell no one. No one. Now, the last thing I must have is your name. Paula Richards. Your husband? George Richards. Go now. And beware. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be in touch with you. Yes. Five thousand. Remember when you conceive. Mother! Oh, who's there? Oh, who's Lord. there? Lord! Mother is here now. Only mother. See, Claude? A thousand dollars from the nice lady. The lady who's going to help us. You're going to get better, Claude. You won't be sick anymore. The lady is going to help us. Isn't that nice, Claude? Oh. 
Paula? Hmm? Penny, for your thoughts. Oh, I wasn't thinking of anything, really. You've been like that a lot lately. Distant. I'm surprised you noticed. Look, honey, I know I haven't been a Lily to live with either. I mean, we, we've let our problem be too important. We're both disappointed, but we can't change the situation. I mean, we have to adjust to it. Sorry if I've been a pill, if I've done anything to make you so... so... Edgy. <laughs> That's your word. Is that how you feel? I guess. George, let's go to the show tonight. We haven't been out in weeks. I'd like that, Paul. I'd really like that. I, I've had uh, <clears throat> a lot on my mind, and you're right. I, I've been thinking about myself too much. I'll see what I can get tickets for. Look at the time. I've got to shower and run. Hey, will you look at that? What is it? It's a bird. At the window. I think I think it's a crow. No, crows are bigger. A blackbird? I, no, I don't know. I thought they all went south for the winter. It looks awfully cold. Well, don't invite it in. They know how to take care of themselves. I'll see you tonight, honey. Bye, George. I'll call you at the office about the tickets for tonight. Okay. Shoo. Go away. Shoo. Oh, well, a few crumbs. Then I've got to get to work. You look so cold. Now, here. Here's some bread. Get out of here. Get out. Get, what am I going to do? Get off the floor, lad. Get out. Get out. Oh, Lord. What, oh. what am I going to do? Get out. Shoot. Oh. Oh, good. Go away. Uh, hello? Mrs. Jensen? Is Mr. Jensen there? This is Mrs. Richards in 3A. No, 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 it's not about the heat. It's about a bird in my apartment. I can't get it out. Well, I thought that Mr. Jensen might... Oh, uh, no, I've got to get to work. All right, uh, I'll leave... Uh, he can get in with a passkey. Maybe the bird will just fly out. I'll leave the window open a little. Yes, yes, all right, thank you. Bye. Stop following me. Get out! What am I going to get, to get rid of you? I... You wanted to see me, Mr. Jordan? Yes. Uh, sit down, Paula. How are you feeling? Why? Well, I, I know you've had a personal disappointment. You've been under a strain. You don't have to say it, Mr. Jordan. I know that my work has just been rotten lately, and I'm I'm just all on edge. And today there is a there is a bird in my apartment. A bird? Tapped on the window this morning and stupid me opened the window and gave it some crumbs. Well, what kind of bird? I don't know. It's black and shiny. Not too big. I asked the superintendent to get it out. It's so unnerving. Well, I can imagine. Look, I'm sorry about the work, Mr. Jordan. I know I've been letting you down. No, well, I'm, I'm sure it's just a passing thing. Your work has always been tops, Paula. But the books are important. And with the auditors coming in next month, well, everything just has to be in order. I know, Mr. Jordan, and I'll... I promise I'll straighten up. Yes? Yes, she's here. It's a call for you. Oh, it must be George about tonight. Hello? Mrs. Uh, Richards? You know who this is? Yes, I know. Tell me, Mrs. Richards, has the visitor arrived yet? The visitor? You'll know. You'll know when the visitor arrives. Uh, you don't mean the bird. Good, good. He has arrived. It's working. Yes, it's working, Mrs. Richards. Oh. Don't neglect the tea now, whatever you do. And take care of the visitor. It is most important. I'll be in touch with you again. Very soon. Oh, Paula, is it... Is it trouble? You're white as a ghost. No, no, no trouble at all. That is... I don't know. Well, you mentioned the bird, is that it? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the superintendent got it out. Oh, good, good. Then, then there's nothing to worry about. Hey, honey, I'm home. Paula? D don't touch it, George. What? Just let it alone. Oh, good. Oh, 
How did it get in? Look, I, I let it in by accident. It won't leave. I'll get it to leave. No, 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 George. Don't, don't, don't go near it. Please. Paula, we are not going to live with that in the house. It, it has a broken leg. I, I was thinking of getting a, a cage for it. You can't cage a wild bird, and I'm not going to sit around with one beady eye staring at me like that. George, don't touch it, please. Just, just go along with me. Oh, Paula. A pet is one thing, but this. I, 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 I have to take care of it. Why, why, why a wild bird? I, you know, I, I can't stand the way it stares at me. It stares at me, too. Well, just get used to it. Now, well, this gives me the willies. I'll get dinner. You have to be back at the studio at nine, don't you? Yeah, I'm sorry about our theater date, but with Pete's wife in the delivery room, I've got to cover the evening news. Of course, Pete shouldn't be anywhere else when the baby is born. Do you want French fries or boiled potatoes? Whatever's fastest. So you found a home, did you? Well, I'm not in favor of it, but it looks like you're part of the family. Paula, come in, come in. I haven't seen you, why, since your father's funeral, almost three years. It was nice of you to see me, Mr. Martin. And why wouldn't I? I'm only sorry I wasn't more attentive to you after your father passed away. Fred and I were good friends. I've missed him. Thank you. So have I. I, uh... I'm here to ask a favor. Of course, Paula. <sighs> Mr. Martin. Would you lend me $5,000? No questions asked. 5000 All right. Are you in some kind of trouble, Paula? No questions? Oh, yes, of course. You wouldn't ask me if you didn't need it badly. I will, Paula. I don't have that much on hand. Suppose I send you a check. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I don't need it immediately. Any time in the next few weeks will just be fine. You'll have it in a few days. I promise you I will pay you back. Oh, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> Mrs. Richards? Oh, yes, it's you. Things are ready. You'll be needing the 5000 very soon. I I've arranged that. Good, good. How is the visitor? Still there? It must be there. It is. Good, good. 5000 dollars, Claude. Bye. The lady will give us $5,000. Mother. You'll be going to get better, Claude. You'll be able to see again. Your legs won't hurt. Mother. Mother has to leave you for a while. But don't worry, Claude. We'll be together soon with $5,000. Everything will be all right. I promise you. Everything will be all right for Mother Love and Claude, and presumably Paula. But when we tamper with the unknown, the results can be very unexpected. I'll return shortly with Act Three. I'm High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater. In recent weeks, I've invited listeners to enter a weekly prize drawing and to send along comments about our program if you wished. Well, you leave me just about speechless except to say thank you, thank you for the fantastic response. Thousands upon thousands of letters, and they're still pouring in. But although we couldn't feel more gratified, there is a problem. In addition to your kind words, many of you ask questions, and the volume of mail is so great that we can't get around to sifting through it for many weeks. But now that the drawing is over, if you have a specific question, please try us again, and we'll aim for a quick reply. Address, Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. This is WOR New York, 710 on your dial, your Mystery Theater station. John Wingate with a reminder, tonight at 10 o'clock, the Wingate News Digest. 
And question, you planning to dry this weekend? Great. New England? Forget it. The Poconos? Watch out. Upstate? Westchester? Rockland? You're in trouble there, too. A spokesman for the Auto Club of New York will tell you it's going to be a dry weekend coming up. And he'll also let you know how he feels about the gas shortage. It's short, he says, but why, he doesn't know. Then a special, our White House correspondent, Clifford Evans, analyzing Richard Nixon's speech at 9 o'clock tonight. Mr. Evans on with me at 10 o'clock. Later, deafness. What are the early warning signs that you, at whatever age, may be going deaf? We'll find out from a top expert on hearing. He himself has the problem and knows. Tonight, 10 o'clock, John Wingate, WOR. Let's return now to the plight of Paula and George Richards. You'll remember that Mother Love told Claude everything would be all right. But things are not quite so right for George. In fact, things for George are getting downright impossible. Paula, well, I am not going to bed another night with the bird on the dresser. It's been there every night for two weeks. All it does is sleep. You've got to admit he hasn't been in any trouble. I still don't like the look in its eye. The way it hobbles with that broken leg, it's... I mean, it's grotesque. Turn out the light, George. You won't see it then. Oh, 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 boy. I never thought I'd be sharing my bedroom with a bird. Good night, Tony. What's the matter with that thing? I don't know. It never acted that way before. It keeps that up. I'm going to shoot it. Good night, George. Good night, Paula. Paula. Paula, what is it? Paula. Oh, wait a minute, I'm going to get the light. There. I'll call Dr. Morton. No. Wait, wait. No, oh, it's the matter with you. What is the matter with you? The bird. The devil takes the bird. I'm concerned about you. It's my... Stop it. What time is it? Uh, it's it's 4.30. I'm calling Dr. Morton. No. No, no. Not yet. It no. might be appendicitis. No, 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 it, it, you know, it's not that. I'm going to kill that bird if it doesn't shut up. Uh, 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 look, I, I'll be all right. I, I, I'll be all right. I'll see... Uh, God, I'll, I'll see Dr. Morton in the mo- morning. George? Yes, honey? What time is it? Seven o'clock. I fell asleep. After the pain seemed to stop. So much better now. Well, we're going to see Dr. Morton just as soon as you feel well enough to get up. No, I'll, I'll be all right. I'll just stay home. I don't want to see Dr. Morton today. Paula, you can't let it go. It might be something serious. I promise I'll see him when when it is necessary. I, I just, I want to stay in bed today. I'm going to call him and tell him about it after I make us some coffee. All right. I'm going to wash. I'll call Mr. Jordan also and tell him that you won't be in today. He isn't going to like that. Paula. What? Come in here. What's the matter? You sound so... I didn't do it, Paula. I know I threatened to, but I swear I didn't. I never gave the bird another thought after that pain itch. I never touched it. Oh, George, it's all crumpled up. It's dead, Paula. The bird is dead. How long ago was this attack? Uh, A little over a month ago, Dr. Morton. Why didn't you see me right away? Well, I wanted to be sure. Well, Paula, there are some preliminary signs similar to pregnancy. That's what I thought. I I knew it would be. Don't get your hopes up yet, Paula. I told you about the impossibility of your... I know, I know, but I think that... And I said these symptoms are similar to pregnancy. They could be caused by something else. I'd like to run a few more tests. All right, anything that you say. But this time, they're going to be positive. I know, Dr. Morton, I just know. A woman knows when life has started within her. Hello? Mrs. Richards, I thought I'd be seeing you by now. 
Oh, yes, well, uh, the doctor hasn't confirmed it yet, but I... I... But we know, don't we? Yes. The second part of our bargain is due, Mrs. Richards. Five thousand dollars. And after what we've already been through, I think you know I mean what I say. Yes, I do. Good, good. I'll be expecting you, Mrs. Richards. I promise I'll keep my end of the bargain. I told you I arranged for the money. It just hasn't come in yet. I'll, I'll check on it today. Good, good. I'll be seeing you soon, then. Yes, I promise. I hope so. I hope so, Mrs. Richards. You know what I can do. Hello? Hello, may I speak to Mr. Morton, please? No, no, Mr. S- Mr. Morton Sr. Yes. Yeah. What? Good God, when? Well, he can't be dead. He just can't be dead. Do you... Well, listen, do you know if he sent... Oh, no, no, you wouldn't know that. What am I going to do? Oh, dear God. No, 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 I don't want to speak to anyone else. I... I expected you sooner. I'm sorry. I I had to turn to another source for the money. It doesn't matter. You're here with it now? Uh, It's all there. Good, good. We're almost even then, eh? I hope so. You don't sound grateful, Mrs. Richards. You wanted a child, and you are pregnant. You should be grateful. I have lost my son. Oh, I... I'm so sorry. Claude is dead. But he was so ill, perhaps it's better. Part of this will pay for the funeral. The rest is for the future. I really must go now. Of course. Go. And good fortune. You won't need the amulet anymore. Save it as a souvenir. And I'll be seeing you when the baby is born. George, sit down. Well, I'm sure glad Paul has finally decided to have you check on those stomach pains, Dr. Morton. When I examined her last week... Last week? I didn't tell you, George. I wanted to be sure first. Sure what? I could have a baby. What? That's right, George. I wanted to see you both about the results of the tests. It's almost impossible for me to believe, but it's conclusive. Paula is pregnant. I wanted it so much for you, George. What? You said that Paula could never conceive or bear a child. I did, but Paula proved us wrong. (laughs) Believe me, many things happen to prove us wrong now and then. You're happy, George? Happy? Oh, Paula, now I know why you've been so irritable and distant. You know, I feel like I'm getting my wife back along with a baby. Well, I want to see you every two weeks. We usually make it a monthly visit, but you're an unusual case. A very wonderful case. I wish you both much happiness. You wanted to see me, Mr. Jordan? Yes, yes, Paula. How are you feeling? <laughs> I think full is the word. Uh, when is the big day? The end of August. It's only three months. I'm... I'm going to spend an uncomfortable summer. It it looks that way. I I don't know any way of saying this, Paula, other than just coming right out with it. You know we were audited last month at the end of the quarter. Yes. The auditors found a shortage of $5,000. I'll have to have an explanation. Yes, I suppose you will. Now, I know there must be a reason, Paula. You've worked for me for five years. Never a mistake. I'm going to tell you the truth. I just hope that you can believe it. Why shouldn't I? I simply couldn't get the money anywhere. I haven't told George, but we'll pay it back. Look, I promise you. I hope so. But I'll go along with that. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Right now, the baby's the important thing. George, it's time. I know it. I'll get Dr. Morton. I'll get the suitcase. 
Congratulations, Dad. Everything's all right. Paula? Paula's fine. Boy or girl? Only the mother can tell you that. Go on in. Paula, honey. George, isn't he beautiful? I've already named him George Jr. I hope you don't mind. Mind? Oh, no. Honey, honey, honey. More champagne, Edna? Silly question. A toast to the godmother. Here. Oh, you two. You, you know you're going to make a grown woman cry. To Edna and to little George. Oh, I'm so happy for both of you. And you don't know how relieved I am. Relieved? Oh, oh. Uh, well, what I mean is, well, I... I think that Edna means that she's relieved she doesn't have to listen to my troubles at lunch anymore. From now on, everything's roses. I'll get it. Hello? Yes. It's for you, honey. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Richards. Congratulations on your new son. Well, how did you... Uh, thank you. It's time now for the favor. The last part of our bargain... Yes, I suppose it is. Good, good. I'll see you here in my studio tomorrow with the baby. Just to see him? That's all. Just to see him. All right. Good. Good. Come in. I don't want to seem rude, but I'd like to get this over with just as quickly as possible. Come. Let me hold him. Ah. There we are. What a fine, healthy boy. Aren't you, Claude? Such a fine, strong legs now. They don't hurt anymore, do they, Claude? Give me back the baby. Mother told you everything would be all right, Claude. Mother, is that you? Is that you, Mother? Yes, Claude. Oh, my God. My God, what what is it? Mother told you that you'd be away for a little while. But now we're together again. And you won't be sick anymore, Claude. Have a fine new body now. And we'll take better care of it than we did with the last one. Mother will see to that, Claude. Mother will see to it. So, little George, or little Claude, whichever you prefer, seems to have more than his share of mother's. Perhaps Paula and Mother Love will share the raising of the child. But whatever they do, I hope that you, if you're ever tempted to deal in spells, will remember some age-old advice and follow it. Caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware. I'll be back shortly. And now, with another story of mystery and intrigue, here is Commander Neville Putney to keep you in... What's this story about, Commander? Well, it concerns a middle-aged business executive named Fremont Witherton, who, after spending his entire career with the same firm, returned home one evening with his dreams suddenly shattered. Is that you, Fremont? It's me, Erica. Fremont, you look so peaked. Erica, I've been fired. That new plant manager, he's been trying to cut me out, and today he succeeded. Well, you don't need to give me that hangdog look. Just go out and get another job. I'm through, Eric. I'm 58 years old. Nobody will hire me for half the salary I've been making. My only hope is to kill the plant manager. Fremont, I hate rough stuff, but if you've decided, your Ross goes upstairs in the trunk. You load it, and I'll warm up the getaway car. Hey, young man, how about that for a story? Well, that was a dilly, Commander, but you just can't leave us this way. How did it all come out? Time's up for now, but tune in, Bob and Ray, on WOR 315 to 7, and maybe you'll find out. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. Good evening, everyone. This is Patricia McCann. Welcome back to the New York Times, Craig Claiborne, and to the McCann program tomorrow morning at 11.15 a.m. right here on WOR. Ah, sweet 
mystery, magic, mysticism. These are the ingredients we mix well, chill, and serve nightly on Radio Mystery Theater. Come and enjoy our hospitality again when malice heads the menu and menace is our mead. Our cast included Joan Hackett, Bennett Carroll, Mason Adams, Leon Janney, Evie Juster, and Roger DeCoven. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Am I dead? Not quite. You're in a hospital with a bullet in your brain. As the saying goes, as good as dead. And Sherry and Herb got away with it. Oh, it isn't fair. I only had it to do all over again. Suppose you had. Could you do better? Of course. Of course, if I knew what I know now. Naturally. That would have to be a precondition if you're asking for yesterday to live over again. Oh, please. Please, give me the chance. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. WOR Mystery Theater was brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets where you get a lot more for a little less and Suburban Savings with offices throughout New Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Next, a scene from tomorrow night's Edge of the Seat Entertainment of the WOR Radio Mystery Theater. Breathing, Sergeant. Touch and go. You want to stay with it as we take him in? You don't see that. What did he say? Search me. Could hold up a minute so I can hear what he's saying. Not a second, Sergeant. Anything this guy has to tell you will be after he's operated on, not before. If then. It sounds like he's talking with someone. Ask him for something. It was yesterday. There, there, there. Something about yesterday. What this baby ought to be worrying about is tomorrow. Listen for The Man Who Asked for Yesterday, another chilling tale on the WOR Radio Mystery Theater, tomorrow night, right after the Fulton Lewis commentary at 7. This is Sherry Henry, proud as a winning politician to announce my special guest tomorrow is Mrs. Malcolm Wilson, the wife of our new governor of New York. Now, you know, the truth is, even though the Wilsons have been at the pinnacle of state government for 16 years, we really know very little about them as people. And what fun, I promise you, it's going to be to meet this charming first lady. That's Mrs. Malcolm Wilson on the Sherry Henry program. It's tomorrow afternoon, 2.15 on WOR Radio. You're now to set for news with John Scott, WOR New York. Marshall. If only I had to do it all over again is a constant cry from the human heart. And the implication is, of course, that if some magical power could grant the plea, how much better things would be handled. 
or at the very least, how differently. But is that a valid concept? Does it follow inevitably that people could or would handle things better a second time around? Brain injury, boys. Handle with care. That's it. Nice and easy. Keep him flat on the cart. How is he, Doc? Still breathing, Sergeant. Touch and go. That's all right. You want to stay with it as we take him in? You don't see the... What did it happen? What's he saying? Search me. Could hold up a minute so I can hear what he's saying. Not a second, Sergeant. Anything this guy has to tell you will be after he's operated on, not before. If then. It was... Sounds like he's talking with someone. Asking for something. It was yesterday. There, there, there. Something about I yesterday. I what this baby ought to be worrying about is tomorrow. Our mystery drama, The Man Who Asked for Yesterday, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I'm High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater, a bit numb with surprise and appreciation. We never anticipated the enthusiasm of your response when we invited your comments about the show. You've said so many, many nice things, and you've telephoned, written, and asked questions. It's those questions, though, that pose a problem. The volume of mail has been so tremendous, over 75,000 letters and still coming in, that it's going to take time to sort through all of it and find the letters that call for specific answers to questions. But the prize drawing is over, so if you'll send in that question again, we'll try for a prompt reply. Write Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. And again, thank you. This is WOR, New York, your Mystery Theater station. <laughs> What you're saving for, that's what Suburban Savings for, Suburban. Suburban Savings offers you a regular savings account with flexibility. You can add any amount to your account whenever you wish. Withdraw whenever you want. Suburban Savings pays a 5.25% annual interest rate on regular savings paid quarterly, which earns an annual effective yield of 5.47%. Interest is compounded continuously from day of deposit to day of withdrawal, as long as $50 is maintained in the account to the end of the quarter. Come into Suburban Savings and open an account with flexibility. Our regular savings account in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. An almost always misquoted quote by an obscure poet is the theme of tonight's spine tingler. Backward, turn backward, O oh, time in thy flight. If you haven't spotted the misquote, I'll clear it up for you later. Concentrate first on the fascinating problem of a man with fatal brain injury who still finds time to talk to himself. Are you taking him straight to surgery? No, not yet. Free up first. And an operating team has to be assembled. Yeah, can I hang around? On the chance while he's talking to himself, I can get a lead? Be my guest. But with that bullet in his brain, I doubt if even subconsciously he can track anymore. But he's still trying to say something. To who? Us? Himself? Hey, Daddy in the sky. I don't know. He may be louder. Oh, if you could only... He sure ain't clearer. I'd give a lot to know if he's really making any sense or what he's trying to say. I never had a chance. I should have had a chance. Somebody should have given me a chance. What kind of chance, Mort? What? Who, Who? What kind of chance should you have? Well... 
The cards were all stacked against me. I mean, how was I to know? The cards were stacked. So? Don't you see, if I even suspected for a moment, if I thought that my own wife... Well, what's the use? Don't give up yet, Mort. Look, mister, I don't know who you are, and it's like I'm wasting my breath. But I can tell you something. If I could have yesterday to live over... Suppose you could. What would you change? You'd have to know what happened to me first. Suppose you could convince me that yesterday should be lived over. Would you be willing for me to give you that opportunity? If it were only possible... Well, tell me why you'd like to ask for yesterday over again. What have I got to lose? That's quite a leading question. One you'll have to answer for yourself. Do you want to tell me about yesterday? It started like any other day. The tight pull behind my eyes. The furry tongue, the shivery feeling of insecurity. Not just because my legs and my hands were shaky, but because my mind was sticky and not quite tracked, and because I had that sick, sick feeling that I'd fatal cherry again, that I was less than a wife should expect. Oh, crying out loud, Mort. Mm-hmm. You're alarmed to wake you up. Mm-hmm. Turn it mm-hmm. off. Oh, oh, sure, honey. Sure. <sighs> Did you have a bad night, baby? What'd you expect with you turning and twisting and moaning? I didn't sleep. I'm sorry, honey. It's just that I'm going crazy. I don't know what I'm going to do. I thought you said your horse had to come in today. It has. It has. Fifteen straight days. The favorite has run out of the money. The law of averages has got to catch up. So, today you'll win. And everything's fine again. Uh, there's only one hitch. What? To put down a bet, you got to have the scratch. I haven't got any. So? You'll borrow some. Yeah, where? Well, Uncle Joe wouldn't give you some. Oh, come on, Sherry. You know my partner wouldn't lend his mother a dime without good security, and I'm not even real family. Well, he always says you're like a son to him. Yeah, it's because he let me buy a piece of the business so he could have a diamond cutter salary and work me ten hours a day for free. I don't know why you let him get away with it. Look, it's the carrot on the stick, sweetheart. He dangles it in front of my nose every day. Like a son you are to me, Mort. Someday this is going to be all yours. I wish he'd die already. Uh, Don't get your hopes up. He's as tough as an old shoe. Well, I got to get going. No, wait wait a minute, Mort. What? About the bet. If you don't want to ask Uncle Joe... Why don't you borrow from a bank? Sherry, you know I've got no credit. Well, you've got the piece of the business. I've used that as collateral. Your insurance. That's tied up, too. Then you're really flat, huh? I'm up to my ears in hock. I'm worth nothing. The only thing I've got left that's worth a cent is my body, and I wish to God I had the guts to fall out a window so at least you'd oh, be able to... Oh, hush. Hush, honey. Don't you dare talk like... We'll work it out. You'll see. Oh, oh. I don't deserve you, honey. Now, let's not go into that. Look, why don't you take your shower and shave, and you and me will get our heads together over breakfast and see what we can figure out. Oh, that's a good idea, honey. I won't be long. Take your time. You know, you're the best wife a man ever had. Mm -hmm. Just you keep thinking that way. Sherry? Whatever it is, it'll wait till breakfast. Now get in the shower. I thought he'd never move. Oh, gee, come on. Come on, kid. Come on. Come on. Yeah? Herb, it's me, Sherry. Hi, sugar. Why so early? I just want to tell you we finally got a little pigeon right where we want him. Did he leave already? No, he's in the shower. But he finally admitted it this morning. He hit bottom. So do we go ahead? You know the deal, sugar. You can count on me. Then we move. 
more coffee, Mort? No, no, no. I wish we had more time to think. If, if only you'd been here last night, at least I could have slept on it. Oh, I'm sorry I was so late. But you know March. I don't know why you spend so much time with her. Oh, she's a good friend. And with you working the hours you do, I... I know, I know. I guess I shouldn't complain. Well, never mind. Anyways, it's like I told you. Marge is a wonder with the Ouija board. And how she could have read my mind. And all about worrying over you. She I... actually said that I was going to make a killing today? Her very words. I just got to hit a winner. Never mind Ouija boards. It's plain mathematics. So, go ahead. Make the bet. Without cash? Well, now, surely that old bookie of yours will take your check. You've been a good customer. And then you can pay him when you win. Mm Mm-hmm. And suppose I lose. Mort, will you think positive for once? This is going to work out just right for us. I know it. All right. All right. I'm going to take a chance, honey. I mean, what what could they do if I lose? You you can't get blood out of a stone. (laughs) Ah, that's the way. Now, you just keep thinking positive. Yeah? Oh, Herb. Herb, it's, it's Mort Herman. Hi, Mort. What's your action? Look, I want to get a bet down on the fourth at Jasper Gardens today. You got it. What horse? How much? The favorite. Final chance. A thousand on the nose. A G. <laughs> That's a little steep, Mort. I, I want that covered. Well, it, it, it's Saturday. The banks are closed, Herb. Yeah. I mean, I don't have that much on me in cash, you know. I'll tell you what. You dropped me off your personal check on the way down, and you got your bet. With a real good customer like you, what have I got to lose, huh? (laughs) Sherry, baby, I'd like to die laughing. You should have seen him writing out this bum check. His hand was shaking so bad, I thought he'd never be able to sign. (laughs) But you got it. And he is hooked. Oh, not so fast. He is playing a favorite. You know, that horse could win. No, you and me are going to go with better odds. What do you mean? Pass me that slip of paper with that that number on it, huh? This? Well, that's that's Mort's direct phone line at the store. (laughs) Yeah, I asked him how I could reach him this afternoon after the race in, in case my phone should be tied up. Now, look, don't make a sound. Don't make a sound while I sell a real bill of goods. Hi, is that you, Mort? Yeah. Hi, this is Herb. Now, listen, I got your bet down, and and then I started to get cold feet about that check. Well, look, if you want to cancel out... Now, I said, listen, now, don't interrupt me. And that bet's up the line by now. I can't cancel out, but I can do you a favor. Now, we're playing with rough boys, Mort, and like I said, you've been a good customer. I don't want to see you hurt. Hurt bad. But the favorite can't lose. The favorite ain't gonna win. The fix is in. The winner is Tidy Lady. She'll go up at a hundred to one. Now, I'm going to stick my neck out for you. Give me another check at anything up to 2,500, and I'll see you get down on Tidy Lady. A hundred to one? A sure thing? A lead pipe cinch. You can't lose. I'll be right over. (laughs) And that sews that up, Sherry Baby. Herb, there isn't any chance that... Tidy lady could win. <laughs> She'll be lucky to get out of the gate. Sherry? Sherry, where are you? In the living room, Mort. Sherry, the most awful thing has happened. The horse I better. Herb, what, what are you... How did you get here? Well, uh, Herb's been trying to reach you at the office, darling. Oh, well, I... I, I uh... I'll just leave you two alone. Too bad it was the wrong horse, eh, Mort? Herb, what happened? You told me Tidy Lady couldn't lose. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Even a bookie gets bum information. Well, let's get our business settled. I got a thousand bucks for you on final chance. She went off at even money. So that means you owe fifteen hundred on the other bet. But you said Tidy Lady couldn't lose. That's the Phillies for you. Can't trust him. And I can't trust you, Mort. Can I? Now, look, Herb. You know and I know these checks ain't worth the paper they're written on. If I dropped them, they'd bounce out of sight. Now, what are you going to do to make them good? Now, Herb, give me a chance, will you? Give me a break. Oh, yeah, sure. I might, Mort, but the men upstairs, not a chance. I'm only an errand boy. These are hard cases, Mort. You better pay off. How can I? 
people out. There is one way. Let me show you the only out you got. Go on. Go on. Oh, I must be crazy. I can't do this. You know what happens if you don't. Come on. Well, let's get on with I it. I can't rob my own partner. I'm not going to open that safe. Oh, yes, you are. Does this get it through your head? I'm not wasting any more time. But put the gun away. Oh, no. You open that safe, or I'll save the big boy's hitman some trouble. All right, all right, all right. Now, look, just, 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 just enough to pay off what I owe now. I'll handle the payoff. You open up. There we are. That's it. Now, start scooping them up. And look, Herb. All of them. Leave the jewelry, but... Take all of those loose diamonds. You said only enough to pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to con you into opening that safe, but don't worry. I'm not greedy. You wait till you hear my real proposition when we get back to your apartment. There's nothing else we can do, Mort. I'm really being very generous. $50,000 in diamonds and the seats I booked for you to South America. Well... It's time to go if you're going to make that plane. How can you be sure I won't refuse? For the same reason I know you won't be back. One thing I'm not paying off are your gambling debts. That'll keep you away from home. Well, uh, Mrs. Herman, are you all packed as I requested? Yes. And I'll drive you to the airport just to make sure you get off all right. What did we come off the highway for? We're almost out of gas. Well, the airport's just across the bridge. You could have made it. Now turn left here. Right here, under the bridge. There's no gas station down here. This road goes right to the river. That's a dead end. You are so right, Mort. Particularly for you. What do you mean? End of the line. But I'm going to South America. You said there were two tickets? Yeah. For Sherry and me. What? Didn't you ever think it was funny? My dear friend Marge never came to visit us. You mean it was always Herb and you? Sure. It takes someone as stupid as you not to guess. Where's your car, Herb? It's on the other side of the wharf, honey. But uh, don't go yet. I'll need you to help me get this car rolling into the river. Oh, I don't want to be here. No. You're not going to kill me, Herb. You're not going to kill me. As soon as that plane is making enough racket to kill the sound of... Herb, no. Now. Herb. Herb. Uh -huh. I tried to jerk my head away frantically at the last moment But I could feel the bullet smash into my skull And then burst in a fountain of searing sparks But did Mort Herman really die? If so... How could he be able to ask his mysterious partner in conversation to borrow back yesterday? Well, we'll find that out when we return shortly with Act Two. Ever see a beer drinker pour his beer real easy down the side of the glass? Maybe you do it yourself. If so, the Budweiser Brewmaster thinks you're missing something. Especially if you're a Budweiser drinker. You see, Bud is brewed, so it will kick up a healthy head of foam. Exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation make it a lively brew. Well, anyway, pouring Bud plunk down the middle of the glass helps bring out the best in that clean white Budweiser foam and real beer aroma. It also helps you get the full benefit of a taste, smoothness, and drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. Remember, brewing beer right does make a difference. Next time, pour that Budweiser right down the middle and see for yourself. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. WOR, your mystery theater station in New York. for dinner. Hey, Ma, what you got? Hey, Ma, will it be much longer? My hunger's getting stronger and I can't wait. She loves her family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets shop right do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Hey, Ma, what you got? 
What's for dinner? How about armor can pan? Three pound size, three ninety nine. Shoprite grade A frozen green beans, nine ounce packages, six for one dollar. Shoprite dairy case home style biscuits, eight ounce packages, five for forty nine cents. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets Shoprite do the rest. Hey, ma, what's for dinner? Shoprite has the answer. Can a man on the threshold of death hesitate and draw back? Is there for any of us the hope of a second chance? And if we were granted this chance, if we were allowed to retrace our steps, could we change the course of events and find another ending? We're about to return to the story of a man who asked for yesterday. Am I dead? Not quite. You're in a hospital with a bullet in your brain. As the saying goes, as good as dead. And Sherry and Herb got away with it. Oh, it isn't fair. If I only had it to do all over again. Suppose you had. Could you do better? Of course. Of course, if I knew what I know now. Naturally. That would have to be a precondition if you're asking for yesterday to live over again. You mean there's a chance that I can? If you deserve it. Oh, please. Please, give me the chance. Can you? Oh, yes. Well, why not? I'm a bit of a gambler myself. Let's see how you can remake yesterday. Oh, for crying out loud, Mort. It's your alarm to wake you up. Turn it no. off. Oh, oh, sure, honey. <sighs> wow. Oh, you have a bad night, honey? Oh, what'd you expect with you turning and twisting and groaning and moaning? I didn't sleep. Sorry, honey. It's just that I'm going crazy. I don't know what I'm going to do. But that was yesterday. Now I know what I'm going to do. Or at least what I'm not going to do. I was aware of Sherry's voice saying all the things as we had said them. But I was thinking to myself how I hated her, knowing the truth. Her pretense of love, the story about her friend Marge. But now that I knew I was the one marked for the kill, things were going to be different. But not till I was ready. Till then it had to stay the same. Oh, Herb, it's Mort Herman. Hi, Mort. What's your action? Uh, look, I want to get a bet down on the fourth at Jasper Gardens today. You got it. What horse? How much? The favorite. Final chance. A thousand on the nose. But gee, <laughs> that's a little steep. I, uh, I'd want that cover. Well, look, it's Saturday, Herb. Uh, the banks are closed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I haven't got that much on me in cash. I'll tell you what. Drop me off your personal. It was hard to sound scared the way I had before, knowing that slimy rat was two-timing me with Sherry. But I had to play it out so he wouldn't know this time. Know that he was going to be the one that got hooked. By the second call, I was ready to make the first of my changes in the action. And I'll, uh, I'll see you get down on Tidy Lady. A hundred to one? A sure thing? I'll let pipe cinch you can't lose. Oh, boy, look, I know I can trust you, Herb. You wouldn't steer me wrong. You know it, kid. Well, look, all right, how about giving me a real break now? Spring me for a big one. 10G. Now, uh, um, uh, wait a minute. I, you know I, I'm good for it, uh, don't you? Yeah, well, Look, I got a safe full of diamonds would cover that ten ways from nowhere. Uh, I bet that big might shake the odds. Herb, come on, you can lay it off 50 different places. Okay, you got a deal. But bring me that check. My upping the ante was a jolt for Herb, I knew. But I also knew that he had to go for it. As I wrote out the worthless check, I could just figure the conversation now going on between Herb and my no-good cheating wife. Did he go for it? Yeah, yeah. Herb, is something wrong? No, I... I just got a little mad is all. What? <laughs> I thought I had my pigeon pegged. A small potatoes better like Mort wouldn't dare look beyond a two-and-a-half grand bet. But he had a nerve to hold me up for ten thou. So what's the difference? 
Doesn't that give you even more of a lever to talk him into opening up the safe? Yeah, but it'll run me quite a few grand more to pay off the boys upstairs. Ah, oh, it's a drop in the bucket, Herb. There's easy a million bucks in that safe. So what do you care? Yeah, I just got a little nervous, hon. That fool should balk at going through with a big caper. I would like to be holding those bum checks I couldn't cover. I don't want to end up in the river with concrete boots. Ah, oh, don't even talk like that, Herb. He'll cave in like plaster of Paris once he gets the notion he might be hurt. I promise you. Uh, you made the plane reservations. Ah, I went even better than that. The tickets are sitting right at home. Did you bring me his gun? Well, I didn't want to carry it around. It's in the drawer at home. You're not going to chicken out on going all the way. Ah, don't you worry. Because after the heist, he's got to go. He'll be the one the police figure for it. They'll be looking for him, and we don't want him found. Herb, there's no outside chance this tidy lady could win. (laughs) She'll be lucky to get out of the gates. What they didn't know was that from here on in, the odds were changed. I was calling the shots. And don't worry, Uncle Joe. I'll mind the store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll set the burglar alarm when I leave. Don't worry. Everything's under control. (laughs) Yes, sir, Uncle. Your little boy Morty has everything under complete control. If I didn't know about that unnumbered bank account you've got in Switzerland or all the blue chip stocks, I'd hate to do this to you, Uncle Joe. 22 right. 8 to the left. 31 right. 14 back. Ah. A real nephew, maybe you could have trusted, but a made-up one, you got only yourself to blame. I cleaned the safe out of everything in diamonds, just like Herbie would have made me do. They went into my pockets. It's surprising how little space nearly a million dollars in diamonds takes up. Then I went to deliver my check to Herb. I'm stretching quite a point for you, Mort. Oh, I know that, Herb, but I'll be good for the check. Oh, I mean, even... oh don't give it a thought. You and me, we're going to be rich men after that 4.30 finish. I know kickbacks. <laughs> we're riding on all the sucker's money. Is it, you, you want a drink to it? No, 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 no. I'll, I'll, I'll pass, Herb. I'm, uh, I'm kind of pooped. I've been under a lot of strain lately. So I think I'll, uh, I'll just go on home and take a little nap until post time. Uh, you, you're not going back to the store, huh? No, no. I, I think I'll just watch on TV while our jockey boots our fortune home. Well, uh, maybe I come up and join you. We could celebrate together. Why not? Not in a million years, Herbie. Not ever. You're not seeing me again. When I heard you laying off those bets that you had to guarantee personally, my score with you was all settled. Who's that? Me. Mort. What are you doing home so early? Why, aren't you glad to see me? Well, of course, sweetie, but... What are you uh, doing with the gun? Just checking to see if it's loaded. Why? Well, you know I always do that when I'm carrying diamonds. Diamonds? You're carrying some now? Yep. What for? I'm going on a trip. When? Right now. Well, but I thought... You thought what? Well, I thought... Well, um, uh, didn't you have a bet on a horse or something? That's right, I do. Two of them, to be exact. On the same race. Well, I don't understand. Yeah. Pistol's all set now. I think you do, Sherry. What? Understand. Well, what, honey? You're, you're so strange. What are you trying to say to me? I'm not trying, honey. I'm going to lay it right on the line for you. How long have you and her been closing me out? Knock it off, Sherry. I can do without the injured innocents. I know the whole scheme, so you better come clean. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. You got tired of me, Sherry. Maybe you only married me in the beginning because diamonds were very big in your eyes. But I blew it all because I ran to the ponies. And they cleaned out what little I had. And then you met my bookie. <laughs> you want to know something? I never really took a close look at him until today. He's quite a hunk of man. If you'd have told me, maybe I couldn't have blamed you for going for him instead of... No, no, look, Mort, before you do something crazy, just... No, not crazy, baby, no more. Don't... Don't point that at me. Don't you think I have the right? Why? Because you know my horse is going to lose. And then I'm set up to open the safe, Sheriff. Then when it's opened, 
Your lover is going to clean it all out, pointing this gun at me, and then you're going to drive me out to the airport and shoot me and put me in my car and sink it in the river while you and Herb take off for South America together. Isn't that the plan? How could you know? I mean, what are you talking about? You, me, and Herb, and the future. I ought to put a bullet in your head right now. No, Martin, no, no. No, listen to me. I'm I'm Sherry. You're Sherry. Your wife. Someone who'd do anything for you. Or to me. No, 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 Mark, please. No, give me a chance. Whatever's in your mind, we can work this out. Can't we somehow? Oh, my God, Mark, can't we somehow? Please. <laughs> turned with a vengeance. The biter is bit, and the man who asked for yesterday seems in full control and in command of history with the power to change the shadow that coming events cast their shadow before. We'll see just how when I return shortly with Act Three. And now another tale of the ball and chain. Presents the good, the bad, and the heavy. Why is that cowboy wearing a ball and chain? Because carrying around extra pounds can be just like carrying around a ball and chain. How symbolic. What would it be, senor? Give me the special K breakfast. Here you go. For a special K, it's the milk, orange juice, and coffee. Ah. Say, don't I know you from some place? You probably don't recognize me with my ball and chain. I used to be ten pounds lighter, but I'm getting back that way by exercising and eating smart at every meal. Starting with this here special K breakfast. What's so special? It's less than 240 calories. 99% fat free and delicious. It's going to help me get rid of this here ball and chain. I bet your horse will be glad to get out. Another ball and chain fights the dust. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. That's Kellogg's Special K. That's right. Good night. Of course, you remember the ad that said, Follow that man, Agent X39. The man with a long midnight blue cape and a beautiful burgundy silk lining. Send your name and address to Box 42, Ocwanamanoc, Wisconsin, Big Shot Division. Follow that man. Carry a malacca cane with an ivory head. <laughs> Small wonder I'm what I am today. Nothing. Operative X39. Gene Shepard, tonight at 9.15 over WOR New York, your mystery theater station. A woman has begged for forgiveness. A woman we already know deserves none. And what about her husband? A man with a miraculous second chance. Has he the humanity to be forgiving? Can he change the already preordained course of fate? In the first playing out of this particular chain of events, who was the ultimate victim? And who escaped? The answers are waiting. Please, Mort, give me a chance. I think we can work it out, Sherry, with your cooperation. Well, just tell me how. It'll be just the way you and her planned it. Except that I'll be using the other ticket that you've already reserved for South America. But what do we use for money? Just what you and Herb would have used. I already have the diamonds. We can leave immediately. Yeah, but it's the horse race. That doesn't matter anymore. Doesn't matter? When you've already bet Don't 10, look thousand... so guilty, Sherry. I'm aware that you know about that. Mort, you're scaring me. I'm also me. aware that the bet means nothing to me. That the horse isn't going to win. How can you know all these things? Let's just write it off to the strange fact that I have suddenly acquired second sight. Now you're scaring me even more. Maybe that's the object. Come on, let's pack and go. But, Mort, if you're going to lose the bet, how, how is it going to be paid? Oh, that's the beauty part. That's going to be your ex-boyfriend's problem, Herbie. But he hasn't the money? Got... Well, like he threatened me, then he can pay for it in blood. Now, do you want to hang around and do the same? You couldn't leave me. I know too much. That's how it goes, sweetie. That's why my offer to come along isn't exactly take it or leave it. Let me put it another way. I've already reserved an earlier flight. And I'm leaving on it with or without you. Now, it's now or never. 
Make up your mind. What? What? It still isn't too late. Too late for what? To go back. Start all over. How? Well, the race hasn't been run. I could talk to Herb. Maybe get him to call off the bets. Forget it, Sherry. The bets are down, all of them. It's too late to call anything back. What are you slowing down for? We need some gas. We must have enough to get us to the airport. Or right at the bridge. Oh, I wish you could know how familiar this conversation sounds. Why are you turning off? We have an appointment right below the bridge here. You're scaring me again. More... What is it about you that... Maybe I've become the agent of fate. The what? It's finally catching up to you, Sherry. I don't know what... Mark, don't, don't turn left here. This is a dead end. It, it ends at the river. I found that out once. Well, Mort, I... I think you're crazy. Mort, let me out of here. Oh, no, sweetie. I can't do that. A coffin is a coffin, what? no matter who the corpse turns out to be. What do you mean? You and her plan for it to be me. I've just revised the plan. Put that I've gun decided away. the only one that really deserves to be shot is you. Uh. Goodbye, Sherry. Welcome to my grave. I forgot I should have waited for a plane going over to drown out the shot that killed Cherry. But it didn't really matter. No one heard it but the two of us. It wasn't much of a climb back to the highway, and I had plenty of time to walk to the airport. I had no baggage except a million dollars worth of diamonds. And for the first time in as long as I could remember, I was free. Total inversion due to extreme weather conditions, aggravated by a heavy smog, has caused a temporary shutdown in all air traffic. Arriving planes are being shunted to alternate landing fields, and there will be no, repeat, no takeoffs on all scheduled airlines until further notice. The stunning announcement caused me my first twinge of terror. I had to get away. With a deep breath, I took hold of myself. I mustn't give way to panic. I was safe till at least Monday, as far as the diamonds were concerned. Their loss wouldn't be discovered until then. But I had to get out of town before the race was run and lost. I knew Herbie would be looking for me. I could head for the nearest airport that was cleared and take a plane from there. The answer was just across the terminal building. Your attention, please. Oh, miss? Excuse me, miss? I'll, I'll be with you in just a minute, I've sir. been waiting for almost half an hour. Be back in a moment. Some panic, huh? You think there was a war on or something, huh? They've canceled all the flights. Yeah, I just heard. I come in here to use a plumber, and now I see where maybe I'm going to make a heavy buck today. Why? What do you mean? Well, you see, mister, I run a hack. Oh, excuse me just a minute. Uh, Miss? It's the car you want to rent, sir. I'm sorry, but there isn't a thing. You want to go back to the city, friend? I, like I was saying, I got a hack outside. Oh, brother, you're a lifesaver. Yeah, well, you hear the deal. Fifty smackers. I'll tell you what. You take me to the nearest airport where planes are flying, and I'll pay all expenses and a hundred buck bonus. No sale, friend. I'm a family man. I don't show up for dinner. The wife would clobber me. Besides, save your dough. For a 5-0, I take you to the railroad station. You get a train out. A train? Yeah, sure. Come on. <laughs> What's the matter, driver? You got me. Some traffic jam. Looks like fire trucks up there at the station. Well, there's a cop over there. See if you can get his attention. We got it already, Bubby. He's on his way already. You headed for the railroad station, buddy? Uh, yeah, officer. I got a passenger going. Yeah, you got nobody going nowhere. There's a fire in the tunnel. There won't be a train out of here for several hours. Turn over the next corner. Now, wait a minute, Sergeant. You don't understand. I've got Mr. to leave. Do yourself a favor. With the airport shut down, this fire in the tunnel, what you should be worrying is find yourself a room for the night. Well, the bus station, I can get a bus. <laughs> That's where the laugh is on them. I mean, the business they could be doing tonight, and their drivers had to pick this weekend to go out on strike. Okay, Hacky, you're holding up traffic. Move on. What am I going to do? I don't know, mister. But I'll tell you one thing. You've about used up your 50. 
Make up your mind wherever I drop you. It better be close. Just, just let me think a minute. It was a nightmare. The bad dream to end all bad dreams. You know the kind. Where you have to escape. But you can only move in slow motion. Your feet are buried in mud like glue. You're caught. You're trapped. You're helpless. You know there's no way out. Okay, Mac. This is it. End of the line. I don't take you no (laughs) further. Hey, watch it, Bobby. <laughs> Let's not throw any fits in that. <laughs> I already got enough trouble out of here. Ah, uh, you don't get the joke. I ain't interested. I want you out. You know where you've stopped? Right in front of my own house. So ain't that a lucky coincidence? I brought you home. So out. This is the last place in the world I want to be. I can't get out Hello, here. Oh, Mort. I've been waiting for you. Herb. Look, Herb. Let me give you a hand out. You look a bit shaky. And don't make any sudden moves. Oh, uh, you got your fair hacky? I got it, mister. Take care of your friend there. He's kind of in a bad way. All right, let's keep our hands nice and open where I can see him. And then we'll go inside and we'll have a little chat. So when you heard the race results, you came back to pay off your debt to me, and you left Sherry waiting for you at the airport, right? That's right, Herb. And you want to pay me off in dime? Well, like I told you this morning, I, I don't have the cash on hand. Yeah, I'll get that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, this is Mr. Herman. Oh, they are? Oh, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll be there to pick him up. Right away. Yeah, thank you for calling. What was that? The airport. Ceiling is lifted. They're flying again. They wanted to confirm your reservations. You're on the next flight out. Well, how am I going to get there? I got my car outside. Our business is all finished. I'll drive you out to the airport. Come on, Mort. We don't want to keep Mrs. Herman waiting. I appreciate you going out of your way like this, Herm. I don't mention it. As a matter of fact, it just fits in with my plans. What are you doing? Don't turn off here. You and I have a little final business to complete. No, 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 no. Not not, not under the bridge. Oh, you know this little spot, huh? Is that where you gave it to Sherry? What are you talking about? Come on, jerk. When I took that gun from you, I could smell it had been fired recently. When I couldn't reach Sherry, as we planned earlier this afternoon, I had to figure maybe you'd caught on about us. That's why I was waiting for you when you got home. What did you do with her, Mort? I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you do. Come on, get out. Now, give me your coat. Her, please. Please. Coat, jacket, pants. I want all the diamonds. Her, please. Did you give her any chance? What did you do, shove her back in your car and roll it in? Look, she had she okay. had no right. Okay, okay, you forget it. Now, you just drop those clothes and walk to the edge of the pier. I wish I had a car to bury you in. But I'll take my chances on the tide. Move! It didn't make any difference. It all turned out the same, didn't it, Herb? I don't know what you're talking about. But by me, it comes out even. Goodbye, Mort. Where am I? Right back where you started. But I didn't change anything. Did you really think you could? But Herb gets away with everything. And I killed Cherry. At least she could still have been alive. Well, don't worry about that. Think back to the first of your yesterdays. Remember the second time? Herb sent Cherry with you into the river. Locked in the car. Well, then how did I... When you were in the back seat. The door wasn't closed completely. The water pressure opened. You surfaced. And drifted on the tide to the bank. Where a police sergeant found you and brought you here. Where? To the hospital. They're operating on you right now. Then I'll live? 
Do you think you should? I could prove it to you. If you'd just let me have yesterday again. Oh, no. No, I'm quite satisfied now. About what? That you belong to me. Now I pick up my part of the bargain. Your part? Tomorrow. I'll take care of all your tomorrows. Your man just died on the operating table, Sergeant. You can go on home. Catch him shut-eye. You kidding? I just got a new headache. Know that cutoff by the bridge to the airport? Yeah, the one that goes down to the docks? Yeah. Guy coming up from there got creamed by a trailer truck. Killed him. Busted his car to nothing. And get this. Scattered diamonds all over the road. I mean, by the hundreds. Stolen? That's my job to find out. Well, <laughs> sorry about your patient. Funny thing. I saw that little guy earlier today by the railroad station. Frantic to get out of town. With all the communication jam-ups we had today. Wonder what he was trying to run from. I guess we'll never know. But we do, even if the sergeant never learns. And we also know it caught up with him. He was a weak little man, and a scared little man, and a stupid little man. None of which is any excuse. Mort Herman got exactly what he deserved. I'll be back shortly. John Wingate here, and a reminder, if you're only getting 400 yards to a gallon of gasoline, may I make a suggestion? You can drive around this weekend in your own backyard. You can take you to the car wash and drive back if you're getting 400 yards to a gallon, okay? Seriously, on the Wingate News Digest at 10 o'clock tonight, a big man of the Auto Club of New York will tell you if you're headed for the Poconos, for Rockland, for Westchester, for the Hamptons, watch out. Gas is dry all over the city. Another special tonight. A major home heating oil distributor says, you're in luck. The price is going down. And he doubts the entire shortage. Doubts it, and he'll tell you why. Then later, someone you don't know, a 16-year-old. What he thinks of, quote, the energy crisis, of Mr. Nixon's speech, of everything. What ambitions, if any, for a 16-year-old kid in New York. Wingate News Digest, tonight. 10 o'clock, W.O.R. This is W.O.R. New York, your mystery theater station. In the beginning, if you remember, I mentioned an often misquoted line. Backward, turn backward, O time, in thy flight. It was written by a lady named Elizabeth Akers Allen. And the misquote is one word. Not thy, it's your flight. But the preposition is of minor interest. It's the adverb that really matters. Backward. To turn time backward. One of man's dreams since time began. An idle dream as we know now because even if we could, in the end... It turns out just the same. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Paul Hecht, Evie Juster, Ralph Bell, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You'll have to believe me that Leo won't give me a divorce. Don't you see how easy it would be to take his place? Yeah, fine, fine, but what happens to him? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, that's the problem. I thought maybe you could think of a way out. Yeah, I can, but I don't like it. Try it on me. No, I think you've already tried it on, and you like it. Maybe. Not maybe, positively. That's what you wanted to lay on me when you said you wanted to talk. <laughs> You're not only sexy, but you're smart. Yeah, you bet. Smart enough to stay away from murder. Well, who said anything about murder? I did, my lovely. I did. I said murder. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. 
Until next time, pleasant dreams. WOR Mystery Theater was brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings, with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Here now, a short scene from tomorrow night's thrilling tale on the WOR Radio Mystery Theater. You look exactly like my husband, a dead ringer. Here, here, take a look at this picture. Hey, that's scary. I didn't know two guys could look this much alike. How would you like to be my husband? No way. I like being who I am, Al Grissom. But don't you see how easy it would be to take his place? Yeah, you bet. But it's easier to stay away from murder. Well, who said anything about murder? You did, my lovely. And my answer is no way. <laughs> Dead Ringer, starring John Lovejoy with E.G. Marshall host. A man and woman plots a murder with a man who looks just like her husband. Their victim? Her husband. Gloria Winters is amazed to discover that a man she found hurt on a highway is a dead ringer for her husband, whom she wants to divorce. The two are attracted to each other and soon are figuring out a way to get rid of her husband. But not his fortune. Our cast tomorrow night will include Joan Lovejoy, Leon Janney, Barry Haynes, Bob Dryden, and Paul Hecht. The WOR Mystery Theater. Good evening, everyone. This is Patricia McCann. Samira and Muhammad Salan will talk about the food of Lebanon tomorrow morning at 11.15 a.m. Along with other members of their family, they run a Middle Eastern restaurant right here. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the sounds of suspense. Have you ever noticed the similarity between night driving and making your way through life? Driving at night, you can only see as far as your headlights show you the road. You never know what's over the next hill or around the next curve. And even on a straight road, your vision only extends as far as your lights. Life is very much the same. None of us really knows what lies ahead. You look exactly like my husband. A dead ringer. Here, here, take a look at this picture. Hey, that's scary. I didn't know two guys could look this much alike. How would you like to be my husband? No way. I like being who I am, Al Grissom. But don't you see how easy it would be to take his place? Yeah, you bet. But it's easier to stay away from murder. Well, who said anything about murder? You did, my lovely. And my answer is no way. Our mystery drama, Dead Ringer, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Leon Janney. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, 
brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You're on a blacktop country road about 18 miles east of the little town of Eudalia. It's raining hard. You're driving a Citroën Maserati, and it handles. But you have your problem. You're going to be late for dinner, and you have a husband who doesn't appreciate lateness. The night seems to be getting blacker, and the rain shows no sign of easing. Darn this rain. While I'm at it, darn the weatherman who promised clear and cool weather. Your name is Gloria Winters. And then the headlights pick up something in the road. Whatever it is, it's a problem because it doesn't seem to move. Come on, stupid, move. Get out of my way. It's a man. What happened? A car hit me and drove off. Thanks for stopping. That's okay. Well, a lot of people didn't. Do you think you can make it to my car? Yeah, with a little help. Okay. Oh. There we go. Oh. That's it. Oh. Steady now. Yeah, I guess I'd better... Just, here. Just slip into the seat. Yeah. There you oh. go. Wait. I'll close the door and come around the other side. Watch yourself. There's some crazy guys driving this road. Hmm. You're soaked. And you are hurt. I'll take you to the Hermitage. What's that? The hospital. Oh, no. No hospital. You're bleeding. Now, look. Looks worse than it is. It's sure playing hell with your car, huh? Well, you... You must go to a hospital. Oh, no. No way. But why? Because hospitals are for dying. Oh, that's crazy. Well, that's what everyone tells me. Well, I don't care what Look, you... I can't ever thank you enough for picking me up, but I have this thing about hospitals. But you I really... promise you, I'm, I'm not going to die. The Three Coyotes Motel. It's just out there. I know where it is. Oh, oh. No, just come on. Just put your head on the pillow and don't be a baby. Oh, you're some dynamite kind of good Samaritan. Well, I have a right to see what you look like under all that dirt and blood, haven't I? No argument. This may hurt. Oh, there. Well, now you're beginning to look like you have a perfectly... It's that bad, huh? Oh, no, no. It, it... It's nothing. I, I, I just thought of something. Like what? You look exactly like my husband. But I mean exactly. You, you could be identical to him. You don't believe me? No, I believe you. Well, that's why I got such a shock when I cleaned you up and got a good look at your face in the light. You're a dead ringer for Leo. Oh? Why does that shake you up? Um, Leo and I are having our problems. Isn't everybody? I suppose. I'm just wondering... Yeah? Uh, well, I'm wondering what you were doing walking down Route 38 in the rain at 6.15... I, uh, missed the bus. There's no bus on Route 38. Oh, I didn't know that. I did. Okay, I suppose you've got a right to know the story. I live in Chicago. I'm a market analyst. Come again? I advise my customers about what to do or what not to do in the stock market. Sort of a security specialist. Mm Mm-hmm. Are you, uh, married? Oh, no. But that's, uh, part of the story. Years ago, I fell in love. She... She was from Chicago, too, but it didn't work out. You've heard the story a hundred million times. You met, met someone. We said a sentimental goodbye. She cried. I felt sick, and we made the usual commitments. If she ever needs me, you know. Hmm. Romantic. Mm-hmm. Romantic. 
Well, the day before yesterday, I got a call from her. She was living near Eudalia. She was in trouble. What kind of trouble? Well, it was private. And there'll be no name. Okay, okay. So I came. Naturally, she didn't want her husband to know. She didn't want my car to be seen by the neighbors. Well, you know how small towns are. Yes, I know. So I let her call the shots. She picked me up, drove me somewhere close to her house. She was supposed to drive me back, but her husband had called and said he was coming home early. Well, where was he supposed to be? It was on a business call that would have kept him from getting home before nine. So our appointment was cut short. She panicked, and I walked, trying to thumb a ride. This uh, widow came along, and how? And you found me. <laughs> what a difference. What a difference. You look like Leo, but you were completely different. Leo wouldn't cross the street to help a blind, crippled kid find his crutch. While you... And you stopped and picked up the stranger lying in the road. Well, I told you that Leo and I don't get along. But you married him. I didn't know what it would be like. Uh, anyway, what are you going to do now? Oh, I'm going to change motels and lie low until I can go back to Chicago without having to explain the way I look. What about the girl you came to help? Oh, that was a bad scene. Well, nothing I can really do for her. She has a decision to make. So have I. Um, will you help me to make it? If I can. Oh, you can, Al. You can. In a very big way. <laughs> I don't like it, Gloria. I don't like it at all. You have been saying that for a whole week, Leo. When's he going back to Chicago? When the scars heal and nobody will ask questions. How about the name of the girl he came to help? He won't tell me. I don't like it. Oh, Leo, trust me. Why? Because I'm a woman. If you could give me one good reason... I've for... given you a million reasons. One million dollars. Al is the man who can do it for us. You really believe he's leveling about the securities market in his background? <laughs> Maybe he's conning you. Why? Take a look in the mirror. All right, all right. Suppose he is playing me for a sucker. And we're in... We're still all right. Maybe even better. Just trust me. Do I have a choice? You always have a choice. Don't ever forget that. You made one. The day you married me. <laughs> oh, I do love you, Al. Me too. No, no. We have some serious... Come things. here. Come on, I'll be serious. We can't go on like this. What? Isn't that what you were going to be so serious about? Tell me that we can't go on like this. Well, yes. How did you know? Oh, well, because people are more predictable than the stock market. And, darling, I've studied the market and I know its moves. Okay. Then continue. With what? What else I had to say? Oh, it was going to go something like this. I told you I was fed up with Leo, and until you came along, I just didn't see any way out, but now... You're doing super. Go on. But now, if we love each other, I can divorce Leo and we'll get married and live happily ever after. Right? Not exactly. Where'd I go wrong? On the divorce. You don't want to divorce Leo? I know Leo. He'd never give me a divorce. Does that matter? Well, a woman wants a little security. Hey, with your looks, you don't have to worry about that. Looks don't last forever. Well, nothing does. Some things do. Okay, name one. Death? <laughs> you know, I never met anyone like you. Not even that girl you came out here to help? Uh -uh, not even her. And you have no parents, no relatives. Nobody except yourself. Just me and my shadow. We've talked a lot about Leo. You've never seen him. And I don't want to. 
I'd like you to look at this picture of him. <laughs> That's scary. I didn't know two guys could look this much alike. I told you. Yeah, but... You thought I was laying it on for your benefit. I guess. And now? I believe you couldn't tell us apart. I guess this was in the back of my mind ever since I first saw your face. What was? How would you like to be Mr. Leo Winters? Oh, no way. I like being Al Grissom. Don't you see how easy it would be to take his place? Yeah, fine, fine. But what happens to him? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, that's the problem. I thought maybe you could think of a way out. Yeah, I can, but I don't like it. Try it on me. No, I think you've already tried it on, and you like it. Maybe. Not maybe, positively. That's what you wanted to lay on me when you said you wanted to talk. <laughs> You're not only sexy, but you're smart. Yeah, you bet. Smart enough to stay away from murder. Well, who said anything about murder? I did, my lovely. I did. I said murder. And I also said no way. But that's stupid. You don't even know Leo. <laughs> you're really serious about trying to get rid of him. Oh, think of what it would be like. Mr. and Mrs. Leo Winters, you and me, happily married for the rest of our lives. Now, you jumped about three tracks and a couple of miles. You're too far down the road. Why? How did you get Leo to let you come and see me? Did, he, did you tell him we were playing backgammon or chess? Well, you know how greedy he is. He thinks that you're going to make him a lot of money with your connections in the Chicago markets. But we've still got a little problem to solve about his uh, departure. Ah, oh, then you're interested. Lady, if I hadn't been interested, either you or I would have been long gone from this room. You must have been thinking about this for some time. I have. And you must have come up with some idea. I have. Well, I'd like to hear them before I commit myself. You will. But I promised Leo I'd be back at 3.30 sharp. That doesn't give us enough time to discuss it now. No, but it does give us enough time to... Seal the bargain? Mm. <laughs> Once you agree to discuss the idea of murdering someone... You've taken the first step along a road that is full of hairpin turns. Some of which don't even have warning signs. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. It's me again. And we're talking about murder. That is, we're not talking about it. But Gloria Winters and Al Grissom are trying to arrange a murder. It isn't a simple task, as you will hear. No. No, hiring a killer is just setting yourself up for big trouble. Well, do you have any better ideas? No, not yet. Then we'd better come up with one. Because Leo's getting suspicious. Oh. You don't have a gun. Now, we've been through that. Well, you could buy one. And it can be traced. Not if we get rid of it afterwards. Gloria... I know the way the police operate. When a husband gets knocked off, the first one they check out is his wife. And statistics show they have a better than even chance of being right. But I'm going to say it was a prowler. Now, what makes I... you think they'll believe you? Mm. Hey. Hmm? I've got it. I've got it. Why didn't I think of this before? The same thing that happened to you before, only this time, it'll be fatal. It run? Of course. You know, the more we talk, the more I'm beginning to think we ought to forget about the whole thing. No. All right. What car are we going to use? Well, we'll, um, we'll rent one under under a false name. Mm -hmm. And who's going to rent it? Well... Now, you see, the guy who rents either one of us a car will remember us. And even if we give a but, false but name... But why should they be worried if, if they get the car back? Because the hit and run will be discovered. They'll start asking questions. Well, I'll, I'll be home with a friend as a witness. No, no, no. Hit and run is a crime. They'll go looking for the driver of the car, and that has to be me. No, I, I don't like anything we've come up with. And we've got to stop thinking about murder. 
Now, the cops are going to be looking for somebody and continue to think of more than an accident. Hit and run. Hit and run isn't natural. Nobody's going to dig much into what looks like a natural death. If we could get a doctor to sign a death certificate, we'd have it made. I know a doctor. Oh? Well, he can't be in on it. He's got to think it's death from some kind of natural cause. I said I know a doctor. Who? His name is Carmody, Hugh Carmody. He's about 85 years old. He's our family doctor. He was my mother's doctor when I was born. Is he still practicing? Well, not really. But he refuses to give up the families he's treated for years. So he still looks after me and Leo, sort of inherited him when we got married. Mm-hmm. An idea? Uh, just a glimmer. Would, uh, would this doctor believe you? Oh, of course. Come on, let me in on it. Okay. What do you know about poisons? Practically nothing. Yeah, well, that makes us even. Now, what we need is some kind of poison that looks like like he died of a stroke or a, a heart attack or maybe some kind of uh, food poisoning. Mushrooms. What? Toadstools, mushrooms. They're poisonous. Yeah, but he's not going to eat them. He will if I cook them. You know, that might... No, 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 no. He'll get suspicious if you give them to him and you don't eat them. Well, we, we need to know more about poison mushrooms. The library. I'll Isn't go there. you mind? You'll go asking for a book about mushrooms and then call in this doctor to look at Leo who's just eaten some bad mushrooms. All right, and... all right. I understand. But I've still got to... I'll see you later. Where are you going? To find out what I want. And nobody will ever know. <laughs> Dr. Comedy. Of all the dumb plays. Relax, darling, and give me a kiss. <laughs> I think I really have something. What did you do? Um, <clears throat> toadstool. A fleshy fungus that is poisonous or inedible as distinguished from an edible mushroom. Oh, great, great. We knew that before you left. But we didn't know that aconite, which was formerly much used as a cardiac and respiratory sedative is the poison that comes from toadstool or monkshood and can be deadly. You didn't ask? Of course not. I know that Dr. Carmody always visits his few patients between three and four, so I went to his office and told the nurse I wasn't feeling well. No. She knows me and let me in to wait in his office. And he has a lot of books. So I read. Yeah, and what did you tell Carmody when he came back? Oh, he's such an old love. I made up a story about being tired and not feeling well, and he gave me a tonic, which I'm going to get. You know, maybe we're getting somewhere. Oh, we're there, darling. We are there. Oh, slow up. Now, first, where can we get the, uh, aconite? Aconite. Aconite. Yeah, that's it. Suppose I told you we don't have to get it. Well, I'd like to hear why. Okay. My dad had a bad heart. Oh, how long ago was that? About seven years. And you're telling me that this Dr. Carmody prescribed aconite? Right. Well, how do you know the stuff's still good? I don't. Well, it doesn't seem to be... Well, this is the only way we can handle it. If it doesn't work, we won't get into any trouble. And if it does, we won't get into any trouble either. So what have we got to lose? Hmm. You know, when you put it that way... Do you know any other way? No. Then let's try it. Okay. Okay, let's work it out. Okay. Day after tomorrow, Thursday. Mm -hmm. That's Eileen's night out. Right. I'll buy the mushrooms tomorrow. Then I'll cook a great steak dinner with all the trimmings. And Leo and I will eat it. And you too? Of course, I'll have to. Mm -hmm. I won't eat too much, though. But enough to make me a little sick. Yeah. Then when Leo begins to feel sick, I'll suggest we call the doctor. Carmody. Of course, Carmody. He'll come and ask about what we ate, and I'll say steak and mushrooms, and he'll say, mushrooms? And right away, diagnose mushroom poisoning and give us something. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you so far. And then? And then after he leaves, I'll tuck dear old Leo into bed, tell him I have to go to the drugstore to get something, and I'll go down and let you in. Wait a minute, Wait a minute, what do you need me for? We are in this together, my love. 
And I want you there. Your head damn well better disappear after Leo dies. That will be just fine. And we'll set up a very, very romantic meeting place. Real good coffee, Gloria. Thank you, darling. You really should have made that pie. I gotta watch my figure. <laughs> I know how much you love it. Do you want to go into the den? Oh, not particularly. Look. What? You, you feel all right. I feel fine. Uh, you, are you sure those mushrooms are good? Of course. I don't know. I feel kind of funny. Even if they weren't, it, it's too soon for them to act up. How do you know? Oh, I've known about mushrooms since I was a kid. Well, all the same, I've got pains in my stomach. Call Dr. Carmody. You, do you really think it's the mushrooms, Doctor? I know it's the mushrooms. It has to be. Both of you ate them, and you tell me, Leo, that you ate more than Gloria. Yeah, that's right. That's what I get for being a pig. Well, you're going to be all right. Just stay in bed and... Gloria, you get this prescription, Phil. What about the pain? I'm giving you a sedative yeah. also. Yeah, what I can't understand is how you cooked those mushrooms in the first place, Gloria. And when I told you about those things when you were a child. Well, I, I know, and I, I feel just awful. I, I can't explain how it happened to us. But I... Oh, I'm sorry. I have no excuse. Yeah, no well, use crying over spilt milk. Yeah, I better get home to bed. You get that prescription filled, young lady. Oh, I will. Uh, let me take you to your car. medicine, isn't he? Well, he won't taste it in his tea. He likes it sweet. And I am going to make it very sweet. There. Hand me the cup. No. You know, I could do with a cup of tea myself. How about something stronger? Oh, have you got something? Oh, we're completely equipped. Huh. Oh, don't forget to wash out the glass and put it away. Mm, don't worry. All right. Hey, 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 hey. That's plenty. have to be able to walk straight. No, drink as much as you want. I'll finish what you leave. Gloria! Yes, dear? What happened to the medicine? I'd better get upstairs. I'll be right back. Um, save me a drink? Yeah, how long will it take? Oh, don't ask me, Al, darling. It's the first time for me, too. Bill, that's liquor. Tastes funny. You know, I'll imagine these things. I'd better finish before she gets back. Good. Don't worry about the noise, Al. It's all right with me. What? Well, I guess the aconite wasn't too old, Al. <sighs> stupid, stupid. This was a setup all the way. All the way. 
I must admit, you did make it tough. Not as, not as tough as you made it for me. You know, you're a hell of a dame. You're right, Al. No, 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 not dame. I was going to say a hell of a liar. It wasn't all lies, Al. <sighs> I'm expensive. And there is a million-dollar life insurance policy. Oh. And when I saw your face, I realized that this was just too good an opportunity to lose. <laughs> Help me get him upstairs and into my bed. Yes, dear. <laughs> no time to get hysterical. No, no, I'm not. It, it's just funny to me that Al's going to wind up just where he wanted. In your bed. accomplished. The happy couple, Leo and Gloria Winters, still have a way to go before they achieve their goal. But murder sometimes makes for strange and uneasy bets. Do you really think it's the mushrooms, Doctor? With Act Three. Scottish poet Robert Burns oft-quoted line, the best-laid schemes of mice and men of ganga glee doesn't seem to apply here. Leo and Gloria Winters have successfully killed Al Grissom, a man who looked enough like Leo Winters to have been his twin. They've carried him up to Leo's bed, and now at four o'clock in the morning, a frantic Gloria has summoned her sleepy and bewildered family doctor for whom she plays the distraught and bereaved wife. <laughs> I don't understand. Oh, neither do I, Doctor. I gave him the medicine you prescribed, and he seemed to feel better. <laughs> and he dropped off to sleep, and he... <laughs> well, I, well, I think you'd do well to take that sedative yourself. You can't go on this it's all way, my huh? fault. No, it's no one's fault, Gloria. If there's any blame attached to it, it's mine. But certainly his symptoms earlier didn't seem to warrant more action than I took. Leo's gone. I killed him. Oh, God. Gloria? I'm sorry, Doctor. Sorry, it's perfectly understandable in this situation. Now, I want you to take this sedative and go downstairs and lie down. I'll attend to everything. All right, I will. Thank you. Thank you. told you how clever you are? <laughs> Not more than a million times in the last week. <laughs> <laughs> That's an exaggeration. So? So I love you. You should. Without me, would we be here and pretty air and fast, mm. living the way we've always wanted, with a million dollars, mm. and the whole world waiting to see that we enjoy ourselves? Do you think we can ever go back to the States? Well, I don't want to. Are you, Leo? Watch the Leo. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I've been pretty good though lately, haven't I, Al? You've been great. You must have really been good with old Doc Carmody, too. <laughs> oh, he was so upset and so confused. I threw the most beautiful fit of hysterics you ever saw. I <laughs> wish I could have seen it. Oh, so broken up. <laughs> So he insisted on handling everything, even the insurance people. He never gave him a chance to question anything. He signed the death certificate and had the body out of the house and into the crematorium before they ever got there. What about returning to the U.S.? Oh, I don't think we should for a while. Maybe in a couple of years, hmm? But never to Udalia. Maybe San Francisco. New York. Oh, let's see. How about a dip? Oh, oh. Huh? Al Grissom, a pleasure to see you again, Al. How you doing? 
<laughs> That's a silly question. I can see you're doing great. No one stays at a class hotel like this unless he's doing great. But I always said you had class, Al. Yes, and style. Oh, you want to introduce me to the girl who's hanging on to you? I, I'm afraid you've got the wrong man. Don't you mean you're afraid I got the right one, Al? Look, I don't know you. I've never seen you before in my life. Now, you're not being smart, Al, and you were always very smart. That is, until three months ago, when you made your first mistake. Hey, come on, darling, let's get away from this. You forget man. it. You're finished with that getting away stuff. Well, how can I prove to you that you've made a mistake? My name isn't Al Grissom. Al. I'm... You're registered under a false name? Come on, Al, I'd recognize you anywhere. But I still can't figure why you didn't try some kind of face job. <laughs> but like I said, you haven't played this very smart from the beginning. Look, mister. Oh, the name I... is Grafton. Lou Grafton. And I'll meet you at the Promenade Cafe in an hour. One hour, Al. And you'll be there. Who is this guy? Don't ask me. Well, who should I ask? Maybe Al. Very funny. Didn't Al ever mention this Lou Grafton? Must have said something. Nothing. Well, I don't believe you. But why would I lie? I don't know. But you certainly were cozy enough with Al. I to know... found out what I had to. What we had talked about. He had no family, no relatives, nothing, nobody to trace. I'd better meet this guy and find out what he's talking about. I'll go with you. I don't think that's smart. We're in it together, Al. Who knows? I may even be able to help. Glad you could make it, Al. Sit down. This is Gloria. Nice meeting you again, Gloria. Tell her you'll meet her in a little while, Al. Yeah, she's in on this. On the whole deal? Yes. Hmm. You certainly changed, Al. You never put a dame on the spot before. On the spot? Oh, well, look, look. All I meant is that she's with me. You've made a mistake, and I don't even know what you're talking about. Darling, why don't we listen to what he has to say? Smart. Al, this is the only time I'm going to go soft. The only time. Well, because we've known each other so long, and... <laughs> well, because we didn't pull it off the first time. Now, I've talked to John... I got him to agree that if you give us the whole take, we'll forget about what happened. The whole take? The whole two million, Al. All of it. Well? Yeah, I'm trying to think. What's there to think about? What's your alternative? You gonna try to run again? You know we'll get you. You've seen it happen a hundred times to other guys who try to cross us. Now you just tell us where and when we can pick up the cash... And just thank God that I could make the deal for you. It, it isn't all that easy. What's your problem? It's no use. You wouldn't believe it. You got a problem. You know we can help, but, but don't give me any fairy tales. Any time. For what? To think. There's nothing to think about. Well, from what you say. How much time? Another day. Oh, no deal. Look, if you want to do business with me, you'll just have Tonight, to... Tonight. You'll be in your room at ten. That's plenty of time to think. And while you're at it, think about doing it our way. Or this time, you'll really end up very dead. Two million dollars. That's a lot of dollars. Well, you're a big help. Well, I might be if you'd stop repeating the figures over and over again. There's no way we can get two million dollars. I've got to prove to them that I'm not Al Grissom. Then they'll leave us alone. And how do you do that? Of course. Fingerprints. I'll have absolute proof. Even those guys will delete fingerprints. And who's going to tell them? You? No, 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 no. I've, I've got to arrange somehow for the police to send my prints to Washington or somewhere. And the police will get word back that these aren't the fingerprints of Al Grissom, but really the prints of a man named Leo Winters who supposedly died one month ago and whose widow collected a million dollars in life insurance. <laughs> 
Uh, you're right. That's the only way to go. How do we convince him I'm not Grissom? I don't know. We went to a lot of trouble to prove to the world that you were. Who was this Grissom? He must have been awfully big to get into a deal like this. I uh, think he must be calling you. Me? Who else? Well, I don't want to answer. Oh, that's not smart. They know we're here. Now, don't start talking like Grafton. Hello. Well, it's me. What do you want? Well, I was wondering whether you'd made up your mind. Not yet. It's nine o'clock. Who said ten? I did, but uh, John's not happy. What do I care about John? You should, Al. After all, he's got a real legitimate beef. You worked for him for years. You were always clean. You took the hot stocks and you cashed them. You made money and so did we, but uh, I guess the two million got to... Look, look, I, I've got some more thinking to do and I'll see you ten. Well? I know who and what Grissom was. He took hot stocks and bonds and cashed them and then turned the cash over to, uh, to... The boys? I suppose you could call him that. But does that help any? A little, maybe. How? At least we know what they're after. If there was some way we could trap them. Some way to fool them. Well, suppose there were. Then what? I don't know yet. And play along with me when Grafton comes up at 10. Yes? Grafton. Are you finished thinking? All finished. And? I'll go along with you. Now, why couldn't you have told me that this morning? You had to get John's blood pressure up. Forget John. I, I told you I had problems. And I told you it helped. I don't have the two million with me. Well, we never figured you did. Where is it, Chicago? I'll pick it up. When? As soon as I can. Will you stop playing games? When? It's back in the States. Okay, okay. Now, you'll get the next plan. Not so fast. It's somewhere in Eudalia, and I... I can't go back there. Why not? A little something. The, uh... The cops might want to talk to me. About what? About a girl I visited there, and... An old friend. What's wrong with visiting an old friend? Nothing. If you don't get caught by her husband and get into a fight, beat him up, and... He calls the cops. That's not much of a rap. That's right. But you'd want to see me in jail. Yeah, you got a point. We'll pick up the dough. No way. Why not? We're going to get it anyway. You're going to get it. But I want some assurance that I'm going to be okay. You have my word. You know, I'd like a little more than that. Like what? Well, that's what I've been trying to figure out. Some way I'll be sure that... Look, if you haven't figured it out by now, you're not going to. Well, I got the plane tickets. You sure don't give me much time. We gave you time before, Al. Too much time. Will you stop pacing up and down like an animal? Gloria, I, I think I may have an idea. I hope. On the plane, I'll, I'll tell them I figured it out. Since I can't go back to Eudalia, I'll insist that I want someone representing me when they pick up the money. But there is no money. They don't know that. I'll insist that you go along. Hold it. You'll be all right. What happens when they find out there isn't any money and I'm there and you're not? It put in a call to Carmody. Tell him you can't get over what's happened. That, that, that you, you need help. And that you've gotten into some kind of trouble. He should have the police there. Then you take them to the doctor's house. And with the cops there, you'll be in the clear. And you? I'll be gone. I'd rather be alive and running than... The other way. I don't like it. Then think of something better, because that's the way I'm going to play it. Now, Al, I know you won't get any crazy ideas at this stage of the game, but just in case you do, these two young fellas here are in our party. And they'll be on the plane with us all the way to Chicago. Thanks. Yeah, that's up. Now that's right. 
Excuse me. Uh, one moment, please. <laughs> what do you want? Lieutenant Fourneau, Interpol. I believe you are Mr. Leo Winter. I'm afraid you're mistaken. I've known this man for years. His name is Al. Uh, Mr. Winter. You heard him. You, uh, you've got the wrong man. Please, don't make a fuss, Mr. Winters. I'm instructed to hold you for the murder of an Alvin Grissom in New Delhi. Oh, 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 me? What about her? She's my wife, and she was in on this from the beginning. The, the whole thing... We know was... all about Mrs. Winters. In fact, she was the one who informed us about the murder. In return for some small promises. She told you? She, she... You asked me, remember? You said, think of something better. And I did. Come along, Mr. Winters. Gentlemen, you'll excuse us. <laughs> I'm coming, Lieutenant. I'm coming without any trouble. You, you see, Grafton, you didn't believe me. If you'd only have believed me, maybe we could have worked out a deal after all. The Winters had a good plan, and it all would have worked, except for one thing they couldn't have foreseen, the bend in the road ahead and what lay around it. I'll return shortly. could have known what lay ahead of them, they would never have gone through with their plan. That is, if they could have seen into the future and around the bend. Yet actually being able to see into the future, to know what's going to happen next week, next month, next year, is a gift that most of us wouldn't want. Because who knows what terrors may lie ahead. Our cast included Leon Janney, Joan Lovejoy, Larry Haynes, Paul Hecht, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Am I dead? Not quite. You're in a hospital with a bullet in your brain. As the saying goes, as good as dead. And Sherry and Herb got away with it. Oh, it isn't fair. I only had it to do all over again. Suppose you had. Could you do better? Well, of course. Of course, if I knew what I know now. Naturally. That would have to be a precondition if you're asking for yesterday to live over again. Oh, please. Please. Give me the chance. Can you? Well, why not? I'm a bit of a gambler myself. Let's see how you can remake yesterday. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, and by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Community service is the key to great radio. This is Great Radio, WTAX 1240 on your dial in Springfield, Illinois.
G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of your own terrifying imagination. Since the beginning of time, people have argued about the existence of ghosts. They've been called variously wraiths, specters, phantoms, apparitions, shadows or shades. But everyone agrees that if there are such things as ghosts, they are the souls of dead persons haunting living persons. And that's what our story is about. Ghosts. No one, Mr. Garth, whether professional ghost hunters or ordinary people, have ever been able to spend an entire night in that house. Well, how many have tried, Mr. Flanders? Well, I know of at least a dozen. And that's within the past two years. Well, did you get any reports from the professionals? Most sketchy ones. But they all say the same thing. That whatever or whoever it is that haunts that house... The manifestations are the most powerful and evil in their experience. They all mention nameless horrors. Our mystery drama, A Ghostly Game of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars William Prince. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated. Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. <laughs> Nameless horrors. A nice phrase. But as soon as you put a name and identity to horrors, somehow they prove bearable. In the last century, people have shown that they can and do bear up under mass genocide and atomic bombings. But the horror that is nameless, that is the most fearful of all. And our spine tingler will try to put a name to one kind of horror. You are not real. There are no such things as ghosts. I'm just imagining things. But I see you. No, don't. Don't hurt me. Whatever you are, please, stay away from me. You want us to leave the house? I will. I will. If that's what you want, just please let me by. I'll go right down the stairs, walk out of the house, and never come back. Is that what you want? Please. No. Don't touch me. Let me out! Ah! Suicide. That's what all the papers say, Mr. Garth. But we know better. It's ghosts. That house is haunted. Mr. Flanders, my field of study is the super... But I can't even begin to tell you whether I can help or not until you get control of yourself. I'm sorry, but this, this, this whole thing is just about putting off firm out of business. What is the house, Mr. Flanders? Do you have anything on the history of the house? Yes. It was built in the early 1800s by a sea captain named Ephraim Hatch. For himself and his bride, a young lady named Lucy Endicott. And they lived in it for some four years until the tragedy. You have the details? Well, Captain Hatch was supposedly a hellraiser in his youth, but also a great seafaring man. He was in whaling, and if the rumors are true, slave trading. At any rate, he amassed a fortune. He fell in love with this Endicott girl, who was the town beauty, married her, settled down, and built this house. It mm -hmm. a tragedy. Well, the story goes, as nearly as we can piece it together... But the captain returned from one of his voyages earlier than expected and found his bride entertaining a lover. And he killed them both. Horribly. And ever since, the house has been haunted and unlivable. We're building a condominium. This house is a key location, right in the middle of the property we own. We can't even get records to tear it down. No one will go near the place. Well, you keep telling me that no one has lived in the house. What about this girl who just died? Then? Oh, that was a stupid idea of my partner's. Her name was Roberta Ginley, a television reporter. 
She wanted to make a name for herself, and my partner sold me on the idea that if she spent a night in the house and then went on television and told people about it, our problems would be solved. And now we're in a worse mess than before. That's why we came to you. Well, there you are, gentlemen. The haunted house. Well, is it always this windy, Mr. Flanders? No, Mr. Kelly. Only when the wind blows from the east off the ocean. Well, for a haunted house, it looks substantial enough. Well, shall we go up to the house, Mr. Flanders? Um, why don't you two go... I'll wait for you here. You'll be quite safe, Mrs. Landy. It's broad daylight. Jim Kelly here has been with me in more haunted places and dealt with more ghosts than any man, except myself. Uh, and don't forget Byron. Byron is my dog, Mr. Flanders. And like me, he doesn't believe in ghosts. Huh? Do you, Byron? <coughs> oh, uh, I'm not scared, gentlemen. It's just that I've seen the house so many times, I've... <laughs> well, I don't want to influence you. Who's this, uh... Uh, let's go, Byron. You will uh, bring all our gifts in? Well, it's back at the motel. We won't need it until tonight. Huh. Wow. They certainly built solid houses in the old days. Look at this door. What? Take it easy, Byron. Boy, everything's okay. You got the keys right here? Mm-hmm. All right, in we go. In we go. Come on now, Byron. Come on. We're on our way to meet the ghost. Tim, keep Byron quiet. Sit, sit, Byron. Come on, sit. I don't think we should bother the downstairs. Let's go up and see where we're going to speak tonight. All right, I'm with you. Come along, Byron. Oh, this looks like the master's bedroom. I'll sleep here. All right, I'll sleep in this little alcove here. Right, right off your room. Byron, what is the matter with you? I wouldn't try to take him into that alcove, Tim. He can stay in this room with me tonight. All right, all right. Hey, there's a door here leading outside to what you call the widow's walk. Want to come out and look around? I'll be right with you. Just checking the fireplace. You're going to need logs. Okay. Where's the door? Ah, it's right here. It hasn't been open in a long time. No. Ah. What of you? Look at that ocean. Any woman waiting out here to see her husband's ship come in might be blown away. And what Flanders tells the captain's wife wasn't too anxious for her husband to return. <laughs> That's right. She was too busy entertaining her lover. Oh, 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 you over the rail. Oh, Thanks, Mr. Scott. That caught me. I, I would have gone off. What happened? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I, uh, I don't know. I just... I, Lost my balance. Come on, Tim. We know each other better than that. What happened? I really don't know, Alex. I swear. I thought someone pushed me. Mr. God, I'm not at all sure I'm doing the right thing, and I'll understand if you don't want to go through with this. I'll pay you all your expenses to date. You're uh, concerned about my safety? Yes. A real estate deal is important, but not that important. Mr. Flanders, you have nothing on your conscience. Tim and I will spend tonight in the house, and by tomorrow, the ghost should be at rest. And you think there is a ghost? Well, of course. I just don't believe in its malevolence. Have you taken care of the wooden logs to the fireplaces? The men wouldn't go into the house, but uh, you'll find plenty of firewood outside the door. Fine. Then I'll be on my way. <laughs> uh, I've never seen Byron act like this. Mm, something to think about. Well, I've been with you on about 50 of these haunted house deals. You think there's something different about this one? Well, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. that sort of moan before. According to you, Alex, it's a ghost in pain. It is. <laughs> Sounds like the evening's entertainment is about to start. Tim? Yes, Alex? We've worked together for a long time, and we get along so well because I respect your disbelief in the supernatural. Yeah, which has come in handy when I uncovered a few tape recorders and other little safe devices. Right, right, but for your own sake, Tim. 
There's something about this house that seems different. Now, please, be careful. Huh? You're trying to scare me? Oh, I don't think that's possible. <laughs> right, right. Now, how about some wood for my fire? Oh, whoever you are, if you're trying to scare us, it's not going to work. You know, in all the years we've been working together, Alex, I've yet to see a ghost. But you've heard them. Oh, so you tell me. You talk with them. I just hear noises, and sometimes they're man-made. Mm-hmm, and sometimes not. Uh, would you strike a match, please? Ah, that's better. Huh. Get some of the chill off the room. The fireplaces always seem to make a room more cheerful. The electricity must have been installed around, oh, I guess the turn of the century. <laughs> huh? Well, I've seen brighter lights, but at least. We have light. And candles. Oh, did I share mine with you? No, I have a supply back in my room. Oh, all right. Ah, here we go again. Spirit wrapping. Oh, now I've made it angry. Listen to me. Whoever you are, my name is Alex Garth. I would like to help you, but I can't unless... Doesn't want to talk to you, evidently, Alex. We'll see. Although you're my friend in the lie, you are often a disturbing influence. Now, I won't deny that I'm an unbeliever. So I'll turn in now that the fire's going. And you can go back to your side of the room and commune with the spirits. And with each other, Tim. We'll check with each other, as we always do. Nothing's happening. Hey. What? My lights just went out. How are yours? Going. Going. Go. Easy, boy. Easy. I know you're in trouble. Please, let me help you. If you show yourself, I could help you. I've helped others. Believe me. Is your name Lucy? Lucy Endicott? If you are Lucy, would you rap twice? Can you? Come here, come here. Lucy, you're frightening a dumb animal. You're not frightening me. I'm sure you don't want to terrify a beast. He's never done you any harm. Byron, come here. Come out of that corner. Come to me. Come on, good God. Good God. Come on, come on. Alex, the fire's going out in here. So we go to the candles. You plant me a match, haven't you? Yeah, I'm fine, but I'm really worried about Byron. Oh, somebody's playing James. I tried to find the fuse box if I could, but... Hey. What is it, Jim? Well, whoever's at the controls is pretty good. A nice cold gust of wind just blew out the match I was using to light the candle. Well, I've got a couple of candles lit. You want one? Oh, no, thanks. I'm not scared of the dark. <laughs> ah, that's pounding. That's a new one, isn't it, Alex? It's new to me. It is a spirit wrapping. Sounds like someone wants in. Mm. Want to go down and open the door? Oh, oh, no chance. Hey, Alex, your side of the room is rocking like a boat. I'm steady as a rock. Was that Byron? Yes. What happened? I'm not sure. He... He's dead, Jim. What? His neck seems to have been broken. Tim, did you hear me? I said Byron is dead. Tim, are you all right? Tim, Tim, what is it? Run! Run! For your life! Each man.
man has his own nightmare. Something from which he will run, driven by the secret whips of his own fears. But I suspect that Alex Garth could not tell you what it was that Tim Kelly ran from that night in the house that faced the sea. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. Alex Garth, authority on the supernatural, has undertaken to spend a night in a house so demon-ridden that workmen have even refused to tear it down. Deserted by his friend and ally, Tim Kelly, who fled in terror from unknown fears, Garth knew that he had to face the rest of the night alone as the heavy outer door boomed closed behind Tim Kelly. Will you show yourself now? I promise not to run away like my friend. You'll never find peace unless you let me help you. There can be no rest for you except through me. Do you think you're being punished for some sin you committed when you were alive? That isn't you. Is it, Lucy? Please, let me help you. I will not let you in and I will not leave this house. Locking the room doesn't frighten me. I'm not afraid. Mr. Target! We split it tough, Gallus. Keep it steady or I'll kill you! That letter I received in Trinidad tells me that my Lucy, my wife, is just carrying on under the roof of the house that I built for her with young John Roger. So, Mr. Coggin, we're going to drive for home and to hell with the storm. Nightmares. We've all experienced them. But I venture to say that none of us has experienced the horrible sights shapes and sounds that Alex Garth saw and heard in that dark room of the haunted house for the next hour. And when he still held hard to his sanity and what remained of his courage, the apparitions changed in character. Garth no longer knew what was real and what was fantasy. He later told me that he may even have fallen asleep, hard as that may be to believe. Alex? Alex Garth. Lucy? I am Lucy. Am I not fair, Alex Garth? Yes. Even beautiful? Very beautiful. Would you not like to touch me, Alex? Even if I wanted to, I could not. You think I am cold and, and repulsive. That is what you think. John? Tell Alex how nice I am to touch. You are very nice to the touch, Lucy. Was John your lover? You do nothing but ask questions, Alex Garth. What should I do, Lucy? Make me feel once more the touch of a man. A man you love. And... Lucy, you're in torment. I can only give you peace. Torment? Why should I be unhappy? I live here in my house and... and... <sighs> of course, we were naughty, John and I. We tried to frighten you. But that was only because I don't like strangers in my home. Apologize to Alex, John. This is a childish game you're playing, Lucy. But I adore games. I love games. Come dance a minuet with me, Alex. <laughs> Isn't the music lovely, Alex? I don't dance the minuet, Lucy. John, you dance with me. This was how John and I first met. Doesn't he dance beautifully, Alex? Very beautifully. Remember, John? Remember how you looked at me that night? Yes. And that old witch Hannah saw it. 
and wrote the letter to your husband. Oh, not soon, John. It was much later. Look at me that way again, John. Oh, you're no fun. No fun anymore at all, John. Alex, you'll come and dance with me. No, thank you. You are afraid, Alex. Yes, I am afraid. John, you heard. He is afraid. I said I was afraid, Lucy, but not terrified. Fiddlesticks. You play with words, Alex God. And you want me to play ghostly games with death, don't you, Lucy? here to drive me from my home. Are you happy in your home, Lucy? I will not leave. You shall fail. Others have tried. Would you like to see what happened to those others? I have a mirror you can look into in my room, just down the hall. Look in that mirror if you dare. I think I've been given a fairly good idea already. Leave this house, Alex. For your own sake, leave. Tomorrow morning, Lucy. Tomorrow will be too late. Sit down, Alex Garden. Room will stop spinning. There. That's better, isn't it? I'm still dizzy. I warned you. Now, Alex Garth, now, look at me. Good. Lord! You do not find me beautiful now, Alex Garth. Not now with the blood flowing from the wounds inflicted on me by me when he murdered me. Not murdered. Executed. You would not like to kiss me now, Alex Garth. Stay where you are. You need not worry about my blood staining in your clothes. It will not even show. Stay away. Stay away! I warned you, Alex Scott. You think no one would wish to embrace me now with the cuts and wounds and blood disfiguring me. Is that what you thought? I am not listening. Someone will wish to kiss me. Someone who loves me. I will kiss you, Lucy. I will embrace you. And I will embrace you, John, my love. Even with the blood flowing from your poor I can't look. I can't. It will do you no good to put your hands over your eyes, Alex. You will still see the bloodied lovers kiss. No, I won't witness this horror. My thoughts are mine. And they're real. You're phantoms and you don't exist. For many we don't. But you know that we do. We are here. And we are real. And the only way you can banish us from your mind's eye is to run. Run, as your wise friend did. Run, and you'll see us no more. No. No, Lucy. I am not leaving this house. This is the carriage bearing me to the burial ground, Alex. If you open your eyes, you can see into the coffin. The undertaker did a fine job. I looked almost as pretty as I did before I died. I was wearing the dress you see me in, Alex, and the only mourner following who wasn't afraid of my husband's wrath, the only person who didn't believe I was a wanton. Do you believe that? Yes. You do? Yes. Everyone feared Captain Hatch. And you, Lucy, most of all, you still fear him. No. Oh, why won't you go? Like you, Lucy, I am bound. How bound? By my knowledge, by my pride, by knowing if I leave now, I failed. You have stayed longer than anyone. Not long enough. You mustn't stay. What you have seen is... It will be worse. And dangerous for you. Even more dangerous. And you're afraid for me? Yes. Why? 
really don't know. Of course not. But you seem, John. Have you not noticed that you are very alike? Well, I really hadn't looked that closely. Would you? No, no, I believe you. Then you must see how dangerous it is for you now. Then help me. I cannot. If you would trust me and tell me what the control is, I could help. You're very wise, Alex, but this is something beyond your wisdom. Try me. It's impossible. I am held here by forces stronger than yours. How do you know what my powers are? I told you, you are not the first who has been here. But you are the bravest. And your courage will destroy you. In the morning, Kelly, you woke me up. I'm not quite functioning yet. What do you see? What's in that house? Demons. Well, I thought you didn't believe in ghosts. No, but I believe in evil. And, Mr. Flanders, in that house, you can actually feel the presence of evil. It's all around you, and it's dangerous. Now, listen, Kelly. God knew what he was getting into. It's up to him to handle it. I tell you, his life is at stake. Well, if you're convinced of that, then it's up to you to do something about it. Not to run away. You speak to me of powers, Alex Garth, yet you are afraid to test them. What kind of test do you propose? The mirror. The mirror in my room. Let's go. Well, come on. I'm warning you, Alex Garth. Oh, wait a second. Your death machine will not help you. Death machine? Oh, you mean the revolver. Call it what you like. It spits fire and noise and has been used stupidly by stupid people against us. Surely you know better, Alex Scott. No, it gives me something to hold on to. Come on. You could try to hold on to me. This, this is your room? You fear to go in? Oh, I'm wondering what it is about this room that... This is the room Tim ran out of, isn't it? The mirror is over here. Now, look in the mirror, Alex Garth. Look well. See, Alex Garth? Is that you, Lucy? It is I, Alex. He's a very young girl. And your schoolmates? Who are they? Schoolmates. Is John among them? Look. Look in the mirror. I... I can't make out the faces. Now you're grown. I... I can't. Oh! No! No! Mirror, mirror on the wall. What did the hunter of ghosts Alex Garth see in the mirror that so terrified him, he lost his head and shot at the images in the glass. I'll be back shortly to tell you what Garth saw when I return with Act Three. Some people believe in ghosts. Some very thoughtful people. There are others who say if you believe in ghosts, you will see ghosts. And Alex Garth, expert on the supernatural, is not only seeing, but talking to ghosts. As experienced and as cool a ghost hunter as Alex Garth has just committed the childish act of firing his revolver into a mirror, shattering the glass into a million pieces. And doing the same to his composure. Stupid. Stupid, stupid. Breaking the mirror isn't going to change anything, Alex Garth. 
The only thing you can do is leave. I'm not leaving, Lucy, until dawn. If you stay, your mind becomes a mirror. A mirror for all the things you don't want to look at. Well, if I have to look, I will. Then farewell, Alex Scott. You and I will see each other. But we can no longer talk until you join us. Join you? You are doomed. You will join John and me here in my home for all eternity. And God help you, Alex Scott. Because I no longer can. Lucy, Lucy, is that you? Lucy, my darling, my love, I, I must go now. No, no. Please stay a little longer. Just a little longer, dear heart. Why did you marry him, Lucy? He went away, John, my love. He left and never said a word. How could I, Lucy? You know I didn't have a penny. You could have told me you loved me. You knew that. You knew it all the time we were growing up. Sometimes when people grow up, they change, John. And I was afraid you no longer cared for me. That's why you married the captain. I didn't want to be an old maid. Oh, there was no chance of that. I was afraid. I was afraid, John. He, he was so strong. John, I'm going to have a child. What? I'm going to have a baby, John. You're a baby. You? You're sure? I'm sure. Then we have to leave. You must come away with me, Lucy. Where will we go? West. To a new place. For a fresh start. Somewhere where Ephraim can't find us. There is no such place. Of course there is. Lucy, you know what will happen if Ephraim discovers that... Ephraim won't be home for at least a week. He was in Trinidad the last I heard... Okay. Lucy, please. Come on. Come on down. No one's supposed to go. Oh, no. What do we do? Hide. I need okay. my Where? Anywhere. Quick. There. In my wardrobe. Behind my gown. Lucy. Coming, Ephraim. Just getting my robe. Don't be wasting your time, Lucy. It's been four months since I've seen you last. All right, Lucy. Where is he? Who? John Rogers, your lover. Have you gone mad, Ephraim? Aye, maybe. Mad with jealousy. Stop lying and tell me where he is. You're hurting me. Aye, and I'll be hurting you a lot more unless you tell me where he is. Who put those terrible ideas into your head? The widow Davies, that's who. And, and you believe that old gossip? Tell me she lies. Whilst I roust out your fancy man from wherever he's cowering. There's no one here, Ephraim. God is my witness. No one. Here we go. Well, for your sake, I hope you're right. But the widow told me she saw him sneaking into the house tonight. She lied. She lied. Maybe. And now, how about your wardrobe? Ephraim! I am with child. Get up on your feet. The child is yours, Ephraim. Your child. You think I'll have my wife carrying another man's child? No. Oh, you'll be killing your own child. You liar. You cheat. Oh, stop. 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 <laughs> He's here. The man who got you with child. Then come here and stop me. Come on. No. You know I can't do that. Can't? You mean you won't? You know as well as I do. I've never had anything to do with your wife. Just as you know very well who I am. What I'm trying to do here. Then do it. I'll match my blade against your pistol any time. Captain. No, John. No. So, you came out at last, did you? Now, tell me how you like the taste of steel. Oh, oh. Have another drink, Garth. You look as if you need it. Flanders, there isn't enough liquor in the world to warm me. 
Not after what I saw at your house. Then it is haunted. By ghosts beyond anything in my experience. Can you help me? I hope so, but I'm not sure. I managed to stay the night, and I barely managed to survive. There's one room in the house that seems to be the focal point of all the manifestations. That's the room I believe was occupied by Captain Hatch's young wife, Lucy. That's the room from which Tim ran last night. And that's the room in which I saw things no man should ever have to see. And you propose to hire some workmen? Oh, that's impossible. I told you what happened when I, I had work. I can understand why no workmen from around this area will go near the place. I intend to import a couple of men I've used before. Well, you could try it, but... What would you want them to do? To dig into and around that room and see if we can find something that will account for the hauntings. We? Well, you and I will be with them. Uh, correction. I hired you, Garth. You'll be with them. And report back to me. <laughs> the floor, the hollower it sounds. Hand me that crowbar. Uh, well, maybe we should let things be. Not if you want to rid the house of the ghosts. Or what will we find? Lord knows. <coughs> Here goes. I know. Oh, 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 wait. <coughs> Can't you handle us for that? <laughs> you scared? Well, I think I'd feel better if I stepped outside. <laughs> Be over in a minute. I don't think I'm going to be able to stand this. Well, just think of something else. You get a thought, and you hold on to it. Well, I can... I can only think of the sea and the storm and the ship driving and the woman. Flanders, uh, well, hold on to me. Hang on. And look. Look, there's nothing down there but a room. I, look, look for yourself. God, why, sh why should I be so terrified? Why do I want to run? There are steps. Come on. No, I, you want me to go down? Come on, it's only an empty room. I'm not so sure it's going to... Come on. No, steady now. What's that? It's a table. There's something on it. I know. Let's see. It's just a plain saucer. Yeah, the saucer's plain. But look what's in it. What is that stuff? Well, I'm not sure, but it looks to me like... Or something like mercury. I bet there's mercury in it. Well, we'll have to have it analyzed. What's that on top of this? A needle... Look at its spin. I see. But don't you see anything else? No. 
Well, look under the saucer. Looks like a slip of paper. It does indeed. Let's have a look at it, if I can get it out without disturbing the... There we are. There's running on it. What does it say? As moves this needle, so moves my will. Accursed be this house and all who dwell therein. See to it that they find neither rest nor tranquility, but be doomed to eternal agony and torment beyond the ken of man and woman. To which I affix my seal and signature, Ephraim Hatch, master of the schooner Lucy. Do you mean to tell me that this piece of paper... That saucer of liquid and a needle. Look out. The saucer. Be careful. Quick, quick, the ladder. Hurry, hurry, Flanders. (laughs) The smoke. I can't breathe. The ladder. Quickly. I'm right behind you. How do you say thanks to a man who saved your life? Oh, don't, don't bother. You wouldn't have been down there in the first place if I hadn't insisted. I owed it to you to get you out of there. God. Yes? I want to explain about my upsetting the saucer. I wouldn't say this to anyone except you, but... I swear that something pushed my hand. Do you believe that? Yes, Flanders, I believe it. And now your house is cleansed. The fire will see to that. For those of you who are skeptical about the existence of such things as ghosts, I have a suggestion. Find a house reputed to be haunted and spend the night there. And then let me know about it. I'll be back shortly. Alex Garth is still an avid investigator of the supernatural. However, he has a curious reluctance to tell people about what he saw during the night he spent in that house on the New England coast. And he never admits that many times in the dead of night, he sees again the face of Lucy her lover, and the terrible sword of Captain Ephraim Hatch. And he awakens with his mouth open in a soundless scream. Our cast included William Prince, Ralph Bell, Joan Tyson, William Redfield, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Are you saying the legend is true, that Millie has offended the beast goddess and is being punished? I don't know what I'm saying. But look at her. She's flushed, breathing rapidly. She could burst through that sedative any minute. Oh, my heavens. I'm so hungry. Try to rest, darling. I'm going to speak with the hospital in Rio. I'll describe her symptoms. They'll arrange together. Oh, my wrist. Oh, oh, my wrist. Oh, oh. Doctor. It's burning. Oh. Look at her wrist. Look at her wrist. Something's on it. It's the design. It's the shape of that bracelet. Kevin, it's your imagination. Here's it. Look. Do you see that symbol? It's on every ornament worn by the goddess. The design decorates her dress. It's just a raw, ugly scar. But it's her sign. The sign of the beast goddess. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. You're listening to WTAX Radio.
welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense. Welcome to the world of your own terrifying imagination. So many catastrophic things happen in this world because a lady asks a gentleman a question and then refuses to accept his answer. For instance, the Lady Eve. What great harm could it do if I took just the tiniest bite of that apple? Or the lady named Pandora. Why would it be a calamity if I should sneak just a quick little peek into that box? Now add to the list a charming young lady named Millie. She also has a question. Why can't I have the bracelet, Kevin? It belongs to the temple. Oh, nonsense. It's been lying here in the jungle for at least a thousand years. Who'd miss it? Its owner, the beast goddess. Oh, come on, Kevin. And you know what she does with people who steal her property. She turns them into animals. Really? Well, it's the local legend, Millie. Now, you just take that little bracelet off your arm and put it back exactly where you found it. Sure. Millie, I mean it. Sure, Kevin. Sure. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Sign of the Beast, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Lois Smith. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. What is the difference between man and beast? There are those who ask, is there a difference? It wasn't very long ago that man himself was a beast, a carnivorous hunter with an insatiable appetite for raw meat. True, quite a bit has happened since. We've learned manners. We've invented civilization and culture. We've created a conscience, a code of morals, a system of ethics. But how deep do all these things go? Does the beast still slumber in each of us, waiting patiently, biding its time, ready at any moment to assert its mastery with fang and claw? This is going to be a very vital question for the very pretty and vivacious young lady who at this moment is riding in a helicopter. The copter is hovering over a large clearing deep in a South American jungle. Here you are, Millie. Thanks a million, Larry. It's a sure bet Kevin and Professor Jorgensen won't thank me. Better lift us out of here before they make you take me back. You know, Millie, I don't think I'm doing you a favor. Just toss my duffel bag over the side? What's more, it could cost me my job. Company's coming. And leading the parade, the adorable Kevin himself. Well, all ashore is going ashore. This ship's sailing right now. Thanks again, Larry. And if I ever leave Kevin, I'll marry you. Gee, and I thought you liked me. Now jump out fast. And furthermore... And furthermore, you haven't even kissed me. Look, I'm very angry about this, Millie. You could still kiss me, Kevin. You promised to stay at the base camp. That was last week. But we're moving into the jungle tomorrow. Kevin, we've already been through all the arguments. <clears throat> Category A, danger from animals. Well, I brought the 405 Anson Carterettes, and I'm a better shot than you are. Now listen, Millie. Category B, danger from rare, unknown, mysterious, incurable tropic diseases. You have just as much chance of getting one as I do. Dr. Jorgensen will be furious. Your Dr. Jorgensen is my Uncle Bert. I can handle him. It isn't a matter of handling well, people. Well, it's true, you know. Millie can always handle me. Uncle Bert, I love you. A kiss to see me. Dr. Jorgensen will have to radio that idiot, Larry. I'm not going back, Kevin. Sir, won't you make her see reason? I warned you about this, Kevin. Last year, when you said to me, how about an introduction to that good-looking niece of yours, I told you the problems, but you would have her. And I'm worth it. Oh, Millie, it's only because I love you so much. Uncle Bert, why don't we leave Achilles here to sulk in his tent while you show me around the camp? Oh, and uh, there's somebody you should know, that tall, powerful-looking fellow. 
His name is Imara. He's our straw boss. Uh, Imara. Whenever you want something done, you... Yes, Dr. Jorgensen. Imara, this is Kevin's wife. Her name is Millie. How do you do, Imara? It is an honor to meet you, Millie. Imara's in charge of setting up, taking down, and moving the whole camp. Ah, well, I can see he does a splendid job. Oh, no, no. The fact is, he does a very bad job. What? What did you say? I said he does a poor and unsatisfactory job. Uncle Bert? Oh, it's the truth. But everything looks to be so neat, so orderly. Actually, Imara is unbelievably incompetent. He deserves to be fired. I think that's unfair and heartless. Excuse me, uh, Millie. Uh, Mara, please go to Kevin's tent and bring Millie's 405 rifle. Yes, Doctor. At once. Uncle Bert. No, no, before you say another word. How could you be so heartless? You must understand, Imara, his primitive superstitions, his beliefs. But he's not some ignorant savage. You can tell by his speech. He's obviously educated. Must you insult him? Millie, you simply cannot compliment these natives. These natives? Oh, my, aren't we condescending. And why must we not compliment them? Will it spoil them as servants? Will it drive up the pay scale? Oh, Millie, I... <laughs> Where to begin? In Aymar's religion, he is surrounded by a host of jealous, angry, implacable gods and goddesses. They do not tolerate praise for human beings. That's nonsense. One man's nonsense is another man's devoutly held belief. You terrify Amara when you praise him. Therefore, on this expedition, never. There's a charm in being a uh, oh, quirky, kooky, offbeat. Just obey orders. Don't, under any circumstances, praise anybody. Understand? Yes, Uncle Bert, I understand. Things are bad enough. In the first place, you're a woman. Well, I like that. You need some prestige. That's why I sent him for the rifle. Hit some tin cans, break a few bottles at 300 yards, and you'll be one of the boys. Uncle Bert, you actually are a male chauvinist. Who would have suspected it? Well, I have to pack away my instruments. Can I trust you not to get into any trouble? Implicitly. Very bad shot, Millie. And now, I'll break that bottle next to it. Oh, that was terrible. Not bad, if I do say so myself. And that's every bit of 250 yards. Now, you see those three cats? You are a very poor shooter, Mary. That's nothing. You should see me when I'm in practice. Oh, my. I didn't know we had children in the camp. Who's that youngster by the kitchen tent? It is my little boy. He stays here with me till we leave the jungle. What's his name? His name... Is I Sarah? I Sarah. Oh, what a lovely no. name. No, no, it is an unpleasant name. I should think you'd be proud. Proud? Me? Proud? Why do you say I'm proud? Oh, because he's such a handsome child. No, he is plain, he is ugly. He, he seems so intelligent. Notice how patiently he lines up those stones and shells. No, you're stupid, what? I swear to you. He has no sense. He disgraces his mother and me. Well, what are you saying, I'm not... This child is a fool. Anyone can see that. Now, I must go. Where? I... I must go clean the rifle. I must go. Well... Oh, what made him so upset? Oh, oh! Now I remember. Amira, you may serve the coffee. I know the cuisine has left something to be desired these past few days, Millie. Oh, none of this bothers me. I can live on tea and toast, fruit and vegetables. By tomorrow sometime, we'll come to the ancient temple, the forbidden ground. I have the cameras ready. I, I must caution you, Millie. We were permitted to come here only because I promised the chief, who is my blood brother. We do have a wild family, don't we, And we Bird? will not defile the holy ground. Now, all around you'll see scattered ornaments, bric-a-brac, all, all sorts of things. Touch nothing. Uncle Bert, I hardly have to be told. We can photograph anything, everything, but it all belongs to the goddess. The beast goddess. It'd be dangerous to touch anything anyhow. You see, dear, this is very possessive. 
I don't know why I have to be treated like a child and indoctrinated with lessons in basic honesty. I've been on digs with you before, Uncle You Bert. take anything that belongs to the beast goddess, and she'll transform you into a wild animal. What's that, Uncle Bert? Those drums. Uh, you get used to it. It's, it's just the native telegraph service. What are they saying? Oh, I never learned to read them exactly. I can just get the general idea. I, uh, uh, I think it's news of death. Death? Yes, it's someone's death. How can you tell? Well, the, the basic rhythm speaks of death. And since it's a very beat, it's probably, well, the death of a child. A child? Yes, I'm sure of it. Millie, is, is something wrong? Oh, I have a headache. I think I'd better turn in. Amira, uh, let's put the scaffold here. I want to climb this wall and study the inscription. Millie! Darling, you feel better? Yes, I, I suppose so. I'll, I'll just have to live with this headache. Uh, come here a minute. Okay. I'm Mara. Yes, Millie. Your little boy, I, Sarah, he's dead, isn't he? Yes. How did you know? I know. I'm sorry. I thank you. I mean, I... I hope you... You d don't... Yes, Millie. I hope you don't think I'm responsible. Why should I think that, Millie? Because, be, be, oh, I don't know. Yes, yes, I do. It's because I, I praised him just a few days ago, and you seemed so upset about it. I was upset. Oh yes, very much. And Doctor Jorgensen told me. I know. That... I know what he told you. But my little boy, my. I said I died of fever, the way so many children here do, suddenly with without warning. Then you don't blame me. I blame you? No. I am not a... I felt terrible. I was afraid you might. You see, in our culture, we believe in praise, especially when it comes to children. We automatically say nice things about children. I understand. And have a gift for you. For me? We have a custom. When we make someone feel bad, we must give that person a gift. And the person must accept. Oh. oh, that's such a lovely bracelet. Where did you get it? Here. Oh, but we're not supposed to... There are thousands, thousands of pieces of ornament. Who would know? Place it on your wrist. Ah, see how pretty it looks. Oh. Wherever but... you look, thousands of beautiful things. This is the very last. Besides, it is the custom. You see, you would have to explain why I gave it. I understand. And it would make them uncomfortable. Because everything they have come to believe about superstition would be wrong. Millie! Millie! Uh, what is it, Kevin? You bring the camera. I want to shoot these inscriptions. Thank you again, Anara. And it will be our secret. I'm coming, Kevin. Yes. Go to him. Go to your husband, arrogant, heedless, ignorant woman. You have defied my gods and killed my son. Your punishment has been decreed. It has already begun. Well, Aymara is obviously a man of parts. And he's already shown us quite a few of them so far. The punishment that has just begun will be expanded and continued when we return shortly with Act Two. Is it entirely valid to suggest that the best way to... And there seems to be some historical basis for it. Archaeologist Kevin has ordered his wife, Millie, 
not to touch any of the artifacts or ornaments found in his latest discovery. And now, he finds it impossible to take his eyes off her wrist. Is this the section of the temple wall you want me to film, Kevin? Kevin? Kevin, what are you looking at? What's that on your wrist? Oh, well, it's just... Millie, uh, Dr. Jorgensen told you, I told you, under no circumstances were you to touch anything. Well, You I... not only touched it, you're wearing it. Look, these silly superstitions... Where did you get it? Kevin, I don't like that tone of voice. Hey, hey, what are you two quarreling about? Show him, Millie. Oh. Uncle Bert, listen. I must ask you, Millie. Where did you get it? I found it. You found it here? Well, uh, around. Billy, I can tell by the workmanship. It was made by an ancient priest of the temple that has the same symbols. What's all the fuss? Billy, I thought we all understood. Why can't I have the bracelet? Because it belongs to the temple. Nonsense. It's been lying around the jungle for at least a thousand years. Who'd miss it? Its owner, the beast goddess. Kevin, are you serious? Listen, go ahead. Tell me the rest of it. Tell me she turns people who steal her property into animals. <laughs> Amara, let's put this... We're looking a point, Millie. If it were made of gold or silver or precious stones, I could understand. But it's just a twisted piece of copper. Well, for all I know, we're being watched. If so, you can expect a poisoned arrow through your throat any second. You know, I listen to the two of you, and I... Millie, your trouble is that you don't listen. Uh, let's not have an argument. I gave my word. That's all there is to it. Millie, you will take that bracelet off your wrist and put it back. Put it back exactly where you found it. Sure. I mean it, Millie. Well, sure, Uncle Bert. Sure. Here. These are the symbols the Incas used for weddings. Well, could they have originated this far north and east, Dr. Jorgensen? Millie, photograph this section of the wall. Yes, yes. Um, um... Uh, I... I need some more film. I'll be back in a second. Well, you don't have to go. We'll send a mirror. No, no, it's all right. Um, I, I just want to stop off at the kitchen tent. I think I need a snack. We just had breakfast. I know, but I'm hungry. Are you sure you feel all right, Millie? Oh, I'm fine. J just a little hungry, that's all. Millie, about uh, yesterday. What about yesterday? The bracelet. Oh, that. Forget it, Uncle Bert. I know that you see so much just lying around. It seems silly to make a fuss over some trinket, but... I'm willing to forget it, if you are. Hi, Mara. Yes, Millie? Where's the cook? He will be back soon. I was wondering if there's anything to eat. What would you like? Well, uh, I, I'd like some meat. I uh, could cook a slice. Oh, would you please, Aymara, and hurry. Will this be enough? Just throw it on the fire. Yes, Millie. Mm, that's good. Oh, oh, that smells good. Be careful. Don't burn it. I just put it... No, up. no, no. You're burning it. Aymara, that's good. It's good. Right now, just the way it is. I tell you, it's fine. Yes, Millie. Let me get you a plate and a knife and a fork. Oh, hurry. Here you are, Millie. Oh. Oh. I bow. Put up some more. Kevin. Now, what is it, Amara? You asked me to prepare a list of supplies for the helicopter. Ah, yes, good. Uh, let me write it down. First, we need uh, fresh meat. Okay, fresh meat. Wait a minute. Didn't Larry fly some up? Just a couple of days ago? Yes, Kevin. Well, we should have at least enough for the rest of the week. The cook says he has only enough for tonight's meal. Oh, that's impossible. Would you like to see, Kevin? I take your word for it. But is someone stealing meat? I cannot say, Kevin. Well, I know we eat a lot of it, but still, I... All right, put down meat. And this time, get plenty of it. Is there any more meat, Hamara? I will go see. Meat 
since I've known you. Aren't you going to finish yours, Kevin? Well, I've had enough. Let me have your plate. Yeah, out here I must agree with you, Millie. I'm starved, Uncle Bert. I don't understand it. <laughs> you must be famished. Honey, you haven't had meat in so long, you've forgotten how to eat it. You have to chew it before you swallow. Excuse me. Get out some chops. Those, oh, take them back. They're too well done. I want some rare. I'm sorry. This is all we have. Tell him to put up some more. There is no more meat. Well, that's right. Larry's due in with supplies in the helicopter. When will he be here? Well, I don't know. Sometime today. Why don't I take the 405 and shoot us a deer or something we can eat? Really? Are you all right? Of course I'm all right. Now, why do you ask? Well, don't snap my head off. Honey, you'd better get some rest here. You're tired. I'm and... not tired. I'm hungry. Millie, darling, something's wrong. Why? Well, because this isn't like you, oh. that's all. Kevin, I... I... Oh, I don't know. I, I have such a pain in my stomach. What, what kind of pain? Hunger. That's the only way I can describe it. But you shouldn't be hungry. I it's... can't help it. I have this terrible craving for food. Oh, no, not for food. For meat. For red meat. Oh, Kevin. Uncle Bert, I'm frightened. Take I'm her to frightened. a tent, I'll... Kevin. Take her to a tent. We'll, we'll give her a sedative. Oh, yeah. Yes. Maybe that'll be best. Maybe that pain will go away. Yeah. Come, come, oh. come on, dear. Now. Oh, come on. Kevin. Oh, Kevin. You'll wait me when Larry gets here in the helicopter with we're, we're the meat. Sure, sure. Promise. Promise. Yes, dear, I I promise. Is she asleep, Kevin? Yes, finally. Dr. Jorgensen, what's wrong? I don't know. I've never seen her hysterical. Are you as worried as I am? I'm worried enough to want to get her to Rio, to a hospital. Let's radio Larry to get that damn helicopter here pronto. I just spoke to Larry. We have a problem. It seems a helicopter needs some repairs. What kind of repairs, for God's sake? I don't know. It was technical. Larry's working on it. Larry, Larry, he's an idiot. If he hadn't brought her here... It... It's our fault, yours and mine. We let her stay. What are we going to do? You say she's asleep. Well, all she needs is rest. Maybe when she wakes up, she'll be better. Kevin. Kevin. I'm here, dear. I'm here. Oh, I was so sleepy. I know, I know. It's dark out. What time is it? Well, it's almost midnight. You let me sleep. You didn't wake me. I couldn't. But Larry was here and he brought the meat. No, dear. The helicopter's out of order. Oh, Kevin, I am so hungry. Well, I knew you'd be hungry when you woke up. So I'll make you an egg sandwich. No, no, no. I want some meat. But there isn't any. There's plenty of meat. Where, Millie? All around you. Out there. There's deer. There's wild pig. Can't you smell it? Oh, no, I... Millie... Let me have the 405. We'll be able to feast. You can't go... No, I... In the morning. You can't hunt in the morning. All the... at night. Darling. That's the time. Now, listen. Here are some pills to calm you. Kevin, something's wrong with me. I don't know what. I... I... I say things I don't understand. I have urges. Oh, I can't even describe. Hold my hand. Yes, yes, dear. <laughs> what is it, darling? What is it? Oh, my wrist. My wrist. It's burning. Oh, oh, it's on fire. What's, what's, what's the matter, Marie? <laughs> Look at her wrist. Oh, that's a very ugly-looking irritation. How did you get it, Marie? Oh, I don't remember. I don't know. Oh, Uncle Bert, I don't know anything. I'm out of... I'm out of... Here. Now, Millie, you must try to be calm. Try, try, dear. Yes, Uncle Bert, I'll try. Now, tell me, how did you hurt your wrist? I don't, I don't remember. Try to think, try to remember. You probably have an infection, some kind oh, of bruise. I don't have an infection. I'm not sick. I'm hungry. Do you understand? I'm hungry. You want me, Dr. Jorgensen? I'm our uh, Bring the medical kit. Back. I'm hungry. Well, the first thing we have to do is put a penicillin ointment on that bruise. Jeez. Feverish, ravenous appetite for meat, bruise on wrist, could be anything. She could have scraped it against a, a bramble, anything. Or an insect. Dr. Jorgensen, we have to get her out of here. Now, radio Larry, tell him it's an emergency. We have to do Don't something. Don't lose your head. Listen, Millie. Oh, Kevin. Kevin. Won't you get me something to eat? Yes, yes, dear, I will. I have the medicines, Dr. Jorgensen. Good. 
Kevin, you don't love me. I think we'd better put you to sleep. Hold your arm still, no, my no. dear. No, no, you want to stop me. I'm going to bleed. Hold her arm, Kevin. No, no. Uh, oh. Oh. I'm all right. I want to ask you a question. Yes, Dr. Jorgensen. Have you ever seen anything like this? Yes. Where? When? Once, it was a man. He had invaded these holy grounds. He had stolen a jewel from the beast goddess. He... Yes? Go on. He then became a beast. He disappeared into the jungle, and he was never seen again. Thank you, Amar. You may leave. This kind of superstition we can do without. Maybe. And don't bite my head off. Maybe there's something to it. Something to what? To what he's saying. Oh, I know, I know. Primitive superstition. But look at us. You and me. Between us, we carry a considerable supply of the knowledge of the civilized world. Between us, we have degrees in medicine, anthropology, chemistry, sociology... Can we explain it? Are you saying the legend is true that Millie has offended the beast goddess being punished? I don't know what I'm saying. But look at her. Look how troubled, how agitated she is. She's flushed, breathing rapidly. She could burst through that sedative any minute. Kevin, I'm so hungry. Try to rest, darling. I'm going to get on the radio. The helicopter is out of order. Past all that. I'm going to speak with the hospital in Rio. I'll describe her symptoms. They'll arrange together. My wrist! Oh, oh, my wrist! Oh, oh! Doctor! It's burning! Oh! Look at her wrist! Look at her wrist! Something's on it! Oh! It's a design! It's the shape of that bracelet. Kevin, it's your imagination. Yes, it look. Do you see that symbol? It's on every ornament worn by the goddess. The design decorates her dress. It's just a raw, ugly scar with some very wavy lines. But it's her sign. The sign of the beast goddess. The sign of the beast. It, it could be a coincidence. Do you believe that? I, I, I... Tell me, do you believe it? Kevin, I don't know what to believe. You've got a pretty good handful of advanced college degrees in that tent. Most of them in the sciences. And it's surprising how quickly knowledge abdicates in the face of the unknown terrors of the jungle. Can science be just a veneer also? I'll return shortly with Act Three. Or... Hamlet said that there were more things under heaven and earth than were dreamed of in philosophy. Hamlet should be with us in a tent, deep in a South American jungle, amidst the ruins of an ancient temple, because there are more things than any of us can dream of. Is she still asleep? I think so. She shouldn't be left alone. I'll go back in the tent in a second. Dr. Jorgensen... I just had to find out. Were you able to radio the hospital? Kevin, it's two o'clock in the morning. Well, what's the difference? My contact there, the chief of medicine, is due at seven. Can't he be reached? Kevin, he's returning from vacation. He's on the road. It's only five hours. Don't worry. Poor Millie. You know, she really didn't mean any harm. And there are scads of this stuff lying around. I know. It's a pretty little thing. Who'd miss it? She didn't think it was stealing. Kevin, don't talk as if... It, as if, if what? As if you believe this is the revenge of the beast goddess. Can you rule it out, Kevin? If they can't send a copter for her, I'll carry her out of here on my back. Those damn drums, what are they saying? Is it important? I'm getting so jumpy. What are the drums saying? Oh, no, nothing. That isn't so, Dr. Jorgensen. Why do you make an issue out of it? Why do you refuse to tell me? Now, you can read those drums the way I can read a telegram. Now, what are you trying to keep from me? It's just that I thought the agitated state you're in right well, now... Well, don't make it worse. What are those drums saying? Well, it has to do with revenge. Revenge? What was that? Well, those are rifle shots. Well, who'd be firing at this hour? Come on. 
Millie! Millie! Well, she's gone. She's got a rifle. Amira, wake everybody up. Rouse the camp. We have to find Millie. Millie! 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 Be careful now. Watch every footstep. It's a good thing there's a moon. Millie! Millie, where are you? Those shots came from just about here. Why did she go out? Oh, let's quit pretending. You know why she went out. To hunt. At night? Why? Because she's hungry. Oh, Kevin. When are we going to face it? Admit it. Millie! Millie, can't you hear us? Bert? Look. Where? Oh. Oh, no. No, no, she can't be dead. Millie, Millie. She seems to be breathing. There's blood all over her. But it isn't her blood. She must have shot this deer and... Uh... Millie, Millie. Are you all right? I feel so nice and warm. Have you reached the doctor yet? Yes, Kevin. They're sending a copter. It'll be here late this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Oh, that's great. They're doing the best they can. Oh, sure. I'll be reasonable. Reasonable, huh? My wife is being destroyed before my eyes. It seems there is, or they think that this might be a very unusual disease. Oh, come on. It's, it's, a, it's an infection. She might have picked it up from the bracelet. What are you talking about? It could have scratched her when she put it on. And? Well, it's been lying here for hundreds of years. All kinds of parasites, microorganisms. Anyhow, it seems this disease creates enormous cravings for protein. And what does your man suggest? Massive doses of penicillin. Well, do we have enough? I I hope so. I'm Amara. Yes, Dr. Jorgensen. Bring me the medical chest. Kevin. Kevin. She's awake. I'm coming, dear. Kevin. No, Millie. Now, lie still. Don't get up. Oh, I feel so comfy. How's your wrist? My wrist? Oh, it's okay. It only hurts when I feel hungry. And you're not hungry now? Mm, no, no. Oh, you know, I had such a crazy dream. I better not tell you. You've got to. <laughs> You've aroused my curiosity. You won't believe it. You try me. Don't laugh. Promise. I promise. Well, I... Dreamed I went out into the jungle alone at night. Oh, there's a picture for you. Imagine me alone in the jungle at night. Anyway, I dreamed I shot this, I think it was an antelope. Oh, something like that. Yes. And I was so hungry, I ate it right there. What a dream. Oh, you know, I felt so full just before, but just talking about food seems to give me an appetite. How about some tea and toast? Tea and toast. Ooh, how about a nice chop? Or steak? Rare. Very rare. Well, Larry's been unable to fly up the supplies. Doesn't matter. I can go out and shoot. Later, Millie. Later. Mm. You're not hungry now, mm. are you? Oh, well, not very, but in a little while. Okay. Mm. Then just a little while. Huh? Promised. Okay, I promise. <laughs> Where have you been, Doctor? I've been waiting in the tent. Don't leave her alone again, Kevin. Where's that penicillin? That's just the problem. What problem? Look, we just can't have any more problems. We do. The penicillin is gone. That's impossible. All the bottles of penicillin solution, all the tablets, gone. But how? I don't know. Are any other supplies missing? No, everything's here. Kevin! Go to her quickly. The penicillin... Amara brought me the chest. The drug was missing. We have spares in the supply depot. I looked. Gone from there, too. Kevin! 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 I'm hungry! Oh, Kevin, you don't know how my stomach hurts! And my hands! It's on fire! Millie, everything will oh, be all right. Sure, yes! Just let me take the 405 and shoot something! No, Millie, no. Kevin, I'm going! Millie, try to get some rest. I don't need rest! I need food! I need meat! Please, Millie, fly back. Rest! Take your hands off me! Millie! 
Let go of me! Help me. Oh, somebody give me a hand. We'll have to tie her down. I'm all right. Get some rope. Let go of me! Let go! Where's that damn helicopter? He could never find us at night. He'll have to wait till morning. I don't know if she can wait until morning. Listen, we don't have medicine. Let's try the other thing. What other thing? The legend. Maybe we can placate the goddess. Kevin. Is there anything else we can do? Now, there's something happening here. The penicillin is gone. How do you account for it? We may have forgotten to pack it. Nonsense. Last night, you said the drums were talking about revenge. Revenge for who? For what? And what are they saying tonight? It's revenge. Kevin! Come in here! I'm coming. I'm coming. Kevin, I want the 405. Untie me. No, no Millie. Millie. What did you do with Untie it? Untie me. What did you do with it? The bracelet. You didn't put it back, I'm did you? I'm hungry. I'll die, Kevin. I'll die. I want to tell you, if you just tell me, where did you put the bracelet? I, uh, I'll get you some meat. Yes. Oh, Kevin, yes. The bracelet. The bracelet. It, it, it didn't my makeup get. Oh, no, untie me. Let me hunt. Where did you find the bracelet? Oh, you promised to untie me. Where did you find the bracelet? I must go hunting. Oh, Kevin. Where did you find the bracelet, Millie? I, I didn't find it. Tell me the truth or I'll... I'll never untie it. I didn't find it. I'll leave you here to starve. Amara. What about Amara? I, I promised him I wouldn't tell. What about Amara? Oh, he, he gave me the bracelet. Oh, Kevin, untie me. Please, untie me. <laughs> Mira, you will tell us where you hid that penicillin, or I'll blow your brains out. You may kill me. That's not the way. Let me beat it out of him. For the past two nights, Samara, the, the drums have talked of revenge. Whose revenge? Mine. Upon whom? Millie. For what reason? She killed my only son. How? She made the gods jealous. She spoke of his beauty, his intelligence, his skills. The gods were angry. Of course, but she didn't know any better. It made no difference to my son. He died. And your revenge? I gave her a bracelet. I tricked her. I fooled her. I made her take it. Where did you find the bracelet? So that we may return it with a suitable prayer and beg forgiveness from the goddess. I will not say. Stand aside, doctor. It's my turn. You may kill me. No, he won't kill you. Who says I won't kill him? Be quiet. No one will kill you. But I am a blood brother to your chief. I will tell him that you committed a sacrilege. I will tell him that you stole a bracelet from the goddess for an evil purpose. Now you may go, Amara. What do you mean, he may go? He'll be disgraced for life. His wife, his parents, his brothers and sisters... All will be driven from the village into the jungle. No one will speak to him. Why do you stay here, Amara? We have no further use for you. Oh, I believe we owe you a month's wages. Here, plus two weeks' notice. The bracelet, it was taken. I took it from the arm of the statue of the goddess. Repeat this, Millie. Why do I have to go through this mumbo-jumbo? Oh, just do it, Millie. Now, place the bracelet on the wrist of the statue. Ugly old girl, isn't she? Millie. Okay, okay. Now, say, forgive my sin. What sin? Okay. Forgive my sin. What else? That's all. That says it. Well, that's a relief. I must have been a trial to you boys. What happened to me, anyhow? The way you were shooting penicillin into me. How are you now, darling? 
okay, I guess. Oh, but I'm so hungry. Hungry? Starved. For, for what? Meat? Meat. Since when did I ever eat meat? Just point me at some tea and toast and salad and fruit. I might even have an egg. It's always good not to put all your eggs in one basket. Always have another course of action in reserve. What cured Millie? The atonement before the goddess and the return of the bracelet? Or the penicillin? Or both? I'll be back shortly. Supernatural, above and beyond the natural order of events, of or related to ghosts. Behavior caused by the intervention or by the action of a god on earthly affairs. Choose your own definition for this tale we are about to relate. Did you really mean what you said about me? Every word. But 
she was so beautiful. How could you... April was April. She isn't in my world or anyone else's anymore. She's dead. I'm sorry, darling. I shouldn't have brought her up. I... Oh, we're here already. So, I'm about to see Richard Morgan's folly at last. I'll let the walls spoil it for you. Oh, but it's like a fortress, Bob. Wire, broken glass. And the gate looks as though you borrowed it from the best thing. Does it all have to be so hard? The price of privacy. What little we could ever get. The fans considered April and myself public property. But we could forget that once we're inside. From there, looking out, you can't even see the walls. Open the gate. I don't think I could even budget it if I knew how. <laughs> Not manually. You see the little box on the visor? It's an electric gizmo. Just press the button on it. It's a magic castle. Enter your majesty and long live the queen. Pull over to the gatehouse. Stop a minute. The hounds of the Baskerville? They are guardian angels. They patrol the grounds at night. Juan, amigo, que pasa con los perros? They know you are back in casa, mi padrón. They will not be tranquil till they see you for themselves. Bienvenida en casa, señor Morgan. Muchas gracias, viejo amigo. Darling, this is Juan, el señor Aguilar. Juan, permíteme presentarte con nueva señora, mi esposa. Put the top down for the senora. I'll get the dog quiet. Could you get some fresh air? Well, my husband didn't have any trouble quieting down the dog. They're not really as savage as they sound. Are they one? They are trained to kill, senora. Anyone who does not belong here. Oh, goodness. I hope they get to know me soon, then. If they learn to know you belong... You have nothing to fear. You've been here a long time? Since the house was first built. Then you were here from the beginning with Richard's... with Richard's first wife, April. See. Si. A terrible tragedy for all of you. You must have loved her. She was... the Senora de la Casa. I hope you won't blame me for trying to take her place. There is no one to take her place. Si, sí, senorita. Here in the hall. Yes, senorita Morgan. You didn't take her portrait down. La senora? April? That is her place. I don't think my brother is going to agree with you. He is bringing home a new bride, you know. I know. Didn't he suggest it might be a sensible idea to clear away all the portraits and memories of April from around the house? The portrait here in the hall is painted on plaster. It cannot be removed. Any more than her memory can be removed. So... It stays. This is her place. No one can take it. A fresco. Funny, I never realized that. Because it's framed, I suppose. It was El Patron's idea for the wedding present. His way of saying, Here is my love, which will never die. As it will never die for any of us. Except for my brother Richard. <sighs> Maybe he thinks so. Maybe not. But once he returns again, I think he will know there is only one, La Senora. Now you're really going to see what Borrepo is all about. <laughs> I'm going to drive slow so you can drink it in. Look. <gasps> oh, it's breathtaking. That's Borrepo. Not only the house, but the cliffs. And that wild leap off into the Pacific and all the way to the horizon. Oh, I love it. I hope you'll be able to. But I do already. Except... Except what? Well, the rest of it is all so vast that suddenly the house seems small. Now, the closer we get, I realize how huge it is. Well, it's, it's rambling. started from small beginnings and then just kept on growing. Looking at that main house, it wasn't all that small. Well, for its day, it was. 
Big families then. All that's left of mine, I see clustered on the porch. My sister. And the lady with her? Cat Char, housekeeper. Conchita Aguilar. She's Juan's wife. I have no one, but at least you have a sister. Makes me feel a lot less like an orphan. And the house is so lovely. I hope I've come home. I told you when we came back to America that would be your decision. Jenny, for many reasons it... Well, it's not going to be an easy one. But just give it a chance. I welcome it, Richard. If only it will welcome me. We flew straight from Japan to San Francisco. Then drove down to Monterey to pick up the car. Oh, it's so good to see you. Your bride is lovely. But you could have let us know about the wedding. Lisa, I wanted to keep it private, so we just sneaked off. <laughs> uh, more coffee, Jenny? Mm-mm. Richard? No, I think I'll have some brandy. How about you girls? Not for me. I pet. Oh, it's a magnificent night. There's going to be a full moon. Damn, dogs are all stirred up again. Jenny? Yes, Richard? Want to walk down with me and start making friends with them? Well, I'm a little tired tonight. I... I bet I'd make a better dog pal by daylight. Well, why don't you go ahead while I go up and get ready for bed? Well, you're the one they're calling for anyway. I've missed them. And it's nice to have been missed. Would you mind? I, I won't be over a half hour. I'll be waiting for you when you get back. I'll close the French windows. Don't forget to lock them, Lisa. No, no, leave them open. The breeze is wonderful. I'll see they get closed, Richie. I've been taking care of that for the last year. Take care of my bride, too, Lisa. Good night to you, Lisa. I'll see you later, Jenny. Well, a very sexy goodbye. <laughs> Your brother is a very sexy man. Why hadn't you noticed? Well, why should I be the only woman in the Northern Hemisphere to have it escape me? Oh, Lisa. It's what makes my blood run cold sometimes. That and April. She can scarcely run you much competition anymore. Because she's dead? She is? Well, not really. In so many ways, I'm I'm terribly naive growing up in Japan, knowing so little of my native country. I was always aware that Richard Morgan was a star. After all, he was in Japan to make a movie. And I knew he'd been married for many years to April Sanders. It, it was only after I'd married Richard and come back to America that I began to realize I'd married into royalty. Not only that, but I'd rushed blindly into marrying the king without seeing that the queen is not dead. Oh, Jenny, don't be silly. The queen is very dead. Not in most people's memories. How did it happen, Lisa? How could that vibrant, overwhelmingly wonderful woman have met her death? Want to take a little walk, Jenny? I could use some air. Which way do we go? Oh, towards the sea. There's enough moonlight to light the way. Are you cold? Lord, no. I welcome the breeze. Well, where are you taking me? To the end of the world. What? Well, where April ended hers. You wanted to know how it happened, didn't you? I think I've gone far enough, Lisa. Only a few steps. What? What is this path? I mean, somebody cut it out of solid rock. It's called the Seven Steps to Heaven. More like 70. Richard had them cut for April on their seventh anniversary. You'll see why now if we come out on the ledge. It's windier tonight than I thought. Most days it's calm up here. The sun pours down. You can lie out here on the ledge with the sea 400 feet below and drench in the sun as though you were the only person in the world. April treated this as a shrine. She was an inveterate sun worshiper. But it's sheer heaven, bathed in moonlight. If you look up, well, I, I can't see too much of the shadows looking down. The rocks are as jagged as teeth. 400 feet straight down. This is right where she fell. Red eagled on the rocks, broken and mangled, but speared by the sharp edges so even the restless sea couldn't wash her away. Oh, my God. How, how could she? 
she have gone close enough to fall? She didn't fall. But the paper that's that she... the story that was given out. Conchita believes that Richie claims he does. Others are not so sure. Come on, this place gives me the heebie-jeebies. Let's get back to the house before Richie sets those damn dogs loose. <laughs> Excuse me, I was just turning down the bed. Which I'm sure you're quite ready to roll into, Jenny. Good night, dear. Welcome home, such as it is. Good night, Lisa. See you whenever. Don't feel there's anything to get up for. Will there be anything else, madame? No, thanks, Conchita. Then I will say buenas noches, madame. Uh, wait a minute. See, si, madame. Madame is not a Spanish word. Why do you call me that? What would you have me call you? Uh, well, since I I am Richard's wife, shouldn't it be Senora? In this house, there was only one Senora. But she's dead. Jamás en el corazón. Never in the heart. For anyone who knew her. Buenas noches, Madame. Are you awake? Huh? It's her. It's, it's April. Oh, God. Stay away. Stay away. Richard, wake up. What? Help me. What's happening? Jenny, Jenny, what is it? shortly with Act Two. By the fresh light of a clear morning, with the wind stilled and the sunlight flooding all the dark corners, Bon Repos is a little more worthy of its name. But Richard Morgan is having a difficult time selling that to his still shaken bride. Let a little light in. You'll feel better, Jenny. Um, no, no, Richard. I, I'm still not over last night. Who was it? Darling, it wasn't anybody. You still say you didn't hear it, that awful sobbing. It was, it was nothing but the wind. Sometimes it sighs and moans all around the house, and you'd, you'd swear it was a human voice, but... But look, not a whisper this morning. Even the ocean's like glass. Today you'll understand why I love this house so much. Richard, come here. Beside me on the bed. All right, darling. I know you love Bon Rapport, but... But what? Richard, please, I... I don't want to live here. Why not? Darling, try to understand. I, 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 I don't feel I belong here. I know one and Conchita seem to resent me. Have they said anything? No, no not in so many words. It's just a feeling I get. I, I'm not wanted. That isn't true. Richard, don't you see? It's her house. It was her family's house to begin with. She's here still. She'll never leave it. She'll haunt me every minute I'm in it. Please take me away from here. All right. If that's what you want, I'll sell the damn place, tear it apart stone by stone. Richard! Oh. Oh, Jenny, my darling. Look, it's... It's just a time lag, the long flight from Japan. Days and nights turned upside down. 
I'm going to have Conchita bring us a breakfast up to the room. We'll, we'll have it out on the veranda. Give you a chance to get a good look at Juan's landscaping, all that riot of color, bougainvillea, poinsettia, camellia against the green. Maybe that'll change your mind about poor old Boropo. Darling, I know how much you love it, but... Oh, come on, Jenny. Give it a chance. A few more days, a week. Give it a chance to cast its own peculiar spell. All right, darling. Go get us some breakfast. I'll wash up and, and brush my teeth and get rid of some cobwebs while you're gone. Jenny. Yes? I love you, Mrs. Morgan. Mm -hmm. That's who I am, and I love you, my husband. Conchita. Si, patron. Come over here in the alcove. What the hell happened last night? I couldn't help it. She woke up, started to scream, and then to sob. You heard? No, House must have heard. Why didn't you stop her? I did as soon as I could. You know I don't want my wife to know about her being here. I know. Then keep her quiet. Got sedatives. That's your job. And I want my new wife made welcome. That is not my job. Then I'll find someone else for it. You would drive Juan and me from this house? We'll, uh... We'll talk about this later. For now, bring breakfast to the veranda for the senor and me. Si, senor. Where's my sister? In her room, I think. Muy bien. Come in. It's open. Richard. I didn't expect to see you this morning. Why not? <laughs> well, after all, brother mine, a new bridegroom. I'm an old bridegroom by now. Yes. Maybe she is a touch young for you. Damn you, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean what I said either. I was only teasing you. She's a lovely girl. She's sunny and free and unspoiled. And I want to keep her that way. What the devil am I going to do about her? Upstairs there. You heard her last night. Well, you know my feelings on the subject. Get rid of her. For good. I can't. After all, it's... It's partly her house. God, why won't she die? It would be a neat solution to it all, wouldn't it? But it seems she just won't. I'm afraid you're stuck with her as long as your conscience holds you back. Please, for God's sake, don't tell Jenny about her. Just how long do you think you can keep her secret? Oh, I don't know. All I need is a, a few days, a week. By then, one way or another, it won't matter. Are you going to start country hopping again, or are you going to stay home and make some nice, solid American movies? Uh, well, that depends on my negotiations for the next week or ten days. Jenny, you're not eating your steak. Want it on the fire a little more? No, thanks. I I, I really ate too much of that wonderful salad. I, I don't think I could eat another thing. Conchita? Si, senor. I think you can clear the table. You want dessert, dear? I don't think so. Lisa, please forgive me, but I'm so full of sand, sea, air, and... Scouting the property that I'm really bushed. Would you excuse me? Of course, Jenny. Get a good sleep. I'll see you upstairs, darling. Shall I have Conchita bring us some coffee? Oh, no, no. I just want to sleep and sleep and make up for the last few days. You don't have to come up. Try and keep me away. Good night, Lisa. Night. I'll see you tomorrow. I, I feel like such a party pooper. Lisa, forgive us. I'm bushed myself. Darling, you're, you're positively weaving. But I feel I, I feel a little high or low or something. I, well, here, how about my arm for support? I'd love it. No good? No, fine. I I was just... She was so lovely, Richard. Huh? Oh, oh. April, the, the fresco. That damn thing, I wish I'd never dreamed it up. I promise you it'll be removed or covered as something. Oh, no, darling. It's too, it's too lovely to destroy. Besides, no matter what you do or, or anyone tries to do, the memory of April Sanders in our time can never be wiped out or erased. It's it's something we both have to live with. Well, she was like Jean Harlow, Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor. She belonged to the public. But you had her painted to endure forever. <laughs> But I 
you sure the dog was poisoned? That's enough, yes, you two silencio. Uh, what was all that arguing about? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Trouble with one of the dogs. Come on, Jenny. Let's have some morning coffee and juice and get back to normal. Well, what's the matter with the dog? Here's your juice. Oh, it's uh, it's what I've been trying to steal myself to weed out. He's a maverick, or was. What do you mean? Well, some dogs take to training, some don't. This one, well, just never did. He's unpredictable, a a natural-born scavenger. He picked up something from the garbage with a botulism, I guess. Anyway, he died this morning. But what could a dog... Now, look, don't take on about it. I'm going down to bring up some eggs and bacon. Why don't you set the table for us on the veranda? Of course, darling. The steak. I didn't... Is that what poisoned him? Oh, God, help me to know what to do. I love my husband, but every instinct in me tells me to run. Run for my life. <laughs> Sure, J.B. No, I don't like it, but if it's the only way, I'll be there. Yes, yes, right away. No, no, I'll, I'll... I'll drive down. It's almost dark already, so I'm not taking much of a chance. What? Well, yes, thanks, yes. I'll stay with you overnight and come right back. You're going to Los Angeles? What? Oh, just overnight, darling. But take me with you. Oh, Jenny, I can't. This is... All strictly business. And I stay here alone? I'm not alone. Lisa's with you. Oh, thank God for that. You have nothing to worry about. Of course I haven't. Uh, go, do what you have to do and, and come back to me safe. And you stay safe for me to come back to. Well, wouldn't you know, the moment my brother cuts out, the local electricity has to fail... Here's your candle, Jenny. Want me to come in with you? No, I'm, I'm fine. Oh, there are plenty of others in the candelabra. They can burn all night. I won't need them. That good night drink we had has curdled my brain. <laughs> no, me too. No about you, but I'm sailing. Maybe there was something in Conchita's Aros Comporia, but I'm positively lightheaded. Well, whatever it was, thank God for small favors. I'll sleep sound tonight. If I can just find the bed. Whew, I'm really high for tight. And no reason for it. Whatever it is, don't let Conchita see me like this. <laughs> see me to bed, Lisa. No. No. They don't want me here. Someone. Something. But who? Conchita. under the covers, stands as still as the girl lies in the bed. Is her presence as malign as Jenny deems it to be, or as benign as it seems to be? Hush, child, hush. I mean you no harm. But you, 
How you must hate me. Her. April. His wife. Oh, no. No, I'm not April. April is dead. She died, you know. I thought I did. Then who... I'm her mother. April was my daughter. You live here? Yes. Up there. Then you're the one I heard the other night, sobbing. Was I? Perhaps I was. I'm very sad, you know. Because your daughter died. Because my daughter was killed. Killed? What did April have to die for? She had everything to live for. She'd, she'd never commit suicide. But, but, but it was an accident, wasn't it? Oh, April was as graceful as a fawn. She was a dancer, you know. She had an incredible sense of balance. She could never have lost it. Are you suggesting she, she was pushed? Oh, why do you think I'm locked up there in my room on the third floor? With Conchita as my jailer? The housekeeper. Oh, Conchita is a practical nurse. And I am a, a prisoner, half the time under sedation, living in limbo, the, the shut-in to end all shut-ins. But why? To keep me from crying into the skies. To keep the truth buried like, like me and my daughter. Except that I am on the third floor and April is six feet deep. Oh, he, he was jealous of her. He couldn't stand the fact that she was the talent. She held it all together. She made the oh. legends. And when the truth was coming out, that he meant nothing, that she was a star, oh, he had to drag her out of the skies, destroy her, kill her. Who? Oh. Your new husband, Richard Morgan. That's why I came to warn you. Oh, get out while you can. Senora, come your right. What is it he wants to take from you? Senora Morgan. Open the door. I'm coming, Juan. What do you want? Are you rich? Yes. Are you coming, senor? Then run like the wind. He will kill you. Just as he did April. Are you all right, Jenny? Are you all right? Uh, I'll do. The, the lights are on again. Yes. What happened... To, to April's mother. Juan has taken her back to her room. She's mad, you know. She's quite mad. She she accused Richard of killing April. It's her obsession. She should be institutionalized, but Richie... Well, he could never hurt a fly. But I don't understand why. Now what? Headlights coming up the drive. Must be Richie. I better go down and let him in. Don't be terrified of me, Jenny. Well, I, I don't mean to be. I, I, I don't know what's the matter with me. Well, look, April's mother must have shaken you. Well, why would you have kept it a secret? Look, I'm... I'm, I'm exhausted, and you, you're tired. Must we go through it tonight? I don't think we can go through any other night if we don't. Okay. It all has to do with... Well, living a legend. April was a... A star, a sex symbol developed by the studios. I was a stage actor with a gift of reasonable looks and an unusual voice. Separately, we had great success. But together, when we did get together, and particularly after our marriage, we became something not only wildly larger than life, but larger than even just plain stardom. Our own lives disappeared replaced by a storybook romance that our careers had to conform to. Despite the fact that we had learned, oh, well, not to hate each other, but that we had no love left. You didn't love April? Jenny, I couldn't stand her. She was selfish, avaricious, demanding, petty. An impossible woman. So you... So you got rid of her? You don't believe that? No. Oh, no, Richard. But, but how I... did April really die? I wasn't asking no, that. No, you I... don't have to. 
Half the world has speculated on that. Her mother thought I killed her. Still think so. Conchita and Juan know it was an accident. Lisa? Lisa has her own theory. Something to do with April's star complex and the wild winds that sometimes blow across the headlands. And you? I think she committed suicide. Buenos dias, Conchita. Buenos dias, senor. You can serve breakfast for all of us, and... Where's Juan? In the South Garden. Will you tell my wife when she comes down where I am? Si, senor. Patron? Yes? Will you close up the house? If I'm going to save my new marriage, I think I must. I'm not going to argue the facts. But it's quite clear that Jenny doesn't fit here. I'll have some juice and coffee, Conchita. Si, senorita. Oh, and for Senora Morgan, too. Si, senorita. Morning, Jenny. Good morning, Lisa. Oh, heavenly day. Breakfast is on the way. Where's Richard? Oh, off on the ground somewhere. Want to go look for him? I would like to get some air. Well, then let's go. Did you uh, finally get some sleep? Yes. Well, with the new day, if you're smart, you'll make up your mind to get out of here and have Richard all to yourself. But what will you and Conchita and Juan and Mrs... Isn't that terrible? I don't even know April's mother's name. Oh, what will all of you do? Oh, life goes on. We'll manage and adjust. We might even be able to do it here in time. Oh, no, Lisa. I never could. This isn't my place. It's April. It wasn't hers either. But I thought it was originally her family's. That's why her mother is still... It was a run-down, no-account mess. The stucco peeling, the plumbing, and the diluvian, the gardens, the shambles. Richie cured all that. He's marvelous with his hands. And his imagination knows no bounds. He made Borapo what it is. It's all his. I can appreciate that, Lisa, and I know how beautiful it is, but it's dark and sinister to me. Nothing will ever change that. I remember that first evening when you took me to Seventh Heaven. Yes, that was the mark of what was wrong here. Such free, wild beauty, but somehow it was evil and destructive. Oh, Jenny, that's not fair. You went by moonlight. You knew a tragedy had occurred there, but Seventh Heaven is just what its name implies. Especially on a day like today, with no wind and the sun riding high. Come on, let me show you. No, thanks. Jenny, you hold a lot of fates in your hand. Among them, mine. I don't want to leave here. Give me a chance to show you. Cobwebs cleared away. It's not such a bad place to live. Conchita? Si, senor. Where is the senorita? They went out in the garden, towards the water. They? Your sister and your wife. <laughs> Didn't they know breakfast was ready? I think... But the Senorita Morgan seemed to want to take the Senora to the water. I, I should not say this, but I have a, a, a sensation. You, you should go quickly after them. I really don't know why you insisted on me coming up here. I, I won't change my mind, Lisa. Even now, looking out here at that incredible view? I told you, I, I didn't like heights. You know, Jenny, you're a little person with no stature. Well, I wouldn't quite as Like leave. April, really, for all her cheap beauty. She just couldn't measure up. And I had to sit by and take the fact that she had cheated and stolen Richie away from me. What? My brother? Oh, does that shock you? I've loved Richie longer and deeper than all of you. How much have I gotten in return? Do you have any notion... How I hated that smug, superior, superadulated April. Would you be very surprised to find out that she didn't fall or stumble or take her life when she blew off here into eternity? She was hastened, Jenny. Pushed. Shoved by me. Just as you're going to be. 
Why? Either allowing for what you confess. How can you hate me? Because you are far worse than April. He really didn't love her. They were a team. He was trapped. He had to stick with her. But you... No, you're different. Because he loves me? Because with you, there's no chance for me. There's no chance at all. How could there ever be? I don't have to share his bed, only his life. I could have been the one to care for him, to console him, to love him. Love him, damn you. It'll never be you. Never anyone. Lisa, wait, wait. Do you even know? You can't stand against me any more than April could. You are going over, down the road. Look, put that glass break no, down. It's a marvelous weapon. Hang on to it if you want to. Take it with you, but you're going. Hey, you are oh, oh, oh. Yes, you lady, Mrs. Hurry. If I Hurry. cannot have you, nobody can. Oh, my God. Take me to what are you doing? No. Oh, oh, give me no, that. No, no, no. Oh, 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 my God. What can I say? Nothing. Nothing. But your sister. I love my sister either more or less than my first wife. I can't mourn either one of them. Jenny, it's too important to celebrate you. It'll take some time to straighten out my my affairs, but once we do. You and I are going to enjoy our private life. You'll still be public property. No. My new deal as a director. I'll never act again. Not even for me? For you. For you, I'll be whatever you desire. This affair is finally beginning. It will end only the same way. Finally. Which is forever. I love you forever. That's what I just said. The walls still stand about Mont Ripple, but the barbed wire and broken glass are gone from the parapet. The gates stand invitingly open, and the dogs are gone. In the bright sunshine, the dark memories, too, are fading. And the clean winds from the sea have washed away the cobwebs. Once again, the old house lives up to its name. I'll be back shortly. So again, we return full circle to our definition of the supernatural as it applies to tonight's tale, of or related to ghosts, behavior caused by the intervention or by the action of a god on earthly affairs. Well, April Sanders was both ghost and, by our modern standards, goddess. But her reign is over, and so is our up-to-date fable of Richard and Jenny. Our cast included Ruby Dee, Michael Wager, Terry Keene, Bryna Rayburn, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. W-D-A-F, Kansas City.
Dan Henry, WBAF Local News at 11. The outlook for Kansas City, a chance for thunder showers. Kansas City, Missouri police have one suspect in custody in connection with a shooting on the street at 33rd and Troost. Two women were injured. They have been identified as 30-year-old Joan Oglesby of 2139 East 15th in Kansas City and general hospitalists her condition as critical with gunshot wounds in the chest and stomach. The other is identified as K. Sue Hammond of 5814 Olive in Kansas City. Hospital authorities say she is in fair condition with gunshot wounds in the pelvic area and right leg. The identity of the suspect in custody in connection with the incident is not known. Police are still investigating. A class action suit against the Kansas City, Missouri Board of Education and the Kansas City Teachers Union has been filed on the docket of U.S. District Court Judge Elmo Hunter. The suit was filed on behalf of his sons by the father of two boys who attend Southwest High School, asking the judge to order schools opened and teachers to halt the strike. A hearing was set for April 25th. Norman Hudson, president of the Kansas City Teachers Union, sits in jail tonight his first in a 10-day contempt of court sentence, and all negotiations between teachers and the board are being handled by a federal mediator. In Kansas City, Kansas, teacher talks are to resume immediately, according to Superintendent of Schools Dr. O.L. Plucker, but negotiations between the NEA, representing Shawnee Mission teachers, and that district school board appear to have been stalemated, with teachers apparently demanding more than the 10.5% increase reportedly offered by the board. WDAF News Time, 11 o'clock. News of the hour on the hour from American Information Radio. This is Richard Wall from Los Angeles, and at this hour, some black police officers in San Francisco have joined the protest against the stop and search policy in the Operation Zebra hunt for the killer of 12 whites. A member of the group, Officer Jesse Bird, announced... We are just as much concerned about the apprehension of this individual or individuals as anyone else. But we do not approve of the Gestapo-type tactics that are being used. Right on. We do not approve... We do not approve of people being stopped and frisked at random. We can only view this as another type of harassment. Officer Bird's objection came as five black civic leaders filed a class action suit saying the tactics of searching blacks who match the zebra killer's description in San Francisco are unconstitutional. A Statue of Liberty takeover. That story coming up. children in the United States who should be running, laughing, and playing are coughing, wheezing, and choking. Six million boys and girls are suffering from serious lung-damaging diseases. The National Cystic Fibrosis Research Foundation needs your help to help them. In the breath of a child lies the hope of a land. A group calling itself the Attica Brigade has taken over the Statue of Liberty in New York and promises to stay the weekend, demanding impeachment of President Nixon and protesting what's called social injustice in the U.S. President Nixon is spending the night at Camp David in Maryland. Earlier, the president went for a dinner cruise aboard the yacht Sequoia on the Potomac and then stopped by the home of his daughter, Julie Eisenhower, in Bethesda, Maryland. Mark Felt, former associate director of the FBI, says the White House asked him to issue news releases on Watergate that he considered improper for the FBI to be involved in. Felt ran the FBI after J. Edgar Hoover's death. The defense has rested its case in the perjury conspiracy trial of John Mitchell and Maurice Stans in New York. The prosecution will present rebuttal witnesses Monday. Israel and Syria disagree on losses in the first major air battles in the Mideast since the October War. But there's a warning about the consequences of the increasing escalation of the Golan Heights fighting. Correspondent Andrew Mizell's reports from Tel Aviv. Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Dayan warned today that if the Syrians continue escalating the battle around Mount Hermon, Henry Kissinger might arrive here in 10 days to find a full-scale war in progress. Dayan issued the warning in a television interview, which I watched here in Tel Aviv. It came on the eve of the heaviest day of fighting yet, a day in which Israel reported its first battle losses in the air 
two warplanes shot down by ground fire. Fayyad said that if Syria continued trying to capture territory, Israel would feel free to do the same. Andrew Mizell's ABC News, Tel Aviv. Japan has signed an agreement with China for mutual airline service. The nationalist Chinese on Taiwan have threatened to end their aviation agreement with Japan because of the arrangement between Tokyo and Peking. Government economist Gary Sievers says inflation will remain a serious problem in the U.S. Sievers' remark followed release of figures showing the cost of living rose 1.1% in March, raising the 12-month increase in consumer prices to 10.2%. The Chicago Tribune has an announcement of interest to nostalgia buffs. The Tribune says it will bring back the original Orphan Annie cartoon strip starting Monday. The first episode will show Annie and her dog Sandy in 1936. This is Information Radio News. From the Kurt Murr Sports Desk, the Kansas City Royals play the Chicago White Sox two more games in this series tomorrow and Sunday, then move to Boston. A temporary restraining order has been issued against the Cincinnati Bengals linebacker Bill Berge and the World Football League that keeps all WFL owners from negotiating with any member of the Cincinnati squad. Peter Oosterhaus holds the lead in the Monsanto Open Golf Tournament with a 36-hole total of 133, and the KU relays will be wrapped up tomorrow. Kansas City's forecast partly cloudy and mild with a chance for showers or thunder showers through tomorrow. After an overnight low around 60, the high tomorrow will be in the upper 70s. Dan Henry, WDAF News. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of your own terrifying imagination. The art of the double cross, unfortunately, has become part of the fabric of our lives. In espionage, however, it is almost a lifestyle. In the world of spies, for the left hand ever to know what the right is doing is unthinkable. For the next hour, imagine that you are Larry Fielding, a 32-year-old newspaper man caught in a dizzying web of circumstances seemingly beyond his control. Larry, please change your mind and come with me. Not until you tell me who you are and why you sneaked into my hotel room. You're a fool, Larry. You must know that the police are looking for you and they'll be here any minute. Oh, well, you're here now. And I still want to know who you are. If that's so important, my name is Carol Johnson. And when I tell you I know all about the murder of Dave Wilson, maybe you'll believe that I'm here to help you. Our mystery drama, The Lady Was a Tiger, written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett, stars William Redfield. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hi, I'm Goldilocks, Ms. Goldilocks, if you please, and I'm a professional taste tester here at my taste test laboratory, that's TTL for short, <laughs> I taste test Everything from porridge to diet drinks. Actually, there's not that much taste testing in porridge these days. There used to be once upon a time. I mean, that's how this Miz got into the biz. <laughs> but lately, it's been diet drinks. I mean, with so many diet drinks going sugar-free, I've been really busy conducting taste tests. A rather unbearable assignment, to be sure. But then I discovered sugar-free diet 7-Up. Fresh, natural, delicious. My only problem is that sugar-free diet 7-Up tastes so good that it broke my Goldilocks diet drink taste meter Well, sugar-free diet 7-Up certainly has my seal of approval. This one's just right. Don't let anyone con you into thinking it's wrong to turn in a heroin pusher. You're not ratting. You're doing your part to wipe out one of the most insidious epidemics racking our country today. 
So don't let anyone kid you. If you really care about the quality of life, if you really care about improving society, you'll do everything you can to get the heroin pusher off the street and into jail where he belongs. If you have information about a drug pusher, use the heroin hotline. The number is 800-368-5363. That's toll free from anywhere in the country. The number again is 800-368-5363. A trained operator will answer your call, take your information, and pass it on to experienced federal agents who will investigate. You'll make your own special contribution toward helping us wipe out what President Nixon has called public enemy number one. Call 800-368-5363. Walking is great exercise. And with good weather can also be great fun. But not when you've just been fired by the editor of the newspaper for which you've worked happily for five years. Larry Fielding has been walking aimlessly for two hours, trying to figure out why Horace Finley, the editor and his boss, had refused to give him any reason for his dismissal. Tormented by his frustrating thoughts and tired, Larry sits down on a park bench to think. He is so deep in thought, he is unaware of three men who suddenly surround him. Larry has only to look at them to know that he is in trouble. He tries to get up, but is pushed back down, and the men start to beat him up. No, no, take, take my money and leave me alone, will you? Look, if, if you want money, I, I told you, you, you can have it. Help! Help! Calling for help when you're being mugged in a big city park is sometimes as helpful as trying to catch hold of a windowsill in a 30-story fall. But this time, there was a miracle. A stranger has seen the attack and rushes to help. Hang in there, you man! Here comes... That's a nice story you have there, fella! You need a lesson in chicken! Oh, that took care of them. Uh, They're gone. Oh, thanks. Uh, let me help you up. Thanks. Thanks, mister. Thanks a lot, I tell you. I was in real trouble. My pleasure. Did they get your wallet? No, I... No, no, no. I got a lot of bruises, but they didn't get a thing. Say, you're a pretty good scrapper for a... For a guy my age. Well, yeah, yeah. Hey, what are you, a karate expert? Oh, I just keep myself in shape. <laughs> you sure do. Listen, can I do something for you to show you I really meant thanks? You certainly can. How about coffee? Oh, sure, sure, but, but that's nothing. What, what I meant was... Uh, I, I mean... know what you meant. My name's Dave Wilson. Oh, good. I'm, uh, I'm Larry Fielding. Oh, come on, Larry. Let's have a cup of coffee. I still can't get over the way you tore into those guys. I was a commando in World War II. World War II? <laughs> Did you think I was in the Civil War? No, no, I didn't mean that. It's just... Well, to a young fellow like you, World War II might as well have been in the last century. It was only 30-some-odd years ago, you know. Oh, I know, I know. After all, I was in the newspaper business. Yeah, yeah, that's tough what you told me about losing your job. What are you going to do? Oh, I don't know. Look around for another one. What bothers me is the way my editor let me go. No explanations. You know, we were friends. You'd think he'd at least tell me why he fired me. Those things happen. Ah. Stop torturing yourself and begin making plans. No, not until I get this thing straightened out in my own mind. I think I'll call my editor at home tonight and... Uh... I've got a better idea. <laughs> go out and get drunk, huh? Nope. How about a trip to Paris? <laughs> are you putting me on? I'm serious. Well, what are you... A scout for contestants for some kind of TV quiz show? <laughs> no. I am a man sitting on a couple of hundred thousand dollars. What? And I need a guy just like you. Now, look. Look, I'm a newspaper man. 
Anytime a stranger starts talking about a trip to Paris and a couple of hundred thousand dollars, I, uh... Walk away without even listening? Yeah. Even if the man just happened to maybe save you from being mugged, robbed, and beaten up? Okay. All right. I'll listen. But believe me, that'll be it. Fair enough. First, here's my card. Oh. Uh, David Wilson Calridge Imports. I never heard of him. You can call and check me out. I told you I was in World War II. Oh, look... I'm grateful to you, but you're wasting your time. Why don't you shut up and listen? You've probably heard about the millions of dollars in artworks and precious jewels that the G.I.s liberated during the last days of the war. Liberated, sure, yeah. Well, I've heard stories. Well, most of them are true. One that I know in particular certainly is. Did you ever hear of the Lancer collection? Lancer, Lancer. The Comte de Lancer came from an old French family... And the Lancer collection is a fabulous assortment of diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and other precious stones which were seized by the Nazis when they swept through France in 1940. A pal of mine, not a commando, happened to come upon the collection when the Americans were driving the Germans back in 44. Wait wait a minute, wait a minute. And he liberated it? Exactly. He and a distinguished Frenchman named Henri Thiel. Professor... Henri Thiel? The archaeologist? That's the man. Oh, come on. He wouldn't... uh... You were saying something? No, nothing. You were about to say he wouldn't get involved in anything crooked, weren't you? Yeah, something like that. You're right, he wouldn't. But he was younger. The world was quite different then. And my G.I. pal was a most persuasive guy. They decided to bury the Lancer collection. They did. They drew a map. And today, Professor Teal is the only possessor of that map. Uh Uh-huh. And, uh, what happened to your nameless friend? He's dead. Professor Teal wants to return to Jules. (laughs) But that's easy, isn't it? Not if the professor doesn't want embarrassing questions asked about how he came by that map in the first place. Oh. What about you? Calridge Imports is a highly respected and reputable importing firm. I want to keep it that way. Oh, so do I, even though I've just been fired. You haven't heard what I'm asking you to do. Well, what? Come with me to Paris. You're writing a story on Professor Teal. He's good material. You'll grant me that? Yes, yes. You'll interview him, naturally. During the course of that interview, he'll give you a slip of paper, which is a map, Showing the location of the jewels. You'll later deliver it to me. And that's all you have to do. You, um, mentioned something about sitting on hundreds of thousands of dollars? That's right. The Lancer collection is worth that and more. I'm sitting on it. I intend to return the jewels and collect a reward. If you want to share in that, you deserve it. Mrs. Wilson, the report is positive. Fielding has agreed to go to Paris with me. He bought the story about picking up a map showing the location of the Lancer collection. Operation successful. You'd better be on your way, Larry. You're due at Professor Teal's in ten minutes. I suppose it's uh, too late to back out, huh? You can always back out, Larry, but I don't think you will. There's really nothing to it. Make it look like a normal interview. Take notes. The professor will give you the map. Slip it in with your notes. Bring it back to me here. I'll be waiting. Hmm. Okay. Larry. Yes? Relax. Oh, sure thing. I'll see you. Would monsieur mind if I join him? I wouldn't mind at all, but I don't think I'm what you're looking for. Oh, but monsieur is exactly what I seek. Exactly. And just what is it you're seeking? To warn you that you are in grave danger. Why don't you come off it with that phony accent? If you've got something to say to me, say it. Would monsieur buy me a Pernod? Sure. Garçon, Pernod, please. Monsieur, it is very difficult for me. I do play a role, as you have guessed. And I am not here by chance. You must leave, and quickly. Uh, Your Pernod, monsieur. Not for me, it's for the lady. And uh, for you, 
I have a knife. Hello. Go, mademoiselle. Go. But he's going to die. Do as I say. There'll be no problem. Simply put his head down gently on the table. So. And people will see another drunken tourist. Your name is Larry Fielding. You're 28 years old. And you're feeling marvelous. You have just completed a fascinating interview with Professor Henry Teal. And you have the paper that you're going to hand over to your friend who's waiting at Les Deux Magots. You see him at the table where you left him. His head is down, but you're not concerned. Dave! Dave, wake up! I saw the professor... What? Monsieur, what has happened? Well, I don't know. I, I came back to meet my friend. He, I, I guess he's passed uh, out. A moment, monsieur. Look. This man has been murdered. What? Stabbed to death. You will wait here for the police. I will. I, I will not. I'm getting out of here. Who is there? It is I. Open up. What's the matter? What happened? The other American. The young one. He got away. You let him go? He panicked. Ran. Now what? He'll probably go back to his room at the Dauphine. You'll check. But aren't the police looking for him? I hope so. I gave them a complete description. And what do I say to them if they find me in his room? Come, a beautiful young lady like yourself. Get to him and find out where the paper is. Get out of here. Not until you tell me who you are. If that matters, my name is Carol Johnson. I've been sent here to help you. Oh, sure. I know about the murder of your friend. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Sent by whom? I'll answer your questions while we're on the way. On the way to where? Safety. I don't need to run. I didn't kill anybody. I'm not about to take off with a strange girl, particularly not one who's equipped with skeleton keys. Oh, suit yourself. Goodbye. Come in. Monsieur de Rancidine. Yes? Inspector Victor Rouvre. Surete. Oh. You will please come with me. Uh, what for? Suspicion of murder of another American? Monsieur David Wilson. Hey, Inspector, listen. Why would I kill Dave? I've already told you I had an appointment to meet Dave at the cafe. He was waiting for me. Would I have walked up to a man I just killed and shake him so that he'd fall down and make a big scene? That is your explanation. There is nothing to support it. Yes, well, there's nothing against it either. There is the word of Louis Gore. Louis Gore? Who's he? The waiter who attended the table at which Monsieur Wilson and you sat. <sighs> the only reason that you are not, as of this moment, charged with murder... Is because you did return. That much the waiter's testimony supports. Only he says that Monsieur Wilson might very well have been dead shortly after you returned. And that you had time to kill him. That's a lie. So you say. Oh, just check with Professor Teal. He'll tell you what time I arrived, what time I left. We have been trying. And there has been no answer. Ah, we may have him on the telephone now. Hello? Eh? Ah? So? Very bien. Merci. All right, well, what did he say? That was not Professor Teal. That was his apartment. And his servant. His servant? Th there was nobody there when I saw him. Don't you mean if you saw him, monsieur? Oh. According to the servant, Professor Teal left for an extended holiday early this morning... And it is not known when he is expected back. Your name is Larry Fielding. You're 32 years old. And you find yourself in prison in Paris. Accused of murder. 
You know you've been had, and you're dealing with forces that seem beyond your control. You have a million questions, and the only man who could answer them is the man you're accused of killing. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. When you drink beer, do you tilt the glass for long, hearty swallows? Or just tip it and sip it? Well, sipping's the thing for wine. But Budweiser beer is a hearty drink, brewed for zest and character. The best way to enjoy Bud is to drink it. Not chug a lug, just man-sized beer drinker swallows. That's when that famous Budweiser taste, smoothness, and drinkability really come through. Smoothness and drinkability that come only from natural carbonation and exclusive beechwood aging. Smoothness and drinkability too good for any half-hearted sipping. So drink up. You'll see that brewing beer right does make a difference. And that when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. In 1919, someone had a big idea. Let's help youth understand big business by starting them in small businesses of their own. And Junior Achievement was born. Each group elected a board of directors, chose a product, set up a production line, sold stock, and went into business. That year, 314 students made and sold products and learned the business of business. Today, Junior Achievement has grown to nearly 200,000 members. Junior Achievers are designing and marketing their own products and services, from cutting boards to printing. They're organizing sales efforts, writing marketing plans, calculating profit and loss. Running these small businesses helps Junior Achievers understand how big business works. Support Junior Achievement, where youth learns the business of business. Call your local Junior Achievement office. Americans, Paris means visits to the Louvre, strolls along the Seine, or fine food. But to Larry Fielding, it means the inside of a prison cell, where he sits accused of a murder he didn't commit. Fielding knows he's been caught up in something that involves more than the recovery of some stolen jewels. However, what he doesn't realize is that he's the key pawn in a deadly game. And the players are about to make some moves. Oh. I don't think it's smart to have me come here so often. I would not have sent for you if it were not necessary. Do you still believe that Fielding knows nothing about the operation? I do. Then where's the document? Well, we don't know he ever had it, do we? We know he visited Teal. We know that Wilson waited for him at Le Dubago. We know he came back there. I think it is safe to assume that he was carrying the plans. And he didn't have it on him when he was arrested. Roger arranged to be there when Fielding was brought in and searched. He says there was nothing on him. But he wasn't picked up right away. Exactly. He eventually went back to his hotel room, as you know. I believe he has the paper and that he has somehow managed to hide it. Oh. It does us no good in prison. We shall have to arrange to have him released. And how do we do that? We don't. You do. Sit down, mademoiselle. Your passport says Carol Johnson. That's right, Inspector. And I am told you are in my office because of the... unfortunate incident in the Café Le de Magot. Yes, Inspector. I... I just had to come here to tell you, you've, you have the wrong man. Ah? Huh? And how do you know that? I'm studying at the Sorbonne. I visit Les de Margaux all the time. I was sitting right there when that man was murdered. Formidable. You saw a man murdered and you did nothing. Oh, at the time I didn't know it was a murder. I just thought the man had too much to drink or was ill. 
But the reason I know that you've arrested the wrong man is that the murdered man was dead before this young American Fields or... or uh, Fielding. Yes, well, the man was dead before Fielding ever got to the table. Fielding came and shook him. And that was when it was discovered that he was dead. I'm prepared to swear to that, Inspector. Of course you are prepared to swear to this uh, story that you have just told me. Why not? It's the truth. Of course, mademoiselle. Why would a beautiful young lady like yourself lie to an inspector of the Surete? I'm not sure that I like the way you say that, Inspector. But everything will be all right if you release young Fielding. You have told me you will swear to this statement of yours in court. Therefore, I have very little choice. Ah, oh, good. But, mademoiselle... I have been a police officer for 20 years, long enough to know that witnesses who appear late with an alibi for an accused murderer often have reason. Oh, that's ridiculous. And I also wish to warn you, mademoiselle, that the Surati considers this a very much open case. <laughs> that is the business of the Surati. Au revoir, Inspector. Gérard, you will follow the young lady who just left my office and do not lose her. Hello there. Oh, it's you. <laughs> Want to give me a lift? Well, I suppose I owe you something for getting me out of jail. Taxi! Taxi! Uh, yeah, yeah, we got one. Uh, yes. Hop in. Oh, thanks. Uh, driver? Hotel Dauphine. Well, you look pretty good for a jailbird. You look pretty good yourself for... Come to think of it, what are you? An American girl in Paris trying to make a living. What are you? An American in Paris in need of a bath, a drink, and some food. You know, you're not bad looking. Oh, thanks. While we seem to be exchanging compliments... Can I say you're about the best-looking girl I've seen since I've been here? <laughs> Thank you. Now that we like each other so much, don't you think it's time we started telling each other the truth? Mm, yes, I'll buy that. Uh, Écoutez-moi, uh, operator. Uh, well, never... You speaking? Okay. Well, look, I phoned the desk about an hour ago to get this room straightened up, and so far nothing's happened. Now, can you please just send someone up so I can sleep here tonight? Huh? Oh, while you're at it, where's our food? Uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. That's a different department. Oh. I'll have to call room service again. Oh. Maybe you won't have to bother. Oh. Uh, entree. You do know, monsieur. Madame. Uh, merci. Monsieur would like me to sell. No, no, thanks. No, I think I can handle it myself. As monsieur wishes. Uh, wait a minute. Don't I know you? I think not, monsieur. Now, wait, I've seen you before. I'm sure I've seen you. Uh, Barry is a large city, monsieur. One passes people on the streets. And... This is the streets. The streets, that's it. You're the same guy who was at the Café Les Deux Magots. Monsieur is mistaken. What? Hey, wait a minute. Come back here. I want to talk to you. Oh, now, don't go chasing him down the hall. Why not? Listen, Carol, I'm positive he's the same waiter... You just deny it and you can't prove it. But... Even if you could, what do you think it means? Well, it means... It means... Well, I don't know. But if I get, get, get him to talk, maybe I'd find out something. I thought you were going to clue me in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Listen... Have you ever heard of the Lancer collection? Of course. It's in the Louvre. Oh. The family of Comte de Lancer gave it to the museum after it was recovered when the Nazis fled Paris. What? Well, why does that shake you up so much? Because it can't be true. <laughs> Come with me to the Louvre and I'll show it to you. Well, that changes everything. Come on. Where are we going? To the American consul. Well? Unbelievable. What? Simply unbelievable. Do you know what the consul told me? Ah, oh, I predicted it, didn't I? Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to hear about it at all. Just advised me to look up the whole thing and leave France. Incredible. Well, not really when you understand that he doesn't know what you're talking about. 
But you do. Some of it. Okay, take me back to the hotel. Any reason? I'm taking the consul's advice. If nobody's interested, I'll go back to the States. Well, now that they've cleaned up the room so nicely, you're leaving. Well, do you have a better idea? More than one. Uh, I think I'll take them one at a time. <laughs> Number one. Give me the paper Professor Teal gave you. Well, it looks like we're finally going to level. Where is it? Well, first you tell me something. What is it? I don't know. End of conversation. Larry, listen to me. I work for Colonel Blake, military intelligence. I was assigned to this operation. What operation? All I was told was that Dave Wilson, who also works for us, was coming over here with you and that you were to get something from Professor Teal and give it to Dave. Teal worked with you, too? He did. But now his cover is blown and I don't know where he is. Who killed Wilson? I don't know. It could have been any one of three or four foreign powers. And the only reason I'm alive is because somebody wants the paper. That's right. And if I give it to you, then there's really no reason not to kill me. Oh, give it to me. I'll get it to Colonel Blake and we'll get you safely out of the country. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on. I got a better idea. I'll go with you to Colonel Blake and we'll give it to him together. No, that would be too dangerous. To whom? Will you please trust me? Give me a reason. Please, where is the paper? I... I burned it. You expect me to believe that? Why not? You expect me to believe everything you tell me? You admit you had the paper. And somehow, between the time you ran from Les Deux Magots, you managed to hide it in a place where experts have been unable to find it. I told you I burned it. And you know that's a fairy tale that no one will believe. I don't care whether you believe it or not. Now, are you coming with me? Where? To talk to your Colonel Blake. He won't see you. Oh, 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 I think he will. Goodbye, Carol. It was nice knowing you. I think... You will kindly step back into your room, Monsieur Feeling. Now, wait a minute. Move. Let me introduce myself. I am Major Simonovich. Oh. Of the gay pay you or the NKVD? It does not really matter. What matters is that you and I have something to discuss. I warned you. Yeah, sure you did. Just like a rattlesnake does. I do so dislike dealing with amateurs. This is strictly a business. You mean you want to make a deal with me? Correction. I mean you would find it wise if you wanted to make a deal with us. For the paper? Exactly. Where is it? No, no, not so fast. Not so fast. You spoke about a deal? You give us the paper, we give you your life. You must really believe I'm an idiot. You people murdered Wilson. That paper is the only thing that's keeping me alive. I have my word. No deal. Do you really believe you have a choice? Carol, call Rojansky. Make the usual arrangements. We will wait here. Donnez-moi 8036, s'il vous plaît. C'est ça. Merci. Carol. Yes. Tell me something. Um, will I like Rojansky? By this time, Larry Fielding realizes that he's been used. That he was never supposed to bring Dave Wilson a paper telling the location of the Lancer jewel collection. But his discoveries have only added to his dilemma. He was quick-witted enough to realize that his only hope was to hide the paper. Because that slip of paper is his last resort. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. Great taste in the morning, Kellogg's, Kellogg's has that awesome taste to get you up and grinning. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. We've been having some fun in our television and radio commercials by using a ball and chain to symbolize the slight overweight problem common to so many of us. We point out that being a few pounds overweight is just a little more difficult for you. Climbing stairs, just walking around, even sitting down can feel, well, like you're wearing a ball and chain. In case you missed the message, it's this. If you really want to get rid of that extra weight, you really have to work at it by exercising and with sensible meals like the Special K Breakfast. A one-ounce bowl of Special K, America's favorite high-protein cereal, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee, less than 240 calories, nutritious, and by the way, delicious. So why not begin each day with a Special K breakfast and then keep up the good work? Special K can't help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. Hi. 
I'm Hal Linden. There's a lot of talk these days about America's energy crisis. Talk about doing without heat, about doing without our cars, about what's going to happen if we run out of fuel. Well, we may not have to run out of fuel if we all work together to conserve the fuel we have. That means turning your thermostats down to 68 degrees during the day and turning them down to 60 at night. It means turning off lights, TV sets, and electrical appliances the minute we're finished with them. It means driving no faster than 50, starting or joining carpools, avoiding the kind of stop-and-go motoring that eats up gas by the gallon. In short, it means saving every ounce of energy we can, every chance we get. So please, do your part to make the fuel supply stretch a little further. For your own sake, don't be selfish. Don't be foolish. Don't be fuelish. This message from the Federal Energy Office and the Advertising Council. Newspaper man Larry Fielding sits waiting in his Paris hotel room, closely guarded by three members of the Russian secret police and the beautiful American girl, Carol Johnson. They are waiting for a man named Rosansky, who might very well be, for all Fielding knows, his executioner. You know we mean to obtain the paper. Rosansky is a doctor and a chemist. He'll be here shortly. You will be put to sleep painlessly. You'll be taken from here in an ambulance to a safe place. And there you will be injected with sodium pentothal, Fielding. You will tell us. Look, I don't suppose you'll tell me what's so important about this piece of paper? You have heard of the SAM-6 missiles. The surface-to-air weapons with deadly accuracy that we have developed and which were used so successfully in minor wars in Asia and the Middle East? Yes, yes, I've heard of them. Good. We learned that someone whose identity we still seek has invented a jamming device which would render this M6 almost worthless. Ah. We don't believe that any such system can be invented, but we do not take chances. We have reason to believe that the piece of paper that you carried away from Professor Teal's has the information for building such a device. Ah, that will be Rojansky. Carol, admit him. Of course. Come in, Doctor. This is the patient. Now, look, I really don't think this the is necessary. It will be easier if you don't force, young man. I don't intend to make... Hold it. it. Get now, his arm. Get. Hold it still. Good. You brought a stretcher. Of course. There. You'll be under in a moment, so we can leave. <laughs> It has nothing to do with us. We are taking a sick man to the hospital. Put this stretcher into the ambulance. Quickly. I must apologize, but we received a report from the hotel concierge that there was a dead man here. Absurd, Inspector. This is Dr. Jansky. The doctor will explain this to you, Inspector. This man became suddenly quite ill. I gave him a sedative to quiet him, and we're not taking him to the Lefebvre nursing home. As you can see by the ambulance. You say he is alive? Very much so. See for yourself. Huh. Mon Dieu. I know this man. Well, Inspector, he must receive medical attention. Of course, of course. But uh, I suggest that instead of taking him to the nursing home, he go instead to the police hospital. Well, that's ridiculous. He's my patient. I am afraid I must insist. This young man has most recently been released from jail where we were holding him on a charge of murder. If he has been released, then released, why... Released, yes. But he has not been completely cleared, so... Laurent, Pigon, take this man to the police hospital. Did you get a report? Yes. And? He'll be conscious in an hour. And he will talk? I'm sure of that. He will scream to see Colonel Blake... And then your cover is blown, and the whole operation goes fully. What do we do? Silence him. But what about the papers? Oh, we will be faulted for that, of course. But if we do not have it, neither do the Americans. Who do we have in the police hospital? Only Leclerc. A weakling. 
But he can admit Rozhansky. Rozhansky's a doctor. He doesn't need Leclerc to admit him. He can visit his patient openly. Thank you, my dear. I visit Fielding and he dies shortly thereafter. That idea does not appeal to me. We have to do something. You are both right. Carol, you will be his first visitor when he regains consciousness. No. Yes, Carol. Rozhansky. Give her your hypodermic kit. I don't have to do this, and I won't. You would prefer that in my report I mention your failure with Fielding when you had some hours alone with him? I'll go. That is wise. Rajansky, give her the syringe. Here. Yeah. Quickly. The car is waiting. And, Carol, if you should decide or even think about changing sides, it would be most unwise... You know the French police are still most interested in the person who murdered Wilson. You awake now, Larry? Oh, I... Oh, no. Wake up and listen to me, Larry. What? You've got to listen. I... Try to understand me. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What kind of a place is this? You're safe. It's a police hospital. Yeah, but how did you get in here? Where's, uh, what's, uh, Rodzanski? Look, I can understand how you feel and why you don't trust me, but the truth really is that I am a double agent. Oh. Do you understand what a double agent is? As near as I can figure out, a double agent is somebody working for do two different sides. Yes. And neither side trusts them. Oh. You know, that fits you to a T. You might just be telling the truth. I am. I really work for Colonel Blake, as I told you. The Russians know it. They think I've infiltrated the U.S. military intelligence. But in Yes, fact, yes, I know. You've really done just the opposite. Yes. Worked your way into the Russian apparatus. Exactly. Oh, Larry, how can I make you believe me? You can. Listen, you were deliberately recruited. Oh. The reason you lost your job was because we got in touch with your boss. He agreed to go along. The men who jumped you were part of the setup so that Wilson could save you. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. But that, that doesn't prove a thing. You could have learned all that working for Blake and still be with the other side. And Oh. And, and, and wait, now, speaking of Wilson, how about getting him killed? I tried to warn him, but there wasn't enough time. It was either go along with that or blow my cover and endanger the whole operation. And when I wanted to give the plans to Blake, you objected. Same problem if I went with you to Blake or you went to him after we had talked. My cover was blown. All right. Now, and suppose I had given you the plans. How would that have changed the situation? We would have had a phony copy that I would have delivered to Igor and everything would have been fine. Hmm. And there's still time for me to do that. If you will just believe me and tell me where the plans are. I'd like to believe you. I really, I really would. Please, where are they, Larry? Get me to Blake. It's too dangerous. Look, you see this? Yeah, it's a hypodermic. It's death. Igor sent me here with this to kill you. Now, do you believe me? Wait, wait a minute. If you don't kill me, and I guess you don't intend to, what will Igor and his friends think? Isn't your cover blown then anyway? Could be, but if I come back with the plans and say that I got them out of you without having to kill you, there's a chance they'll believe me. Aha. Uh -huh. Well? I'm thinking. Who are you? One of the hospital guards, monsieur. Oh, Mademoiselle, you have been here some time. How is the patient? Guard. Yes, monsieur? Call Colonel Blake at U.S. Military Intelligence. Tell him I've got to see him right away on a matter of the utmost urgency. Colonel Blake? Colonel Blake. I will inform my superior. Now, you don't have to inform anyone. Just call him. Yes, monsieur. The major will be disappointed. You have not followed instructions. You are a fool. I would have had the information if you hadn't come in when you did. I know what you were ordered to do. What? What's this? A moment of truth, I'm afraid, Larry. Oh, I know how highly the Major regards you, Mademoiselle. But I also know what he thinks of me. Tonight will change that. Give me that syringe. Here, right in your arms. Oh, oh you... You traitor. I... 
I knew. Carol, you... <gasps> you were telling me the truth. Yes. Yes, I was. And I had to kill him. To make you see it. Where is the paper, please? In my hotel room. Oh, aren't you ever going to stop playing games? You know your room was searched. Let me get dressed and I'll show you. If it's not here, there's going to be the devil to pay. Don't worry, it's here. Now I'm the one who has to be shown. Trained operatives from two special branches went over this room with everything except Geiger counters. Okay, okay. Where are we going? The bathroom. That was searched, too. Oh, oh I don't doubt it. Oh, we went through that cabinet. Did you now? What do you see? Towels, paper tissues, some of your toilet articles. We took your razor apart. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And what else? A roll of toilet tissue. Unopened. And as the French say, mademoiselle, voila. Oh. And now we unroll this toilet tissue and keep unrolling oh. it and... Oh, my God. Where did you learn to open a package and reseal it like that? <laughs> when I was a kid, I was the best clerk in Roscoe's shipping department. Oh. Thanks. It was nice knowing you. I really mean that, Larry. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Surely I've earned the right to buy you dinner. I'd like to. Well, you'd better or I'll start doing some talking. Blackmail? You said it. <laughs> All right. I'll meet you at Les Deux Magots at 10.30. No way. Let's try the right bank, La Rotonde. That's a date. I'll see you. You better be there. <laughs> Shirts, uh, ties, yes, I, I think that's everything. Uh, come. Oh, it's, it's you, Rojansky. Are you coming with me? I am staying. Then we shall say goodbye. I do not have much time. The plane from Moscow leaves it. I do not think you'll be taking the plane. Are you insane? You know I've been recalled. Not precisely. What do you mean, not precisely? Moscow feels you have bungled badly. So, it's not the first time that an operation has been... First, you were duped by the American girl. You know she was a double agent? I know now. Did you know before she killed Leclerc? I was not in charge at that time. At that time? Now there are two murders that cannot be hushed up. The French police must have a murderer to satisfy the public. Then give them Carol. She... I only wish that we could. They want you. You have been chosen to be the murderer. I am replacing you as the head of this section. Ridiculous. I won't remain quiet. I have a lot I could and will say to the authorities if Moscow abandons me. Now you listen to me, Rojansky. I have no time to listen. Rojansky, wait. That hypodermic. Don't. Oh. Igor, you should be pleased to know that your dying will serve a good cause. Sorry, I'm late, but I... But? There were loose ends that had to be cleared up. Well, I thought maybe you decided against coming. Oh. After all, your job here is finished. Well, yes. Sit down, sir. <laughs> now that the Russians know you, there's nothing for you to do. It would be suicide to try to, huh? Oh, well, there are other things for me. Sure. Like getting married to a lovesick newspaper man, settling down, raising a family. Oh. <laughs> oh, I... I take it I'm your first Matahari. Mm-hmm. First and only. Mm. Well, Larry, we're very different from other women. In our business, you pay dues. And they're heavy payments. Hmm. I don't get it. I'm talking about sitting at another cafe on the left bank. Sitting and knowing that an agent named Wilson was going to be killed. Clumsily trying to warn him and finally deciding that his death was the way it had to be. Larry, that's a big payment. But you can forget about it now. It wasn't your fault. No. Forget about that and forget about Leclerc. Well, you had to... 
You see, it's even hard for you to say. I had to kill him. No, Larry, I have to keep on to justify those things. But, Carol, listen. Bye, Larry. Thanks for the champagne. But our dinner, I've, uh, I've ordered dinner. At least have dinner with me. Oh, we both know what I have to do. If I ever change my mind, I promise I'll come running. Larry Fielding sat in La Rotonde and watched her walk away. He knew she was walking out of his life. For a moment, he toyed with the idea of running after her and joining her world of spies. He flirted with the idea that he might even be some sort of an American James Bond. But then, the waiter brought the dinner. And to his surprise, he was hungry. And that realization made him wonder about whether or not he was truly in love. I'll be back shortly. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. I saw this perfectly darling mirror in the showroom, so I bought it. But when the truck came, they delivered this thing I never saw before. Now what am I going to do? Tell you what to do, madam. But who are you? I'm the man from the Better Business Bureau. Now, the first thing to do is to call the store manager and tell him what happened. But in the future, when your merchandise is delivered, you should examine the item before the delivery truck leaves. And if it's to be delivered from a warehouse, have a clear understanding with the dealer that unless it is the same as the sample shown to you, you will not accept it or... Pay for it. Oh, thank you. Just part of my job, madam, to help people with their shopping problems. Back in New York, Larry Fielding returned to his old job. An old friend and boss, Horace Finley, who was curious about what had happened in Paris. Finley kept pressing Larry to tell him about his Parisian adventure. Finally, Larry said, I'll tell you, Horace. In Paris, the food was good. Our cast included William Redfield, Joan Loring, Roger DeCoven, Ian Martin, and Chris Gampel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I really killed that boy, you know? What did you say? I killed him, Mr. Murray. I waited for him in the hallway the next day, and I grabbed him. He was a scrawny kid. It was like ringing in the neck of a chicken. I do the same thing again, Mr. Murray, to the next guy who bothers my wife. They've got to learn. You lied to me. Every stinking word you told me was a lie. Don't be sore, Mr. Murray. I couldn't tell you the truth, could I? I mean, you wouldn't have taken the case, would you? Yes. I would have taken the case and told you to plead guilty with cause. No. I wanted you to get me off. And that's what you did. Look. Look I've Luke. got to go now, Mr. Murray. I just want to say thanks again. Oh, you think it's that simple? You think you can just walk out of here? Uh, Melanie's waiting for me. She likes to eat dinner early. The girl's always hungry. So long, Mr. Murray. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our Radio Mystery Theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... W-D-A-F, Kansas City.
spoons and more. Don't miss it. Member FDIC. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. This is a tale about justice. About the lady who stands over the criminal courthouses of America with a blindfold over her eyes. Of course, the blindfold represents impartiality, not faulty vision. But yet, there are occasions when justice seems to be looking the other way. And that's something which bothers attorney Ned Murray very much indeed. He's getting away with murder, Tony. And maybe he'll get away with another one. Maybe there's an answer. What? I've been waiting a long time to figure out what I could do for you, Ned. What kind of favor might be important to you? Now I know. Tony, you're thinking about killing Rydell. Our mystery drama, After the Verdict, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by new sugar-free diet 7-Up and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. And now, another story of the ball and chain as Kellogg's Special K presents The Library. Welcome to the public library. May I help you, sir? Uh, yes, I'd like to check out... Uh, I'd like to check out Famous Laundromats of the World by Audrey Schnorbart. Sir, excuse me, but isn't that ball and chain you're wearing just like the ones they use in the Kellogg Special K commercial? Uh, this ball and chain? Shh, yes, that one. How are you going to get rid of it? Well, you know, lots of good exercises. And by eating smart at every meal, starting with the Special K breakfast. Don't you have to watch your calories? Yes, and the Special K breakfast is less than 240 calories. Less than 240 calories? Right. A one-ounce bowl of high-protein Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's really tasty, and it's going to help me get rid of this ball and chain. I'd say it's <laughs> long overdue. Get it? Your happy ending could begin with the Special K breakfast from Kellogg's. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? The Better Business Bureau knows. Wednesday. 10 o'clock. I'm back at the office working on the case when my secretary brings me the mail. Thanks, kid. The usual stuff. Then I see it. It's addressed to me, resident. Inside, a fake rabbit's foot. The pitch, a $2 donation or send back the rabbit's foot. My problem, what to do about it. I'll help you with good advice from the Better Business Bureau. Oh, yeah? Spill it. If you receive unordered merchandise in the mail, you are under no obligation to return it or pay for it. Thanks, pal. You're okay. Just another consumer tip from your Better Business Bureau. better place to begin a story about justice than in a courtroom. This one is packed today because it's the day the jury is going to return its verdict in the case of the People versus Louis Rydell. That's Rydell over there, the thin man with the burning eyes. See the way he searches the face of every juror who takes his or her place in the jury box? It's only natural, of course. Because Louis Rydell had been charged with murder. Shh, shh, quiet now. Presiding Judge Lincoln Arthur is about to speak. 
The foreman of the jury will please rise. Has the jury reached a verdict in this case? We, uh, we have, Your Honor. Please read your verdict to the court. We find the defendant, Louis Rydell, not guilty. <laughs> Congratulations, Lou. I'm very happy. You're happy. How do you think I feel? Hey, come on. Let's get out of this place. Let's celebrate, huh? Let's pick up my wife and have a ball. Well, I, I don't think I can. I promised my boss that I'd go down. You don't the... care about your boss. You want to see that daughter of his. Okay, we'll make it a foursome. I can't, Lou. I'm sorry. Come on. Come on, Counselor. Melanie's got a cab waiting outside. <laughs> Why did I read those faces wrong? I thought, that's a hanging jury if ever I saw one. The only one I was worried about was that little old lady with the blue hair. <laughs> you just can't tell about a jury from their faces. My last case, well, uh, I thought they all looked friendly, but uh, well, I lost. <laughs> you won this one, Mr. Murray. I bet that boss of yours is real pleased. I mean, all this publicity that you got. Well, you're a regular Clarence Darrow. <laughs> Look, Lou, we don't really have to talk about the fee settlement now. Why don't you and Melanie just go out and drink up a couple of bottles of champagne? Oh, Lou doesn't drink, Mr. Murray. Lou doesn't have any vices. Do you, Lou? I want to get the money settled, Counselor. Melanie here doesn't like to hear about money. She just likes to spend it. We'll drop her off at home. Hey, you promised to take me someplace. Wait for me at home, Pumpkin. Oh. Daddy will be there just as soon as he settles things with his lawyer. Okay? What choice do I have? I'll be home in an hour or two, and we'll go out to dinner. Just stay in the apartment, and don't open the door to anyone. And if you have to open the door, wear some clothes, baby. Huh? Yeah, this is a nice little office you got here, Mr. Murray. Only, uh... Strikes me as kind of small, isn't it? Well, it's big enough, Lou. I mean, compared to that big office down the hall, Mr. Ostrow. Uh, Mr. Ostrow is the senior partner of this firm, Lou. <laughs> well, maybe when you marry his daughter. You are going to marry that chick, aren't you? Let's get down to business, okay? I mean, the way she was hanging around that courtroom every day of the trial, I figured she was pretty stuck on you. Lou, this meeting was your idea. <clears throat> you said you could manage to pay about 150 a month, and that's perfectly fine with me. Sure, Mr. Murray, anything you say. We could have settled this in the taxi. I guess they just didn't want to face Melanie for a couple of hours. They needed an excuse. You understand? I suppose so. She's beautiful, isn't she? Mrs. Rydell? No, oh, yes, she's very lovely. She can't help herself, you know. The way men bother her all the time. They look at her, and right away they get ideas. It's not her fault. No. She's not smart about it, though. She doesn't know the way men think. Like the way she answers the door sometimes in that sloppy house coat. She gives people ideas. Like that kid Yost. I feel sorry for that kid, you know? I know you do. It's just too bad that he got himself mugged the day after you threw him out of the house. You wouldn't have gone through all this. You wouldn't be owing me 150 bucks a month. Yeah, I feel sorry for him. Kid delivers the groceries every day, gets the same eyeful every day. His tongue must have been hanging out. Lou, I really have to get on home. I've got a party at my boss's house tonight. But just the same, I'd do it again. That's the way I am. When a guy touches my wife, I get a red fire in my brain and I can't stop myself. Now, I, I, I owe you a lot, Mr. Murray. More than money. Well, forget it. Just learn to keep your temper. I really killed that boy, you know? What? What did you say? I killed him, Mr. Murray. I waited for him in the hallway the next day, and I grabbed him. He was a scrawny kid. It was like wringing in the neck of a chicken. I do the same thing again, Mr. Murray, to the next guy who bothers my wife. They've got to learn. Well, better go now. Melanie's waiting for me. You lied to me. Every stinking word you told me was a lie. Don't be sore, Mr. Murray. I couldn't tell you the truth, could I? I mean, you wouldn't have taken the case, would you? Yes. I would have taken the case and told you to plead guilty with cause. No, that wouldn't have been any good. I wanted you to get me off. And that's what you did. Look, Look I've got to go now, Mr. Murray. I just want to say thanks again. Oh, you think it's that simple? 
You think you can just walk out of here? Oh, Melanie's waiting for me. She likes to eat dinner early. The girl's always hungry. So long, Mr. Murray. Oh, my God. Where you been? I'm sorry I'm so late, Mr. Ostrom. Who do you think this party's for, anyway? Well, come in, come in, come in. Karen's going out of her brain waiting for you to get here. This one looks like quite a crowd. Well, they're all in your pocket tonight now, Ned. All right, everybody, hold it, hold it. Here's the man we've all been waiting for. Ned Murray, folks. Greatest trial lawyer since Clarence... Uh, no. Since Harry Ostrom. <laughs> Oh, come on, Ned. Karen's over here. Ned. Hi, darling. Where in the world have you been? The party started two hours ago. I just lost track of the time, that's all. Ah, uh, must be love if you ask me. All right, I'll see you kids later. Ned, come into the kitchen for a minute. No, it's full of servants. Come into the bedroom. Now, that's an offer I can't refuse. Well, what did you have in mind? Give you one guess. Oh, darling, I'm so proud of you. You were so wonderful. That kiss was pretty wonderful. Father says that you were everything he used to be in the courtroom. And there's no higher praise he can give than that. <laughs> Look, let's forget about the trial. It's over. Oh, no, I don't want to forget about it, Ned. I'm just so thrilled with the way you handled the case... That man Rydell seems so guilty. But there's too much fuss about all this, Karen. Father said that if you could win this case, you could do anything. That it would mean a lot of business to the firm. Do you know what I think? He's not going to wait on that promise about the junior partnership. I think he's going to do something about it right now. Are you serious? Don't tell him what I said, but I'm sure of it. Ned, you'll have to stop making excuses pretty soon, lover. You'll have to name the day. Oh, for heaven's sake. It's probably your father wanting me to join the party. Hiya, Ned. Ostrow told me you were here. Tony, for the love of Mike, <laughs> I haven't seen you in ages. Yeah, that's right. Oh, hey, I am sorry I didn't know you had somebody with you. It's all right, Mr. Igo. I was just going to fix my makeup. See you later, darling. Yes, yes, sure. Tony... I don't think I ever saw you at Ostrow's before. Yeah, you know me, Ned. I don't like to mix with all these big shots. Hey, you still talk to ordinary people, big celebrity like you, huh? Yeah, I'll <laughs> talk to you anytime, Tony. <laughs> Listen, I was in court today. I've been there the last four days. Bet you didn't even notice, huh? <laughs> well, that was nice of you, busy man like you. Well, I got a personal interest. You know that. Sure. Tony... I was real glad you won, kid. Reminded me all over again what you did for me two years ago. Get me off that murder rap. It was like seeing the whole thing again. It wasn't the same, Tony. For one thing, you didn't kill it. I mean, uh, come on, let's go out and get a drink. Huh? Nah, not for me. Since I seen you last, I got me an ulcer. That's the price of success, you know, in my business just like yours. That's too bad. You know something, Ned? You don't look so healthy yourself. Nah, I'm okay. You look great in that courtroom, only now... Yeah, you don't look like a guy who won a case. You look like a loser. I'm just tired. Uh, let down, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hey, look, Ned. Uh, you remember what I told you once, huh? You got any troubles you can't handle. I want to hear about them. You got a favor coming from me. And it bothers me not to pay off. That was a long time ago. You don't owe me anything. I keep good books. Don't tell me who I owe. Hey, go on, Ned. Find that girl of yours. Maybe she can cheer you up, huh? Tell you the truth, Tony. I need a couple of minutes all by myself. You know how it is. Huh? Yeah, sure. I know how it is. Sometimes too much is too much. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> See you around later, kid. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, later. Sometimes too much is too much. I really killed that boy, you know. He killed him. He killed him, and I let him get away with it. I killed him, Mr. Murray. Oh, God. I'll do the same thing again to the next guy who bothered. 
promise my wife I'll do the same thing, Mr. Murray. The same thing. I'm coming. Oh, Mr. Murray. Hello, Mrs. Rydell. Oh, well, Lou isn't home, you know. Oh, he, he went to see Mr. Fleming about going back to the company. I knew he wasn't home. May I come in anyway? Oh, yeah, sure. Look, do you think Lou will have any trouble? I mean, getting his old job back? You know, he was their best salesman before... before the trouble happened. They won't hold it against him, will they? I don't know. I want to ask you a few things. Yeah? Oh, well, sure. Mrs. Rydell, before the trial, you told me your husband was... The jealous type. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, but you said there was never any reason for his jealousy. But do we have to go through that again? The trial's over, isn't it? Please, it's more important than you think. Why? This delivery boy, uh, Yost. I tried to underplay Lou's anger about him in court, but uh, he was really pretty sore about the pass he made at you, wasn't he? But I told you all that. Yes, Lou was sore. Sore. He was crazy. I didn't even want to tell him about the kid because I was afraid he'd... Well, you know... Mrs. Rydell, the trial is over, just as you said. Nobody can charge Lou with the same crime again. That's the law in this state. So you've got nothing to lose by telling me the absolute truth. About what? Lou did kill that boy, didn't he? Hey! He waited for him the next day and choked him to death. That's a dirty lie! How could you, of all people... All right, all right. Maybe you didn't know the truth. Maybe you believed your husband the way I did. You get out of here, mister. Please, I'm not through. The reason I know this is because Lou told me himself yesterday in my office. Lou isn't going to change because of the trial. He's an insanely jealous man, and he might very well do the same thing again. Oh, you're awful. I thought you were so nice, Mr. Murray, but you're terrible. I had to let you know how things are with Lou. He got away with murder, and that makes me sick to my stomach. There's not much I can do about it, but maybe you can do something, Mrs. Rydell. Me? You can be careful. Do you understand? No. You've got to make sure he never has any reason to be jealous. Listen, if you think I play around... Even and... if he misunderstands your behavior, somebody else might get loose hands around his throat. It might even be easier for him the next time. He got away with it once. Please, Mrs. Rydell, for his sake. All right, for mine. Don't make your husband kill again. I don't know about you, but I think Mr. Murray's request is very reasonable. The only problem, of course, is exactly how reasonable Lou Rydell is. There's something about the man's eyes, the way his hands twitch personally. I don't think it would be a very good idea to wink at Mrs. Rydell. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Ooh, somebody's been drinking my sugar-free diet 7-Up, and it's all gone. Well, actually, I saved a little. Oh, a bear! Hiya, Goldie, what's brewing? That's me! Goldilocks to you. Oh, come on, kid. You mean you don't remember me? The cottage, the three chairs, the <gasps> porridge? Baby bear. In the fur. Been a long time, Goldie. But baby bear. Please call me BB. You drank all the sugar-free diet 7-Up, and I have to conduct another diet drink taste test today. Well, yeah, I saw the sign on the door, a professional taste tester. Huh? But how can I conduct my taste test now? Why bother? I tried those other diet drinks, too. You'll notice there's still plenty of them around. Why not ask me? Well, okay, BB. Tell me. Why did you drink all the sugar-free diet 7-Up? I like the taste. Light, fresh, natural, sugar-free diet 7-Up is definitely unbearably delicious. Mm -hmm. People can reach, people can touch, people can help, people so much. If you can remember World War II, you can remember when people spoke about cancer in a whisper. Once it was known someone had cancer, nobody talked about it. I'm Paul Newman. 
Today we talk about cancer quite openly, except for one form of it, the one nobody likes to talk about still, cancer of the colon and rectum. It's the most common form of internal cancer, yet doctors estimate three out of four patients could be saved by early detection and treatment. That means when you have your regular health checkup, especially if you're over 40, talk to your doctor about a procto. Fight cancer with a checkup and a generous check when your American Cancer Society volunteer calls. Cancer Crusaders, people who care about people. And now here's Act Two of After the Verdict. It's a bright, sunny morning. The kind of morning that fills promising young men like Ned Murray with enthusiasm for life. After all, he has everything going for him. A fine career ahead, marriage to a lovely young lady who also happens to be the boss's daughter. And even if his recent triumph has turned a bit sour, it was still a triumph, wasn't it? But as Ned Murray goes to see Harry Ostrow, he finds the sun isn't shining in the big corner office. The shades are drawn. His boss's face is a thundercloud. You wanted to see me, Mr. Ostrow? Yes. Come in and shut the door. Hello, Mr. Murray. Nice to see you again. Hello, Lou. Uh, What are you doing here? Mr. Idell's told me something I find hard to believe, Ned. I said he must be mistaken, but he swears it's true. Did you go to see Mrs. Rydell yesterday? Yes. Why did you think it was necessary to do that? Uh, I had something I wanted to tell her. It was strictly an unofficial visit. You told her I was guilty. You went up there deliberately just to frighten her. I ought to sue you for what you did, Mr. Murray. Lawyer or no lawyer. What kind of nonsense is this, Ned? You didn't say any such thing, did you? Well, did you... Yes, sir, I did. What? I I didn't go there to frighten her, just to warn her. Right after the trial, Mr. Rydell here obliged me with a nice little confession. A little late, I'm afraid. Confession? What are you talking about? That's a lie. I don't know what you've got against me, Mr. Murray, but I never heard of a lawyer behaving like this. I didn't kill that boy. The jury said so. And that... Please, this is all so ridiculous. Mr. Rydell put it very bluntly. He said he killed Yost. He said he'd kill again if another Yost came along. You can't do that. It's over. The trial's over. They can't put me through this again. They can't. No, no, Mr. Rydell. Of course they can't. There's nothing to get excited about. Mr. Murray just misunderstood you, that's all. I read him loud and clear. I knew I couldn't get him back in a courtroom because of double jeopardy, but I thought if I went to the D.A., he'd be a lot more careful with his hands the next time. I'll sue you. I'll sue this whole firm for slander. You hear that, Ostra? Now, please, Ned. Apologize to Mr. Rydell. Tell him you didn't mean it. Apologize? Yes, I should apologize to the state for saving his skin. Ned. Ned, you listen to me now. I don't know what went on between you and this man, and I don't care. But he's a client, understand? My client, even if you handle the case. And there's such a thing as lawyer-client privilege. Since when does it include murder? Shut up and listen to me. Anything you do reflects on me, on the way I run this firm. Mr. Rydell got a fair trial under law. Better than fair. Yes. And the jury acquitted him. That's all we have to know. You don't have any right to violate any confidences he made to you. Didn't they teach you that in law school? They taught me something else. They taught me that a lawyer's main concern was for justice. You talk about justice, huh? Go talk to that hoodlum buddy of yours, Tony Igo. If there was justice, you think that crook would be walking around loose? Tony was innocent of that murder charge. Because the jury said so. And they said the same thing about Mr. Rydell here. And that's that, my boy. Understand? Uh, Who is it? Oh, for Pete's sake. Can't they let a guy get some rest in his own home? 
Well, have I caught you with the blonde? You caught me with a bottle. And just in time, obviously. Well, the least I can do is make sure you don't drink alone. Not enough for the two of us. Even if I give you this? What is it? A present. Open it. It's that pipe you were so crazy about. The one with the ivory carving. I was saving it for some special occasion. But your birthday isn't for six months. Hmm. It's a beauty. If you're going to bribe me, I prefer cash. Really? And I thought I'd use sex appeal. I understand that sure fire. Excuse me, it's time for another drink. <laughs> What's so funny? The whole thing. You... Father, he told me about that scene in his office this morning. I wish I could have been there. Clarence Darrow versus William Jennings Bryan. It wasn't. It was stupid versus childish, and all because of that... All because of that silly man with the funny eyes. Honestly, Ned, I hope you won't make any more fuss about him. I thought it was Daddy who was making the fuss. Believe me, I, I think he feels just awful about the whole silly quarrel. Yeah, I'll bet he does. Oh, for heaven's sake, Ned. Why would you want to spoil things now? All right, maybe that idiotic man did kill that grocery boy, but I'm not saying he didn't, but... Well, wouldn't it... Wouldn't be the first time that a guilty man is... <gasps> Ned! It's the first time for me. Don't you understand that? The first time I ever got a guilty man off? Was it really, darling? That man I go... Tony was innocent. Well, innocent of that crime, maybe. But what about all the others? He might have killed a dozen men before, or had them killed. He wasn't being tried for killing a dozen men. Only one. And he was innocent of that. I should know better than to talk to you while you're drinking. I'm going to the district attorney tomorrow, Karen. Even if it doesn't do a bit of good, I'll feel better for it. Do you know what the DA will say? He'll say you're a fool. I don't care. You haven't got a shred of proof. Not a shred. And all the proof in the world wouldn't put Lou Rydell back on the stand. You know that, don't you? If you go to the DA tomorrow, you... You can find yourself another connection. What? What was that? Oh, I'm sorry, Ned, but... He did say it. And I know my father. I know he never says anything he doesn't mean. What about you, Karen? What about the connection between me and you? I waited long enough for you to get serious about me, Ned. I can wait a little longer until you come to your senses. And that's the real bribe, isn't it? <laughs> What's all the racket about? Come on, open up! All right, take it easy, will you? Give a guy a chance. Tony, what the heck are you doing here? Boy, you've really been working at it, kid. Huh? I'm an invited guest, remember? <laughs> no, I guess you don't. About an hour ago, you called me up, told me to come have a drink with you. Well, here I am. Want to change your mind? No, 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 no. Come on in. I told you, make mine ginger ale or something. I'll drink with you. <laughs> no, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, Tony. That's that's about all I've got left. Just one more drink. Hey, 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 hey. What is this, kid? This celebration going on a long time, ain't it? I'm no, not celebrating now, Tony. Commiserating. That's the word, isn't it? It doesn't sound right. Commiserating. Don't ask me. I never heard it before. Uh, it means I'm feeling sorry for somebody. For who? For a dumb kid, name of Yost. Dumb kid from the grocery. You mean a kid that got killed? Yeah, that's right, that got killed. Yeah. And you know who killed him? How should I know? Where's that drink? Oh, there it is. Here's the crime, Tony. Put it down, Ned. What? You heard me. Put it down. You want to tell me your troubles? Okay, I'll put on a pot of coffee for both of us. <laughs> Yeah. Did it make you feel any better? No. Well, give it time. <laughs> Tony, were you listening to me? Did you hear what I told you? 
Yeah, I heard you. This guy Rydell is a kookaboo. He's getting away with murder, Tony. And maybe he'll get away with another one. No, nah, next time will be different. You'll know different from one thing. Meantime, somebody gets killed. Well, what's that to you? I, I'm sorry. Sir, I, I forgot the kind of guy I'm talking to. What am I going to feel like when it happens, Tony? Well, there must be some way to nail this crumb. No. No, there isn't. The law protects him. Uh, Double jeopardy. A man can't be tried twice for the same crime. That's how it goes, Tony. One trial to a customer. Yeah, it's a shame, all right. They hung better guys than that, and he's walking around free as air. That's the law, Tony. Yeah, yeah, the law. Okay, if it bothers you so much, stop him. Yeah. Tell me how. Everybody else has to pay the penalty, right? Why not him? It's too late. It's too late, Tony. What a law, maybe. Huh? Want some more coffee? No. I think I'll get myself a cup. Yeah, maybe there's an answer. What? I've been waiting a long time to figure out what I could do for you, Ned. What kind of favor might be important to you. Now I know. How do you mean, favor? Well, it won't be just for you. I'd be doing everybody a favor, the whole state, right? Only when it happens, I mean it for you, Ned. Remember that. See? It's good coffee. <laughs> well, see you around. Tony, uh, wait. Wait, wait a minute. Oh, it's getting late, kid. I have to go. What? What was that you just said? What's... What's in your mind? Uh, nothing, nothing. Come on, I did my good deed for day. <laughs> Let me out of here now, huh? I, I want to know what you meant by uh, a favor. You know what the word means. You're thinking of killing Rydell. Oh, you see too many movies. Tony, kid. don't be crazy. I don't want that kind of favor, understand? Yeah, 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 sure. Just let him loose, huh? So what if he gets away with murder, huh? Killing him is no answer. Sure, so let some other slobs get knocked off, huh? That's better. I didn't mean all those things I said, Tony. You got the wrong idea. This guy didn't kill a grocery boy. He's killing you too, buddy, and that's what I care about. But you got nothing to be afraid of. Nothing's gonna rub off on you. I know my business. Just like you know yours. So long, kid. Tony! <laughs> Usually, it's a very good thing to have friends. Loyal friends who are always willing to do you a favor. But it looks as if Tony Igo is going to do a good deed by committing a very bad deed. The question is, can one murder avenge another? We'll find out shortly when we return with Act Three. You've seen the Budweiser commercials on television, and maybe you've wondered how long people have been putting that famous Bud label on things. Well, not as long as the brewers of Bud have been putting things on the label. Things like a list of Bud's most important ingredients. Quote, brewed by our original process from the choicest hops, rice, and best barley malt. And things like the following statement. This is the famous Budweiser beer. We know of no brand produced by any other brewer, which costs so much to brew and age. Our exclusive Beechwood aging produces a taste, a smoothness, and a drinkability you will find in no other beer at any price. Unquote. Yes, brewing beer right does make a difference. Read the Bud label. Taste the king of beers, and you'll agree, when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. You're 17. Well, that's plenty old. Old enough to know about things like grass and speed and acid and smack. We probably can't tell you anything about the stuff you haven't already heard. Or maybe even found out for yourself. So, we don't intend to give you any advice. He wouldn't listen. But the trouble is, neither will your kid brother. He doesn't know half of what you know. He doesn't know how dope can affect your body. He's never spent a violent night hugging a friend who was on a bad trip 
I watch a guy nod off in class and fall to the floor. He's just a kid. And a real setup for anybody out there selling the stuff. We'd like to warn you, little brother. Too bad he doesn't trust us. We can't get to him. But maybe you can. An advertising council campaign. Now, the last act of After the Verdict. Listen closely. Here's a sound we don't hear very often. Yes. What with all these electric clocks and digital clocks and electronic clocks, the good old-fashioned ticking that marks off the minutes and hours of the night is rarely heard. But tonight, Ned Murray is hearing that sound. Hearing it from a clock which normally purrs softly on his night table. But Ned's hearing is highly sensitive tonight. His brain is tuned like a high-frequency instrument, picking out the slightest vibrations, tuning in on voices he doesn't want to hear. too much. Oh, I knew you'd do that. Ned, I, I'm so mixed up. I... Well, what's there to be mixed up about? I... The choices are pretty clear, aren't they? Are they? Not to me, they aren't. I don't think things are ever that simple, especially when it comes to law. Just ask your father. He knows all about the law. He knows how to make money at it. That proves it. That isn't fair, Ned. No. No, no, no. I suppose it isn't. Don't you remember what he used to say? That if the time ever comes when right and wrong are absolutely clear, there won't be any need for lawyers. Your father didn't say that, Karen. He was quoting someone. Who? Judge Lincoln Arthur, as a matter of fact, the judge at Rydell's trial. Well, it makes very good sense to me. Yeah. Judge Arthur always made sense to me, too. Karen, do you mind if I hang up now? Then you are. No, 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 no. It's just that I, I have to make a call. A very important call. All right, Ned, but will you call me tomorrow? Yes. If there is one. Good night, Karen. Information? G uh, can you give me the number of uh, uh, Judge Lincoln Arthur? Sure you don't want any wine, Ned? No, no Judge, thanks. I, I've sworn off that stuff for the duration of my life. <laughs> Sounds like you had yourself a party. Is that when you came up with this parable? Isn't that what you called it? <laughs> no, Judge. Uh, it's, it's more like a, a riddle. A, a legal riddle. The only thing is, I already know the answer. Uh, all right. Let's see if I know it. It's about a lawyer. A criminal lawyer who defends somebody for murder and does it successfully. He's convinced of his client's innocence, understand? 
And that helps him get the acquittal. But right after the verdict, he makes a discovery that his client is guilty. How does he make this discovery? Is that important? It might be. Was it on evidence that had appeared at the trial? Evidence he had misinterpreted or concealed unknowingly? No. It was a confession. Uh, how does he obtain this confession? It's given to him, unsolicited by his client. Why? I don't know. Perversity, pride, ego. Anyway, he knows the truth about his client. And he knows something worse. That the man is more than capable of committing a similar crime. In fact, he boasts of the possibility almost gleefully. Any witnesses to this confession? No. And when he's confronted with it, the client denies ever having made it. Mm -hmm. You're not asking a legal question, Ed. I'm sure you know where your hypothetical lawyer stands legally. In the middle of nowhere. Is this a moral question, maybe? Well, you might say that. I mean, if you were that lawyer, Judge, what would you do? If I were that lawyer, Ned, and if I were your age, I suppose I'd do what you're doing now. I'd get angry. With my client, with myself, maybe even with the law. But if I were practicing now, I think I'd feel different. How different? I wouldn't feel anger. Only pity. Pity? For a man like that? Yes. Exactly for that kind of man. man who feels a compulsion to confess must have felt a similar compulsion to kill. They're symptoms of the same disease, Ned. If there's one thing the law has learned in this century, it's the ability to feel compassion for the emotionally disturbed. Yeah, he's that all right, but that doesn't... Uh... Ned, this parable of yours... Uh, you talking about Lewis Rydell? Yes. He told you that he murdered Yost? He did, I swear it. In my office, the same day of the verdict. Oh, for God's sake, Ned, use your brains. Can't you see that the man's mentally ill? Everything points to it. He killed a boy just for putting an arm around his wife. He confesses when there's no need to confess. Is it worthwhile venting all this anger against such a man? But he's dangerous. He, he'll he do this again, Judge. If a man just looks cross-eyed at his wife, it'll be another excuse for murder. If he had confessed this to you before the trial was over... I would have demanded that he plead guilty. He'd be waiting to serve a life sentence right now. And, Ned, you're forgetting something. What? I was the judge at the trial. It was my prerogative to pass sentence, not yours. It was first-degree murder, premeditated. Ned, if the jury had brought me a guilty verdict, I would have recommended psychiatric examination with a view to confinement at an institution for the criminally insane. But you didn't know he was... I mean, even I didn't know he was crazy. Well, do you know it now? Do you feel it now? Do you recognize that he needs cure more than punishment? Punishment? The law only penalizes the guilty, Ned. Isn't that what we all believe in? We don't penalize the sick. Uh, I, I, I have to go, Judge. I have something to do. It's getting pretty late for running errands, Ned. Almost midnight. Yeah, but this, this is important, Judge. I have to see someone. I have to tell... Something very important. Uh, hello? Is this Lucerne dispatching? My name's Ned Murray. I'm a, I'm a friend of Tony Igo. No, no, M Murray, Murray. That's the last name, not the first. Look, it's... Very important that I reach Tony as soon as possible, only this is the only number he ever gave me to reach him. But he's got to have a home phone, right? 
So help me, it's important. It's a matter of... Look, who am I speaking to? Lady, please, I'm in a phone booth and it's pouring like hell and I'm getting soaked. No, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, look, I didn't mean to talk to you that way. Yes, I realize that, but if you could make this one exception... Well, how do you know he isn't home? For God's sakes, it's after midnight! Yes, yes, all right, all, all right, all right. He, he couldn't have gone there tonight. He couldn't have... couldn't... Taxi! Taxi! <laughs> Yeah, it's me. Disappointed? Where the heck have you been? I've been taking care of business. What business? Since when do you sell shoes in the middle of the night? I was taking care of some competition. That's what I was doing. Oh, what are you talking about? Oh, I pretend you don't know. But I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. You know something, Melanie? You make a rotten liar. I'm not lying. For God's sake, Lou, will, will you stop staring at me like that? I'm looking at you the way other men look at you. What other men? The one who comes around here every day when I'm out pounding the pavements, peddling those lousy shoes to those stores. Oh, Lou, nobody comes around. You're just in one of those crazy, jealous moods again. Well, I got news for you, Pumpkin. There's one boyfriend who's not coming around anymore. Are you still talking about that poor, dumb grocery boy? Lou, I no, told you there was... No, I'm talking about the old guy. The one with the white hair. One who's been hanging around here all night, looking up at our window, waiting to make sure that the coast is clear. You're crazy. Crazy. I don't know any white-haired guys. Well, you'll never get to know this one, because he's got something wrong with him, baby. He's got a carving knife in his stomach. No. Oh, my God, no. No, you, you didn't. Yes, I did. So you can forget about seeing your lover boy tonight, baby. You can just forget it. You'll have to be satisfied with just me. Lou, just tell me it isn't true. Tell me you didn't kill anyone. It wasn't the first time, Pumpkin. If you keep up the way you're going, it won't be the last. In fact, the next one might be you. Oh, oh my God. Those, those police cars. They're, they're coming here. <laughs> Lieutenant, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Gerhardt. Oh, hi, Ned. What are you doing here? What's going on? What's all the crowd about? Oh, wait a minute. You know the victim, don't you? Is that why you're here? You get a tip or something? Victim? Who? Tony Igo. Tony? Somebody used a knife on him. Oh, God. Ironic, isn't it? Probably a dozen guys wanted Tony Igo knocked off, and how does he get it? From a jealous husband. Is he dead? Yeah, he's dead. And it was your ex-client who did it, that guy Rydell. He caught Tony hanging around the building watching the place. Rydell claims he was after his wife. You know about this, Ned? It's not true. It's not true, Lieutenant. He didn't even know the woman. Then what was he doing here? A favor. He was doing somebody a favor. What are you talking about? Look, where is Rydell now? Upstairs, answering questions. He won't get away. Not like the last time, Counselor. Yes, it won't be like the last time. Excuse me. Hey, 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 where do you think you're going? I want to see him. He's entitled to talk to a lawyer, isn't he? You must be nuts yourself. Half a dozen witnesses saw him. Can I go up, Lieutenant? You mean you'll defend that screwball again? He's out of his mind. Don't you know that? Yes, I know. And that's what I'll try to prove. Now, will you please let me see my client? <laughs> So Ned Murray is about to try for still another verdict. This time a verdict which will carry a punishment more befitting to the crime. And something tells me that he'll be very successful. Not just as an attorney, but as a human being. I'll be back shortly. <laughs> The 
time has come for action. Birth defects are forever, unless a you help. A time to be born, a time the to die. The March of Dimes fights birth a defects. A time to heal. Through medical service programs, scientific research, a time to and speak. public education. These are the times that try men's souls. To protect souls. the bodies and minds of our children, today That's and tomorrow. That's why it's time for a change. So much to do. So little time. We must see to it that every child is born healthy, whole, Now is perfect. the time for all good men to come to, to the, the aid of the March of Dimes in its drive to prevent birth Make defense. time stand still. Wake up. It's later than you Remember, think. Remember, birth defects are forever, unless you the help. The time has come for The action. time has come for action. Give to the March of Dimes. Some time ago, a man named Thomas De Quincey said, If once a man indulges himself in murder, very soon he comes to think very little of robbing. And from robbing, he comes next to drinking and Sabbath breaking. And from that, to incivility and procrastination. Let that be a lesson to all of you. This quotation and this story have come to you through the courtesy of our Radio Mystery Theater. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Joseph Julian, Bryna Rayburn, Barbara Caruso, Robert Dryden, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I take it you are referring to Miss Elaine Friend? Where is she? Back at her hotel. I had her sent back immediately. We did not want to speak to her. Just you. Okay. You have the floor, Mr. Colodanos. Uh, Colodinus, Monsieur Nash. It is an old name. In my country, a revered name. I'll do my best to remember. Well, continue. A uh, question, Monsieur. Why are you in France? As we say at home, none of your business. <laughs> I like you, Monsieur Nash. You are refreshingly candid. You are working for FNB. You are a trusted, intelligent worker. Well thought of. Thanks for the well, information. When I get back, I'll put in for a raise. If you get back, Monsieur. If you get back. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part... By Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I am E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your own imagination. I have an unusual story about foreign intrigue, murder, and love. Interesting combination. You know, that great mystery writer Edgar Allan Poe once wrote that the best way to hide something was to leave it in full sight. And that's what this story is about. Steve Nash, agent for the Federal Narcotics Bureau, was awakened from a sound sleep by his chief. Steve, Manny and LaFaro got it tonight. Wounded? Dead. Oh, no. Manny's wife just had a baby. She's still in the hospital. Start packing a bag right now, Steve. Am I going somewhere? 
Paris. And anywhere else you feel it necessary to go from there. Paris? I don't get happy. It's not exactly a vacation, Steve. You're in for plenty of trouble. <laughs> mystery drama, Conspiracy to Defraud, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sidney Sloan and stars Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal, and by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Ever had a tall, frosty glass of Amplitude? Well, if your beer is Budweiser, you've had it often. Amplitude is a fancy word for the entire taste phenomenon, the total experience of flavor. Next time you take a healthy swallow of Bud, watch what happens. Think about the sensations you're experiencing. Notice how the flavor of Bud comes on nice and easy. Not too strong, not too quick just right. Notice the clean, crisp togetherness of Bud's taste. Everything in perfect balance, with no single element jumping out at you. And there'll be no aftertaste either, no hanging on. And you'll be refreshed and ready for another glassful. Actually, Bud drinkers have been experiencing amplitude for years, but they never phrase it that way. They just say, Budweiser. And that says it all. Anheuser-Busch. St. Louis. Hello, this is Steve Allen. You are? Then I must be Jane Meadows. I hmm? hope so. <laughs> uh, now, do you want to tell them, darling, or shall I? Ladies first, sweetheart. The microphone's okay. all yours. Okay. Well, we have some good news. Steve and I are the honorary chairman of National Goodwill Week. That's May 5th through the 12th. Mm -hmm. And we're very pleased to be associated with this organization. Yes. Because it's the number one rehabilitation facility in the country. You see, Goodwill believes in people, and its business is helping the handicapped help themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, Steve, with most of us these days devoting a good portion of our time combating the energy crisis, we tend to forget about the battle that um, handicapped people face every day just to survive. Very true. But that's where Goodwill Industries comes in. It offers them a chance to learn a trade earn a living, and regain their self-respect. Yes. Well, our time's about up, Jane, so remember, folks, be good to goodwill. Especially during the week of May 5th through the 12th. Police and the Federal Narcotics Bureau believe to be a well-planned and secret bust of a big narcotics ring is taking place in a warehouse district of New York City. Stand by, Sergeant. I'm going to talk to them on a bullhorn. If they don't come out, we go in. Right, I got it. You are completely surrounded. I repeat, you are completely surrounded. Come on with your hands behind your head and we will not fire. Come out with your hands behind your head, and you will not be harmed. Keep the windows covered. I'm going to blast the lock on the door. That's got the door. Let's go. Right. <laughs> Looks like there's nobody here. Be careful, there might be a trap. This is your last chance. Come out with your hands behind your head. Cover me. Hit the lights. Wait a minute. There's a the body. Careful. Uh, careful. Chief, it's Manny. He's dead. Manny. The Faro may be here, too. He's here, Chief. Still alive? No. Dead. They got him, too. Yeah. This is Borden, Steve. Yeah, Chief, what's up? Manny and LaFaro got it tonight. Wounded? Dead. Oh, no. Manny's wife just had a baby. She's still in the hospital. I haven't spoken to her yet. Talk to Mrs. LaFaro. Took it hard, eh? I hate this job. Steve, 
You're a good friend of Manny's. Would you talk to his wife for me? Sure, I'll go to the hospital first thing in the morning. Rotten business. Uh, better start packing a bag right now, Steve. Oh, am I going somewhere? Paris. And anywhere else you feel it necessary to go from there. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Uh, yeah. Uh, what? Uh, this seat. Seat? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I in the wrong seat? No, I am. Oh. <laughs> you see, I was sitting forward, the second row on the outside. Yeah. And I asked the stewardess to change my seat. This was the only unoccupied seat in first class. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, sit down. I don't mind. I thought this was going to be a dull flight. <laughs> My name is Helene Frame. Oh, I'm Steve Nash. Uh, pleased to have you as a traveling companion. I'm pleased, too. Uh, are you going to be in Paris long, Mr... Uh, Nash, uh, call me Steve. So seldom I get called Mr. I'm not sure whether I'm the one. <laughs> Steve, then. Are you going to be in Paris long? Well, it all depends on business. Are you? No. No, I was rushing back to... Well, you see, my aunt and my brother are in Paris, and oh, yeah. I was with them until last Thursday when I had to fly back to New York. Up and back across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I'm impressed. <laughs> this is my first time over. I'm as excited as a kid. Your first time? Yeah. Well, that must be exciting. You must let us show you the sights. Nothing I'd like better, Elaine. Entrez. Inspector Boivin? Oui. You are uh, Stephen Nash, Federal Narcotics Bureau? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> come in, come in, please. I have been expecting you. Uh, may I say that uh, we are not uh, pleased by this visit? I'm sorry, I didn't set it up. Oh, it is not personal, you understand. But uh, we feel that France is, uh, how shall I say it... Uh, is being insulted by the charges that we are the center of the illicit narcotics trade in Europe. Inspector, a lot of heroin is getting into the States. We know it's coming from France. Well, that is doubtful. In the last six weeks, we have intercepted and destroyed over 100 pounds of refined heroin coming into New York alone. From France? Definitely. Three men from my department have died in the operation, and that is no exaggeration. Well... As you say, it is uh, foolish for me to fence with you. That is not my job. As I understand it, Inspector, your job is not to question nor to argue. Your job is to cooperate. And that was the information handed down to my boss from the State Department. You may be assured of our cooperation. <laughs> Entree, the door is open. Oh, hello. You must be the chap Helene picked up on the plane. Uh, picked up? Oh, that's well, just a figure of speech, of course. I, I'm Harrington Frame, Helene's brother. Oh, hi. I'm Steve Nash. Yes, well, hello. Hello. Sit down, sit down. Helene should be back in a minute. Just stepped out to do a bit of last-minute shopping. Uh, that you, Helene? Oh, Auntie. This is that chap that Helene met on her flight back, Mr. Stephen Nash. This is our Aunt Phyllis, Mrs. Starrow. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Nash? How do you do, Mrs. Starrow? Oh, please, please, call me Phyllis. Mrs. Starrow reminds me of that I'm an old widow woman. Are you going to be in Paris long, Stephen? Oh, uh, two, uh, three weeks, perhaps longer. Auntie thinks of herself as an unofficial tourist bureau, feels she must take her fellow countrymen under her wing and show them her Paris. Oh, you be quiet. <laughs> I just want to be pleasant. Don't you like people who are pleasant, Steve? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't suppose that Harrington or Helene has told you of our trouble. Oh, good Lord, Phyllis. Must you tell everyone you meet? Mr. Nash has only been here a few minutes, and you want to burden him with the story. Well, I must say it's rather a traumatic experience, wouldn't you say, Stephen? To, to lose emeralds worth $150,000. 150000 $150,000? Oh, that must be Helene. Uh, let her in, Harrington. Phyllis is angry with me. She always calls me Harrington when she's annoyed. Oh, Helene. Mr. Nash here yet? Oh, indeed, yes. 
Phyllis and I have been staging a little domestic spat to keep him amused. Well, I wasn't amused. And I'm sure that this nice Mr. Nash wasn't amused either. I'm certain he wasn't. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Elaine. Sorry I was late and allowed my abrasive brother and aunt to put on a show for you. <laughs> I enjoyed every moment, Helene. <laughs> Penny, for your thoughts, Steve. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have let the Mater D seat us here in the window with a view of Notre Dame and the river. Mm. It is beautiful, isn't it? I was worried that perhaps you might feel that I'd steered you to a tourist trap. This place is frightfully expensive, you know. <laughs> it's great. I'm on an expense account. Stop worrying. <laughs> All right, I shall. And uh, speaking of worry... You seem to have something bothering you. Is it something personal? Well, it's about my aunt and Harrington. Yeah? Well, you see, my aunt has lost a very valuable piece of jewelry. Uh, the emeralds. You know. One of the first things she told me when I called worth $100,000 or more. They're insured for 120000 Why should she worry? She's not worrying. I am. The emeralds are not lost, strayed, or stolen. What? It's just a stunt to bilk the insurance company. Well, she's being very foolish. She's desperate. She's completely without money. For that matter, both Harrington and I are, too. If they go through with this insurance swindle, they're going to be in big trouble. Even a professional crook would have serious problems, and they're... Rank amateurs. When I went back to New York to see if I could raise some money... Oh, no good, eh? Aunt Phyllis has been to the well too often. No credit. Well, why doesn't she sell the emeralds, honestly? Well, I believe it's Harrington's idea, but he wants her to sell them to a... Uh, some... Uh... Fence? Yes. And also collect the insurance. He's made several tentative moves in that direction. He's spoken to several mysterious callers. I don't know how far the transaction has gone. I can find you a taxi, monsieur. What? You uh, want a taxi? I can get one for you. Uh, no, no, thanks, sir. <laughs> what a town. Even the taxi drivers have agents. <laughs> you will not make a move, monsieur. It is a revolver that is pressing into your back. <laughs> oh. Uh, perhaps you underestimated your strength, Gab. The blow on the head... No, he'll be all right. We dropped her at the Concord. That is the hotel where she is staying, is it not? Yes. Uh, uh, Nash, uh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, ah, you are opening your eyes. Uh, that is better. Oh, my head. Unfortunately, Geb found it necessary to, uh, <laughs> persuade you to come with him. Uh, yeah. It's a neat little persuader he used. Right in the back of my head. Thanks. Uh, don't try to move yet, Mr. Nash. Who are you? I? You do not know me? I am quite well known. I am Orestes Collaginos. Uh, rings no bells. Why should you try to make me come here? Wait a minute. Uh, where, where is she? What, what have you done with now, her? Now, compose yourself, Mr. Nash. I take it you are referring to Miss Elaine Friend? Where is she? Back at her hotel. I had her sent back immediately. We did not want to speak to her. Just you. Okay. You have the floor, Mr. Colladanus. Uh, Collaginus, Monsieur Nash. It is an old name. In my country, a revered name. I'll do my best to remember. Well, continue. A question, monsieur. Why are you in France? As we say at home, none of your business. <laughs> I like you, monsieur Nash. You are refreshingly candid. You are working for FNB. You are a trusted, intelligent worker. Well thought of. Thanks for the well... information. When I get back, I'll put in for a raise. If... You get back, monsieur. If you get back. There is 
no doubt in Steve's mind that Kaladinos would and could carry out his threat. Three men had already been permanently silenced, and it was not likely that Kaladinos would hesitate at the fourth. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Great taste in the morning, Kellogg's, Kellogg's has that wholesome taste to get you up and grinning. This is Jerry Coffer for Kellogg's Special K. You know, for years we've been talking about the Special K breakfast, a great way to start the day if you have a weight problem. You may have seen or heard our latest commercials, which symbolize the problem of being a few pounds overweight by using this ball and chain. That's the sound effect. But so many people have come to know the Special K breakfast that can help solve weight problems, they sometimes forget that Special K is America's favorite high-protein cereal. It has eight essential vitamins and iron, and so delicious that lots of folks, kids as well as adults, eat Special K just for the sheer good taste of it. So we don't want you to think that you have to wear a ball and chain to eat Special K. All you need is an appreciation for the finer things of life, a one-ounce bowl of Special K, four ounces of skim milk, tomato juice, coffee, and maybe a little sugar. The Special K breakfast breakfast can help you lose weight all by itself, but it really is a good start. The Marine Corps Reserves are looking for a few good men to help keep the peace. We're looking for men who understand that nobody likes to fight, but somebody has to know how. We want men who want to see their children grow up in an age of peace. Men who will do more than wish for it. Men who will work for it. Men who don't need the draft to know there's a job to be done. Men who ask themselves what they can do for their country and do it. We're looking for a few good men to stand with the Marine Corps Reserve. No shortcuts, no compromises, no promises except one. You'll be a Marine and you'll be ready. That's the job of a peacekeeper. After his meeting with Kaladinos, Steve was taken back to his hotel. It was too late to do anything but call Elaine to reassure himself of her safety. It may have occurred to him that his feelings for her were more than that of a casual friend. And the sound of her voice on the phone convinced him of her personal concern for his safety. Steve, you're safe. Oh, I was so worried. They told me that you'd been driven back to your hotel, but I wanted to be sure. I saw that man hit you. Uh, there was a car waiting. and I, I, He forced me into the car, and they dragged you in. I, Oh, you were so white, I thought... <laughs> With my hard head, you needn't have wore it. I'll tell you all about it when I see you. Well, when? When will I see you? Oh, there's so many things to ask you. I I'm sorry, I can't tell you what time. I'll call you again. Okay, Steve. Till then. Bye. Bye, darling. Ridiculous. Incroyable, monsieur. It could not have occurred. I tell you, he told me that his name was Caladinus. It could not be he. It is a, how do you say, imagination, hallucination. This lump on my head is not the result of a vivid imagination, Inspector. And also, I have a witness. I was with a Miss Helene Frayne when the incident occurred. Frayne? Frayne is an English name? Uh, possibly English in origin, but she's an American. She has a husband by name Arrington Frayne? No, that's her brother. Ah, this is a most interesting development. Monsieur Frayne was here not 20 minutes before you to report that his aunt, Madame Philistero, had been robbed of a valuable collection of emeralds. I believe he estimated the jewels to be worth... Um, I have the report here. Uh, ah, yes, 700,000 francs. In dollars, 150,000. Uh, look, Inspector, let's stay with my problem. Now, what are you going to do about Coladinas? Do? But you are jesting, monsieur. 
Monsieur Colladinos is a very rich, uh, very powerful man. Uh, so he can get away with, with hitting a man over the head and forcibly detaining him, kidnapping him, threatening him? Monsieur Colladinos could not have been involved in this matter. What do you mean? I spoke to him. He introduced himself. He insisted that I pronounce his name correct. It was not Colladinos, monsieur. Who was it then? I mean, what was this man's purpose in posing as Colladinos? That, monsieur, I um, cannot answer. But I know that it could not have been Colladinos. He is just at this time, uh, 1900 hours, arriving in France at Orly Airport in his own plane. <laughs> kissed me. Surprise you? No. I was sort of expecting you to kiss me. Uh, don't you think we ought to shut the door? <laughs> I wanted to take you in my arms 20 minutes after we met on the plane. I wanted you to 13 minutes after we... Oh. Oh, damn, let's ignore it. Yeah, you better answer it. Oh, dear. Yes? Yes, he's here. Steve, it's for you. New York calling. Oh, yeah. I left word at my hotel where I was going to be. Here, darling. Oh, thanks. Hello? Steve, this is Hal Gordon in New York. Oh, right, Chief. You get my cable? Yeah, and I have all the info you requested, but I can't give it to you where you are. Incidentally, where are you? Oh, Suite 1013 at the Concord Hotel. It's all right. It's a friend. All right, now go to the railroad station. Gare du Nord. Near the ticket window on the south side of the station, you see a line of ten telephone booths. Accounting from left to right, you go to booth three at three o'clock your time. You better get to it 15 minutes early to be sure it's available. Now, wait a minute, Chief. Let me see if I got it all. Gare du Nord, three o'clock, third booth on the south side of the station, counting from the left. Correct. Why all these precautions, Chief? Steve. You are being watched, followed, bugged, 24 hours of the day. Don't trust anyone. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye, Chief. Well, what was that all about? <laughs> oh, it's nothing. It's the business I'm in, Elaine. Oh, it sounds very mysterious. Rushing off to the guard you know to receive a phone call at 3 o'clock in booth 3. Oh, I almost forgot. What? When I came into the hotel just now, the clerk at the desk, he gave me a message for you. Yeah, and I got it here someplace. For me? Well, I think it's for your brother. <laughs> what did I do with it? Ah, darn it. Well, don't be upset. It's probably nothing uh, important. Hang on, hang on. I can remember it. It was very short. Just call El Moray. What? Yeah, it was, uh, sounds sort of Arabic. Uh, El Moray. E-E-L-M-O-R-E-Y. Did you ever hear of it before? I know, uh... Maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> you seem a bit upset when I mention it. Well, I was, actually. I I think it's the man Harrington has been trying to contact. What about the sale of the emeralds? Yes. We've had several calls. I've heard him deep in muffled conversation on the phone at least three times in the last week. Elaine, you can't let them... You've got to help me. I'm desperate. I can't think how I can stop them. Except by going to the police, as you said. Oh, not that. No. Well, that would be the last resort. I should have brought a book along. Hello. 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 Steve? Yeah, Borden. Steve Nash. Steve, is that you? Yeah. Good. I'm glad you got to the booth early. I'm seven minutes and 35 seconds early. Now listen, we have reason to believe that we may be bugged right here at headquarters. Now here's the info on Coladinas. He's a rich exporter of olives and olive oil. He's dabbled in other things, art, petroleum, some shipping. But mainly olives and olive oil, eh? Clean? Well, who knows? Then explain why he picked me up, brought me to this place, and gave me more than a gentle warning to get the hell out. 
I don't get it. He's reputed to be one of the richest men in Europe. Now, here's what I wanted to tell you. We have it on good authority that a very large shipment of raw opium came into Marseille yesterday. It'll take a few days to process, and then the refined product will be slipped out of France for here. Do the French know? They're just being told through official channels. We've asked them to check all personal baggage going out of France. Going out? Big order. I know. It's going to be tough to check. A lot will slip by. We'll have to try to spot it here. Wait a minute, Chief. What is it? Someone, someone just slipped into the booth next to mine. Public phone, see? Uh, this guy I recognize. Uh, you know what time it is on my watch? Exactly three. Yeah, but Steve, what is that character cut? I ran into on the street the other night, the one who let me have it on the back of the head. Don't you see? He's in the next booth, probably hooking up some sort of electronic device to listen in on us. He expected you there at three. Yeah, you were right. You were right about the phone being bugged. But we got the jump on him by several minutes because I was early. I won't hang up my phone, Chief. Stay on the phone. I'm going to get him. What? I get you, you little punk. Let me go. I'll call the police. Uh, you call the police. Good. Save me the trouble. But before they get here, I have a little something I owe you from the other night. Oh, you're quitting so soon. Come on, buddy boy. Don't play unconscious with me. Uh-oh. Looks like we're going to have some company. Hello. Uh, Chief, are you still there? Yes, yeah, Chief. What's going on? I just... I just nailed our eavesdropper, and I was right. He is one of Coladinas boys. Now, you better get in touch with the French police and point the finger at Coladinas. And uh, while you're getting Coladinas into trouble with the police, you, you might tell them that they got me locked up. I, I don't think I'll be able to explain. Locked up? What are you talking about? You're not locked up. No, but by that time, I will be. Here comes the gendarme now. Bye, Chief. <laughs> It is one thing to point the finger at Kaladinos. It is another to pin him down. Kaladinos is a man used to wielding great power. A very cunning and wily antagonist. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. Hello, this is Goldilocks. It seemed like only yesterday that I was a little girl tasting porridge. You know, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. And now I conduct taste tests on diet drinks. And there's one I must tell you about. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. It has a fresh, natural, delicious taste. It drives my taste meter crazy. Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. <gasps> this one's just right. Hi, I'm Nanette Fabre. 11 million Americans have an untreated hearing problem, including 3 million school-age kids. I was one of those kids. But I got help. Most hard of hearing people can be helped either medically or through amplification. There is a Better Business Bureau booklet that may help you, and it's free. Write Better Hearing Institute, Box 1840. That's 1840, Washington, D.C. You want to hear what you're missing. Your contributions to care have given help and hope to millions of needy people around the world. When they were hungry, you nourished them. When they were thirsty, you brought them safe water to drink. When they were sick, you made them well. When they were homeless, you provided them shelter. When they could not read, you helped build their school. When they were without hope, you showed them how to help themselves. Care. National Aid and Development Organization. By helping one human being anywhere, you help mankind everywhere. People who need care need your help. Please send your dollars to CARE, Department 2, New York, 's assignment has him feeling as though he's chasing phantoms. He keeps reaching out to grab something tangible and ends up with empty hands. After ten days in Paris, he is as much in the dark about the narcotics racket 
as he was before he came. Kaladinos is probably deeply involved. But Kaladinos is untouchable. You can close the cell door, guard. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being so prompt, Inspector. I didn't think I could stand your Bastille for another ten minutes. Uh, Monsieur Nash, we have received a call from your bureau in New York asking us to come here and release you. How they knew you had been arrested is a mystery. I told them on the phone. You called from here? Uh, no, no. When I was making a call to my chief in New York from a booth in the Gare du Nord. I still do not understand. I knew I was in trouble after I hit that man that Colladinos sent. Colladinos? He is becoming, how you say, an obsession. You still don't believe he was the man? No. And I do not wish to continue this useless conversation. You have been released. You may leave. Good day. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Inspector. What happened to the man I hit? He was treated for his injuries and sent home. Hey, let him go. He is Colladinos, man. He's the one who cracked me over the head and took... Monsieur, I will not listen to more from you. I am three years from retirement, and I am not stupid to jeopardize my pension. What's your pension got to do with this? What indeed? I have told you that Monsieur Colladinos is very important, very powerful. You're afraid of him. I would not exactly say that. Well, I would exactly say it. I think he's the fat butterfly I came here to catch. And I'm going to net him with your help. Or without it. Monsieur Nash. Monsieur Nash. Here. Well, Mr. Colladinos, fancy meeting you here. May I give you a lift? No, oh, thank you. My head still aches when I remember my last ride in your rolls. <laughs> Get in. We're tying up traffic parking here. Come on, you're perfectly safe. Okay, okay. Good. Drive on, Andre. matter of fact, I was anxious to see you, Colladinos. Really? I am flattered. You wanted to say goodbye. Goodbye? Yes, because you are leaving Paris. Where did you get that information? I mean, how come I haven't heard? You will, monsieur. Uh, you will. And you are very lucky, you know. Go on. You are alive. Monsieur Nash, you have been walking in dangerous territory. And do you know why you have survived? Tell me. Because you have been completely ineffectual. Because you have discovered nothing in all the time you have been here. In fact, your superiors are of the opinion that you have wasted your time and your government's money. So I'm going home in disgrace. Friday afternoon. Flight 225 International. Suppose I decide to stay on until I've nailed you. That would be a very unfortunate decision. Learn to quit when you're ahead. You are ahead right now. Well, I want to thank you for everything. All the arrangements. Very neat. Very efficient. Thank you. And now I should like to drop you at your destination. My hotel? I was thinking, perhaps, that you would be going to the American Embassy. There to call your superior in New York, Chief Borden, and verify the information that I have given you. Borden here. Steve? Uh, right, Chief. I've been trying to reach you all day. I, uh... I haven't got good news for you. I know, I know. I'm coming home Friday. I'm sorry, Steve. I'm just following orders. Oh, don't bother to explain, Chief. Someone over here doesn't like me, that it? That's about it. Maybe because I'm getting close to something, beginning to press where it hurt. Well, if you want it straight, we got the info that you're having a big thing with a certain Miss Helene Freyne. Spending government bread on our fancy restaurants, things like that. Yeah, no mention of Orestes Colladinos in all the memos on me. No, not a thing. Marvelous. It's simply astounding how that overweight olive salesman can be everywhere at the same time. Wield influence strong enough to get our government to back down and still not show himself. 
Steve, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not fired yet, am I? No, not yet. <laughs> it's nice to know where you stand. I'm still employed until Friday. That gives me three and a half days. I'll do what I can for you, Steve. Thanks, Chief. I knew you'd say that. Now listen, call on me for anything I can do from here, any time of the day or night. Now here's my home number. Don't hesitate to call. It's 415-3132. Uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, I haven't got a pencil or a paper handy. Oh, just listen, just remember the name McCauley. M-C-H-O-L-L-Y. That's how I remember all telephone numbers. I convert them to names. Oh, you use the letters on a telephone dial instead of the numbers? Yeah, it's an old trick. You remember, Steve? <laughs> Can't forget. Macaulay. Okay, good luck, Steve. Steve, darling. Hi, Emily. Oh, come in. Come in, let's shut the door. Told you all day yesterday. I left messages. I was in jail. Jail? Yeah, I ran into the buzzard who hit me that night. Oh, that night? Yeah, I was making that overseas call in the Garda Nor when I noticed him getting into the booth next to mine. What a coincidence. Uh, that was no coincidence. Someone knew I was to be there at three o'clock and tipped him off. I hit him and the gendarme. Say, you've been packing. Uh, are you leaving Paris? Well, that's what I wanted to tell you. We're flying to New York on Friday. Friday? I'm going back on Friday, too. Flight uh, 225, International. You're kidding. Oh, that's our flight. Oh, Steve, that's wonderful. Oh, we'll have six whole hours together. <laughs> Speaking of coincidence... I'm beginning to wonder if it is really that or if someone isn't programming my whole life to suit his own wishes. I don't understand you. Uh, I'm just talking to myself. Uh, you're going to be a wee bit overweight, Elaine, all these boxes and... Packing crates, are they going with you? Oh, heavens, no. We'll just carry suitcases. This will all be sent by freight. Oh, I see. Ship via S.S. Andreas Bordeaux. Huh, is that a French ship, Elaine? Like? Well, I wouldn't know. Harrington made all the arrangements. Oh, speaking of your brother, uh, how's his little swindle going? I'm afraid that it's all been settled. He sold it, eh? Well, he seems to have a great deal of money on him. And Auntie's out shopping at the most expensive couturier in Paris. What about you, Elaine? I couldn't do it, Steve. Couldn't turn them in. Oh, the whole thing's a mess. I feel helpless. Well, take heart. They may get caught yet. Wait till they try to collect. Oh, Phyllis. Oh, I am exhausted. Utterly exhausted. One doesn't realize how tiring shopping for clothes can be. Oh. oh, hello. You're Mr. Uh, uh, Nash, uh, Mrs. Starr. Oh, of course, of course. Nash, Philip Nash. Now, where did we meet, young man? Right here, Phyllis. Not more than ten days ago. And his name is Stephen, not Philip. Oh, yes. And? And? And, <laughs> and he's the man I'm going to marry. If you'll have me. Will you, Steve? Will I? Darling, I thought you'd never ask. Hello? Chief, Steve. Uh, you know what time it is? Yes, 8 o'clock in the morning. Where you are here, it's just 2 o'clock in the morning. I just got to sleep an hour ago. I'm sorry, Chief. I had to call. It's urgent. Chief, I'm in Bordeaux. What the hell are you doing in Bordeaux? I'll explain it to you later. Just tell me this. You mentioned that Colodinos had varied business interests. Uh, one you mentioned in passing. Shipping? Yes, he has. He owns two ships, both under Liberian registry. He uses them mainly for his olive oil company. Would the name of one of them be the S.S. Andreas? Um, can't remember the names. The files are at the office. Well, I'll be in Paris in a few hours. Would you check and call me? You sound like you've latched on to something, Steve. I may have. I'll tell you about it when I see you. I'm flying home this afternoon, remember? Yeah. If I have anything, I'll have you to thank. Thanks for the tip, Macaulay. <laughs> I 
can't understand. I distinctly remember ordering all three tickets for first class. Now they tell me that we have two first and one tourist. Now don't get so worked up about it, Har. Huh? I suppose you expect me to sit in the tourist class seat? No, I shall. Being a martyr, Helene? No, nope. but I'll have more charming company in tourists than you, dear brother. Ah, here he comes now. Nash, that's right. Phyllis said he'd be on this flight. Steve, over here. I'm sorry I'm a little late. I had to wait for a call from New York. Hello, Harrington. Hello. Please excuse me. I've got to find Phyllis. She's buying perfume in the duty-free shops. She'll never know what time it is. Don't be too long. They'll be calling our flight any minute. Oh, Steve, I missed you. Where have you been for the last two days? Oh, a few things to wrap up before I left Paris. I wanted to take a look at a little more of the country. I may not be back for years, <laughs> if ever. Well, why didn't you tell me? I'd have gone with you. Madame Manzer, monsieur. Oh, Inspector Boivin. Come to see us off, monsieur? Not exactly. Uh, Mademoiselle, Madame Starro and Monsieur Harrington Frayne should also be present. Uh, they are here? They're here, Monsieur Boivin. My aunt is doing some last-minute shopping. Oh, uh, here they are. Oh, I've had the most glorious time, Elaine. Oh, Miss Nash and Monsieur Boivin. Well, I'm afraid I'm way, way over my quota. I have bought some big gallons and gallons. Pardon, and madame, the... but... Uh, we have very little time, and it is necessary that all your luggage be examined before you board. Be examined? At this end? We're going out, not coming in. I am sorry, monsieur. Regulations, if you will be so kind. Regulations? Since when? Tuesday this week. All luggage must be examined before departure. Ah, uh, red tape, bureaucratic red tape. If you'd stop arguing, we'd be through it in a matter of minutes. Quiet, Harrington. Now, Monsieur Boivin, where do we go? Please, be so kind as to follow me. Uh, you too, Monsieur Nash. Uh, through this door, please. Our bags are already on the plane. They were checked through. You will find that all your luggage is on that table, ready for examination. Now, the attendants will help you. But uh, we should like you to open your own luggage. Uh, who is first, dear? Uh, that's mine. Uh -huh. Open, please. Uh. Now let us look inside the case containing your articles of toilet, monsieur. Mm. Uh -huh. This is toothpaste. Is this necessary, monsieur? Must you remove and examine everything in the case? Uh, 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 patience, monsieur. I know what I am looking for. This uh, tube is most interesting. Regard, it has been opened at the bottom and sealed again. When one presses firmly on the tube, one discovers that there are unnatural lamps within. We shall see what they are. I take my pocket knife and... Uh, uh, there. These uh, are emeralds, wouldn't you say, madame? Yes, they are my emeralds. Now, would you be so kind as to give them to me? Uh, presently, madame. Uh, Monsieur Frayne, Madame Starrow, you are under arrest. On what charge? Oh, my nephew did not steal my jewels. I gave them to him for safekeeping. You reported a theft, madame. A false theft. A mistake. A misunderstanding. We have found the emeralds, and now we report them found. You are in a conspiracy to defraud the insurance company, madame. That is a crime. No? You will both come with me? You, Nash. You did this, snooping around. I knew he was some sort of a cop, Phyllis. You are clear, mademoiselle. The attendants will see that your luggage is placed aboard the plane. So you finally decided to do it, eh, Elaine? Yes. I discovered that the emeralds hadn't been sold yet. Also, that Phyllis hadn't reported the loss to the insurance company. I knew the charges couldn't be too severe and would probably be dismissed. Of course, they'll probably never forgive you. Oh, I think they will in time. And I'll have you to console me, Steve. <laughs> they'll be calling our plane now. Too bad Phyllis and Harrington's tickets won't be used. Oh, look, there's Boivin. Huh. 
He's alone. I guess he sent them off to the Bastille. I don't envy them their visit. My experience was pretty bad. Will Mademoiselle Elliot Gray come to information, please? Oh, you're being paged, Elaine. Will I can't imagine what it is. Will Mademoiselle Elliot Gray come to information, oh, please? Let's find out. Come on. You have a message for me? Oui, madame. Elliot Gray? Yes. Ah, oui. oui. I have it here. Thank you. Merci. Well, what is it, Elaine? You look worried. Um, nothing. Nothing, Steve. I, I, I just got to make a telephone call that I neglected to... Uh, oh, oh, there's a booth over there. And you want me to come with you? No, no. Wait for me here. E L M O R E Why? Yes? This is Elaine. I'm at the airport. I got your message. What message? The message of information. I was paged. What message? The usual. Call El Moray. You fool. You little fool. I sent no message. You've been trapped. You are caught. And so am I. They will be waiting when you come out of the booth. You have involved me, you stupid fool. Thank your American lover for this. You are under arrest, mademoiselle. Would you be so kind as to accompany me? Yes. Monsieur Nash, I leave the prisoner in your custody. Your plane is already boarding. You do not have much time. Thanks, Inspector. Steve, I... Don't cry. It can't change matters. Steve, I won't try to defend myself. You were planted on the plane I came over on, weren't you? Yes. This whole business of the stolen emerald was a diversionary move, eh? Harrington and Phyllis would be caught and the police satisfied with the capture. This would allow you to slip through? Yes. It's true. It's all true. We were the clearinghouse... The crates we sent to Bordeaux. I know, I know. Narcotics. The ship SS Andreas belongs to Coladinas. I checked it out. Sailed yesterday for New York. One dozen gallon tins in the cargo contain heroin. Not olive oil. They'll be found when the ship docks in New York. I've wired ahead. I'm sure you have. Oh, this has all been a performance. A charming charade to throw dust in my eyes. No. No, that isn't entirely true. Come on, Elaine. It started that way, I admit. Please believe me. I love you. Mademoiselle? Yes, I'm ready. Goodbye, Stephen. Steve stood there and silently watched the woman he had just begun to love being led away by the French police. For long minutes after she disappeared through the main doors, he stood there without moving. Finally, with an effort, he responded to the last boarding call for flight 225. I'll be back shortly. Oh, sure. You can talk about good-tasting diet drinks, but I know. I'm Goldilocks, and here at my taste-testing laboratory, I taste-test them all. And nobody's been drinking my diet drinks until I tested sugar-free Diet 7-Up. And then, kabloomy, every bear wanted some. Diet 7-Up is fresh, natural, delicious. Sugar-free Diet 7-Up. This one's just right. Pollution, crime, substandard housing. Law Day, May 1st, reminds us that if we don't like these conditions, our system allows us to do something about it. Through involvement, like helping to register voters, campaigning, and voting, we all can help bring about change lawfully. With nearly half the population under 25, Law Day urges young America to lead the way. A public service message of the American Bar Association and your state and local bar associations. Steve Nash got off the plane in New York. 
his chief was waiting to congratulate him. But all the praise and promises of a promotion couldn't wipe out the last look on Helene's face. He knew it would stay with him forever. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Suzanne Grossman, Ruth Warwick, George Petrie, Leon Janney, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Jenny, that stone ain't gold. Then what is it? It's pyrite. What's pyrite? Oh, it's just what everybody calls... Well, it... Uh, it it's a sort of metal. Well, anyways, whatever it is, it's real precious to me. It's my lucky charm. Well, that's why you better not let Pa know what you think about it. Why? Well, you know what he's like. He, he cares about gambling more than he cares about anything, and all gamblers are real superstitious. Now, if he knew you had a lucky piece, especially if he heard the crazy story about you and the school burning down, he'd have it off of you so fast that it'd set your head to spinning. It isn't crazy. You heard me wish on the stone for no school, and now there is no school. That was just happenstance. You don't think it happened just because I wished it? Of course it didn't. Then I'm going to prove it to you. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... HRLD, the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense, to the fear you can hear. Relax and listen to the strange tale of a strange man, though no more strange than anyone who has suffered what you might call a mutilation of the soul. And who of us has not, at one time or another, suffered such a mutilation? What means did we use to restore ourselves? How quickly did we recover? How well did we heal? The answers vary even as we vary. One man's answers are revealed, we trust, in the story which follows. I'm cold. So am I. It's the darkness I mind the most, not to be able to see you. Oh, touch me. That would help. Oh, my God, where are you? Right here. Right here. I can't find you. Keep... Talking, keep talking. Uh, here, here, here. I can't. Here. Uh, oh. Oh, here you are. Oh, darling, don't let go. Never. Oh, never. Never. Our mystery drama, The Deadly Hour, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In 1919, someone had a big idea. Let's help youth understand big business by starting them in small businesses of their own. And Junior Achievement was born. Each group elected a board of directors, chose a product, set up a production line, sold stock, and went into business. That year, 314 students made and sold products and learned the business of business. Today, Junior Achievement has grown to nearly 200,000 members. Junior Achievers are designing and marketing their own products and services, from cutting boards to printing. They're organizing sales efforts, writing marketing plans, calculating profit and loss. Running these small businesses helps Junior Achievers understand how big business works. Support Junior Achievement. 
where youth learns the business of business. Call your local junior achievement office. Hello. Hello, Mrs. Ken Driggs of Salt Lake City, Utah. Yes? Mrs. Driggs, my name is Ted Brown, and I'm calling for Campbell's Soup. And we're calling ladies in the Salt Lake City area asking if they'd like to sing the Campbell's Soup jingle. <laughs> Come on, you're kidding. No, honest, I'm not. And if you sing the Campbell's Soup jingle for me, why, I'd love to send you a case of Campbell's tomato soup. All right, but if I sing it and you don't send it, I'll be awfully disappointed. Well, you just sing it and you see. Okay, it goes, mmm, good, mmm, good. That's what Campbell's soups are, mmm, good. That was just marvelous, really. And we're going to send you a case of Campbell's tomato soup. <laughs> are you kidding? I'm not kidding. How cold does it get in Salt Lake City, by the way? Below zero sometimes. But if you like skiing, you don't mind. Uh huh. When it does get cold, good hot Campbell's soup warms you up. Yeah, that's right. Now you enjoy yourself, you hear? All right. Bye bye. Bye. The preceding recorded message was selected from random phone calls. A person who seems strange. We call grotesque, incredible, not to be believed. We make a feeble effort to deny that he could exist. But he does exist. There he is before our eyes in all his strangeness. We do not believe in him because we do not know him. Because once we know, we will have to believe. And this can be a long and painful process. Listen now to the story of Martin Jerome. See if you can believe it. Mr. Jerome, I only consented to see you because your letter sounded quite desperate. As a rule, I only see patients on referral. But your letter, may I read it to you? Perhaps it will help us to get started. Last night, I heard you being interviewed on a radio program. In the dark of my room, in the darkest hour of the night, I thought... Here is a man who can help me to solve the awful predicament in which I find myself. I enclose a stamped addressed envelope for your reply since I have no phone. I am counting on you. Sincerely, Martin C. Jerome. Well, Mr. Jerome, uh, the hour is passing, and I don't want you to waste your money. Take your time. Take your time if you have difficulty in talking. I'll wait. Doctor. Did you say something, Mr. Jerome? Doctor, you... Yes. You are the first person I have spoken to in 25 years. You said 25 years? Yes. I begin to understand your silence. Can you tell me what drove you into this silence? I... I married a woman. Yes. The... the most desirable woman in the world. My Helen. My adored one. I never thought that an insignificant man like myself could even aspire to possess such a woman. And the day she said those words to me, I could scarcely believe my ears. You're a dear, Martin, and I'd love to marry you. Helen, I... I can't think why you'd want a man like me. Oh, because you're sweet. Let's get married right away. What about next week? The world changed completely for me. Everything became important, immediate. The sun shone just to keep me warm, and the breeze blew to make me cool. Me, Martin Jerome, me. I had been so, so blessed... Yes, it was a beautiful wedding. Helen had a great deal of money, and I was fairly well off. Many people came to the church, and even more to the reception. People of prominence. I knew them all. All but one. He was tall. Unusually tall. As I am unusually short. He was handsome. As I am not. He was charming, self-assured, very much at his ease... All of which I have never been. You couldn't help noticing him. Helen, 
Who's that very tall man talking to your mother? The pale man with the black mustache? I have no notion, love. It's probably someone mother invited. Good looking, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Sort of. Come on. Time to cut the cake. We sailed for Europe. My head was swimming with visions of the life I had embarked on. The good life, the beautiful life. One night on the ship, we were at dinner. Helen, look over there, to your right against the wall, sitting by himself. Isn't that the man who was at our wedding? Five hundred people were at our wedding, love. He's getting up from the table. The tall man, black mustache. <laughs> your mother must have invited him, you said. Well, then I guess she did. After dinner, we danced for a while. Then Helen said she had a headache, but I should stay and enjoy myself. Well, I, I tried, but I couldn't enjoy myself without her. I was too much in love for that. I watched the dancers for a while, drank a brandy. I managed to kill an hour, and then I went down to our stateroom. Helen wasn't there. When I stepped back out into the corridor, there she was, coming out of another stateroom about six doors from ours. Darling! You, you weren't in our room. I didn't know what to think. You said that you had a headache. I've been doing a little detective work. You were so anxious to know who the tall man was. Well, I found out. He's not precisely a friend. His mother came to the wedding and dragged him along. Helen, you were in his stateroom. Mm, I ran into him in the corridor, and he said to come in for a nightcap. <sighs> Let's go to bed. Our stateroom is much nicer than his, by the way. <laughs> we went to Paris. And then because she loved to ski, we went to St. Moritz. She was very good on skis, effortless as a bird flying. I watched and watched and never got tired of watching. And then one day, there he was again, the tall man. I've got to catch the ski tail. Wait for me. Helen. Helen, he's here. Who's here? The Emma? man from the wedding, the man from the ship. Oh, is he here? Oh, so he is. Well, I'm off. Wait for me. After San Moritz, we came back to the city and moved into an apartment. I went to work. We made friends. Helen grew lovelier every day. And she was her loveliest the day she told me that we would have a child. Tell me about that. Well, Helen was very, very lighthearted, very casual about the prospect, but I, I... Yes. How did you feel? Well, it's, it's hard to tell you, Doctor. Oh, I know every man is... Is what? Excited? Happy? I don't know, but... I, I felt bowed down, Doctor. Actually crushed by my own good fortune. That a man like myself, so petty, so pitiable, should be given a child by a woman like Helen. Have you always thought of yourself as petty and pitiable? I have. Why? Because I am. Go on, please. I could scarcely concentrate on my work once I'd heard the good news. Helen was on my mind all the time. And one day, I, I suddenly couldn't bear being in the office. Couldn't bear being anywhere except where she was. And I rushed home. I, I suppose you know what I found. I think you'd best tell me. I, I hurried to the bedroom, looking for her. I burst through the door. And in the bed, our bed, there he was. The man from the wedding. From the wedding, from the ship, from the ski tow. He, he looked at me. Standing in the doorway. He said not a word, but his red lips smiled. And then... Well, then the bathroom door opened. And Helen took a step into the room. Helen. All scrubbed and fragrant. She was wearing something pink. I think it was made of lace. And she... Doctor, she smiled too. While I stood in the doorway, she smiled. And then she said... Well, love... Now you know. And the world rocked, and I felt as though I had died, but I hadn't. I was still standing there. Doctor, I've never... I've never told what I just told you to anyone before. Not to anyone? No. It wasn't simply grief that I felt. It... It was my pride that had been destroyed. My marriage to Helen had built up a sort of pride. I thought, if she loves me, then I must be something. Oh, it's not a good thing, Doctor, to build your pride on what other people think of you. Or seem to think. No, 
No, it isn't. So I cleared out. That was 25 years ago. And I have not said a word to anyone until today. How have you lived? Well, I, I had a business, import and export. I kept the business, but I dismissed my staff. I had the phone removed and made arrangements to conduct my affairs by mail. I took a one-room flat with a little kitchen, a bed, a chest of drawers, an easy chair with an ottoman. And to one side of the chair, my hi-fi stereo set and my records. To the other side, my books. After my work, I'd sit in my easy chair with my feet on the ottoman, listen to my records and read. Only writers who are dead, however. I'd read till about 10 o'clock, eat a little something and go to bed. The next morning, go to work. Work all day and do the same thing all over again. No relaxation of any kind? No enjoyment? Well, vacation in the summer. I shut down the office for two weeks and take my vacation. Where do you go? I... I take a train. Uh, two trains, actually, and a bus to a little town on the coast called Marsh Hills. You've probably never heard of it. I'm afraid I haven't. No one has. And there's no reason why anyone should. And you spend your two weeks in Marsh Hills? Oh, no. No, I, I merely stable my horse there. You have a horse? About 15 miles from Marsh Hills, Doctor, close to the sea. There's a cave hollowed out of the rock by the waves. And when I get to Marsh Hills, I arrive every year on the same day. They, they have my horse ready for me, and I, I ride the 15 miles to the cave, and there I spend my vacation. In a cave? For two weeks? But I walk. I canter my horse on the beach. I gather what edible herbs there are growing in the rocks. I, I, I boil them. They're very tasty, really. And at the end of two weeks, I return my horse to the stable and take my bus and the two trains back to the city. And you've lived this way for 25 years. Oh, yes. But, uh, Doctor, last summer... Uh, last summer, something happened. I arrived in Marsh Hills, as always. My horse was waiting for me, as always. And we started off at a walk for the cave by the sea. There is always a certain excitement when I begin to smell the sea. And I know that soon I shall be out of sight and sound of any human being. There will be only the sea, the sun, the wind, and my cave. It is the most thrilling moment of the year for me. I suppose it's the only one. Soon I will have my solitude. At last, I'm on the sand. My horse feels the excitement as I do. I feel him extend himself. And as we round the last bend in the shoreline, I see it. I see it, my cave, my refuge. But, but last summer... Yes? I, I pulled my horse up at the entrance to the cave. I sat listening to the rhythms of the ocean. And then, all at once... <laughs> I heard a sound, a sound that I've never heard before in that deserted spot. And the sound, Doctor, was coming from inside my cave. Never, never had I felt such anger. I was faint with hatred. I dismounted and I crept to the side of the cave where I knew it sloped to the ground. Quietly climbed the roof. I found a tiny chink in the stone, no more than an eighth of an inch wide. But I put my ear to it. Beneath me, I heard laughter. <laughs> laughter and tender words and all the sticky, silly sounds that lovers make. Are you my girl? Oh, so much, your girl. Ah, uh, how much? This much. I can't hardly see how much is this much. <laughs> it's too dark in this place. Then come here. Oh, oh darling. Darling love. They were kissing. They were using my sacred sanctuary for lovemaking. I almost fell from the roof of the cave. I struggled to stay where I was, and my feet dislodged a shower of stones. What was that? Sounds like a rock slot. Yes, yeah, some, some rocks in front of the entrance. Lots of them. Hey, you, maybe we'd better move them. Oh, we can still get out. Let's... Stay a little longer. I love this place. All right. I climbed down. My brain was on fire. My whole body was on fire. 
I had never felt such hatred as I felt then. Not since... Well, Doctor, you know when I've told you. I took hold of a big boulder. Yes, yes, these skinny arms went round it. This puny body pushed it. Pushed and shoved till it stood against the mouth of the cave. Was tight against the mouth of the cave. I heard the voices of the lovers fainter now from inside. George, it's really dark. Darker than before. Aaron, there's there's no light at all. I had sealed them in. What is darkness? It is the state from which we emerge, and it is the condition to which we return. We come from the darkness of the womb, we leave for the darkness of the tomb. In between is light and life. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Some research experts say you can't taste the difference between beers. Well, if they're right, then Anheuser-Busch wastes a barrel of time Beechwood aging Budweiser. Only they don't think so. Brewing beer right does make a difference. And they're betting a bundle that you can taste the difference in Bud. When it comes to brewing Budweiser, the Anheuser-Busch choice is to go all the way because they still care about quality. this way. If the Bud people have a choice between what some experts say and what beer drinkers say, well, you'd better believe they'll go with you beer drinkers every time. When you say Budweiser, you said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. I love you. I love you. 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 That's why Hallmark makes over a thousand different kinds of Valentines to get everybody's message across on Valentine's Day. I love you. Let Hallmark say you care enough to send the very best on Valentine's Day, Thursday, February 14th. That's Thursday the 14th. Marvin Jerome, 50 years old, has not uttered a single word to a living soul in 25 years. But now in the office of an attentive psychiatrist, it seems the dear man can't stop talking. After I had pushed and shoved the big rock into the entrance to the cave, Doctor, I stood for a few seconds, panting from the exertion and oppressed by the silence. There was only the sound of the wind in the water. I thought of the lovers locked inside. What were they doing? What were they saying? I felt that I must hear their voices again, as though their words which had driven me near to madness were essential now to keep me sane. I scrambled back to the roof of the cave and put my ear once again to the narrow crack through which I could hear them. George, huh? there was a little light before, now there's none. More rocks must have fallen. I didn't hear them. I heard something that didn't sound like rocks falling. Oh, come on, we, we've got to clear the entrance. Come where? I don't know where the entrance is anymore. It's so dark. Well, take my hand. I, I, I think I know which direction. I can't even see your hand. Don't you have a match? I, I, I may have. Or, yeah, yeah I, I have a few. The light one. I, I will, I will. Oh, Went out. Amanda, don't panic. Don't panic. Like another. We've got to get out of here. Just, just don't panic. All right, now, careful. Be careful. I am. I am being careful. Oh, oh, but darling. Huh? Now, I found the one that went out. It was right by my foot. Let me light it from yours. Yeah, good, good girl. Good girl. All right, George. That, that, there's the entrance. Don't let your match go out. Don't you let yours. Hey, look. See? Just a whole bunch of stones. Come on. Let's start clearing them away. Oh, both matches went out. That's all right. We, we know where we are. We're right by the entrance. Come on, let's get started. 
George. What, darling? We'll get out, won't we? Of course, of course we'll get out. Now, keep working. Don't stop. At my listening post atop the cave, I heard them so kindly toward each other, so reassuring, so united in their purpose. I pressed my ear closer to the crack in the cave's roof. I was frantic to hear every word. George, it isn't getting any lighter. Shouldn't it start to get lighter? Yes, it should. Oh, why doesn't it? How should I know why? I'm, I'm sorry, darling. Oh, that's all right. Marion. What, darling? We, we've cleared all the stones away. But there's no light. No. None. Why not? Why is it there? Because there's, there's something huge, a, a, a big boulder, I, I, I think, up against the entrance. Oh, move it, move it. I will. It, it's heavy. It must be huge. Well, how did it get there? It fell from someplace, Lord knows where. Can't you move it? I'm trying. Let me help. Put your shoulder up against it. That's what I'm doing. Can't you see? No, I can't see. Do you think I could? Can you see? I'm... I'm sorry. Forgive me. All right, let's try together now. One, two, three. Jump! Uh, uh, I don't think we moved it at all. No, no. Uh, Not a centimeter. Darling, uh, you know what the trouble is? Uh, We're tired, that's all. Clearing away all the stones just took our strength. You haven't had anything to eat since this morning. We need to rest for a little while. Then we'll be able to move it. Oh, you're probably right. So let's... Let's lie down right here by the entrance so we know where we are. First, I want to light a match. Why do you want to do that? I want to look at your face. Oh. <laughs> light. This is the face I love. This is the face I love. It's dark again. No matter. When we wake up, we'll find our way into the light. Sleep now, my darling. The thought of them lying there. No, the vision of them, for I could see them. The image was so strong. The two of them pressed close. Their arms entwined. Their hands clasped. The two young bodies fitted so tightly together against the dark and the cold. The nameless memory crowded in on me. And I knew. I knew what it was I remembered and would not name. And it was... It was... Love. Love. It was love that I remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Doctor. For what? For, for crying like this. If there is anything to be sorry for, it's that it took you so long to cry. All I really know is that when that word came into my head... What word? The word, the word, the word love. I shrank from it as though it was tainted. Poison. Yes. And then? And then? Oh, then... Then, Doctor, I, I, I climbed down. I got on my horse and rode back to Marsh Hills. I took the bus and the two trains back to the city. You what? I opened up my office. I took the dust covers off the furniture in my flat, and I resumed my old routine. Didn't you... Didn't you ever think of... of them? I'd shut them out of my mind, just as I'd shut them in the cave. You didn't worry about them, or... Or anything? Well, they had each other. Mr. Jerome, I have to tell you, I'm... I can't help being shocked. Forgive me. Go on. Well, after a while, the old feeling of loneliness came back. You see, I... I missed them. Missed them? Yes, it may sound strange. Indeed it does. I began imagining what they might be saying to each other. I couldn't know for sure, of course, but I imagined. I'm cold. Uh, so am I. I'm hungry. 
I, I, I can't find you. Keep talking. Keep I'm talking. I'm here. I'm here. I, I can't. Oh, oh, oh. oh, there you are. Oh, darling, don't let go. Oh, never. Never. I invented their conversations, of course. But I was fairly sure my inventions were accurate, or, or nearly so. You simply left them there mm. for two weeks. And then I was suddenly seized with the desire to hear their voices once more before, well, before they were silent forever. I closed the office, closed the flat, took the two trains and the bus to Marsh Hills. And they were surprised at the stable to see me back again so soon, of course, but they saddled my horse and I set off for the cave. The old excitement came back when I started to smell the salt air. There was the familiar thrill which I had looked forward to each summer for 25 years till they had invaded my kingdom by the sea. Such a tiny kingdom, a cave no bigger than a tool shed, with no comforts, no conveniences, and they had taken it away from me. Ah, on the sand at last, we run the last bend. And I see it. My cave. My refuge. And even from a distance, I can see that the big boulder still stands wedged into the entrance. What did you do then, Mr. Jerome? I, uh, I dismounted. I climbed to the roof of the cave. After all, I had made the long and rather arduous trip to hear their voices once more. If I could... I... I crouched down. I put my ear to the narrow crack. And... Were they still alive? Oh, yes. Yes. Weak, of course, but... Alive. Oh, yes. They were still alive. Are you all right, George? Yes. Are you? I'm all right. If we only had something to eat... Anything. <laughs> Don't think about it. You think there's any use trying to move that big rock again? No. I guess you're right. Well, we've got about a third of the energy we had to start with. We... Better save whatever we've got. Save it for what, George? I don't know. I know. For when somebody finds us. It's possible, isn't it, for somebody to find us? Of course. Oh, George, I'm thirsty. Can you find the place where that trickle of water runs down the side? I think so. Feel along the cave wall to your right. But it's so, so black in here. You, you should be there by now. Light the match. No, it's the only one we have. George... Wasn't there a sort of a, a ridge, a, an indentation where the water trickled down in some moss? That's right. And I... I think I found it. Oh, good. There's no water. There must be. There isn't. Then you're in the wrong place. Then you find it. You're so smart. I know exactly where. It's about here. I remember this. It ought to be right here. Yes, I... it ought to be, but it isn't. It ought to be, but it isn't. Marion, Marion, shh, shh, shh. There's no food. Now there's no water. <laughs> Doctor, I wanted to call to them. I wanted to say, wait for rain. Because as soon as a good rain came, the water would start to trickle down the cave wall again. But I couldn't speak. I don't know why I, I couldn't. Do you? I have some notion, yes. Why couldn't I? I'd rather you told me the rest of the story first. All, all right, Doctor, if you say so. Well, they must have gone to sleep after that. I think they probably slept a lot. I, I know that I didn't hear anything more after that until much later. I wonder what day it is. Well... It was Saturday when we came down here, wasn't it? Yes. Well, it must be, uh... uh I, don't, I, I, I don't know. 
We've been here a week, I think. Uh, more than that. Much more? About a week and a half. Oh. You think it's Wednesday? Or... I... Yeah, I, I, I think so. If it's Wednesday, then we've been here 11 days. Something like that. What difference does it make? I'd just like to know, that's all. Oh, don't be angry, darling. Doctor, I have the craziest impulse to whisper to them. It's Tuesday. I almost laughed. Why do these ludicrous ideas come into our heads at the weirdest moments of our lives? Perhaps it wasn't as ludicrous as you thought. Of course it was. I was there to watch these people die. Listen to them die is more like it. And I still wanted to tell them what day of the week it was. If that's not ludicrous, I don't know what is. Tell me, what happened next? I went to sleep on the roof of the cave. After the sun came up in the morning, I got a sandwich out of my saddlebag and a flask of brandy and sat on the sand for a while, watching the ocean. And then I went back to my listening post. George. Yes? I'm going to try walking around a little. Oh, Lord. This darkness is driving me mad. No, it's not. No, it's not. Let me have a match. No. Oh, give it to me. I won't. What was that? I heard something. I stumbled over something. Well, look, 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 look for it. The fish That's around. That's what I'm doing. Got it. Well, what is it? Uh, feels like a little sort of a pan. Pan? Oh. It, well, about four, five inches wide. What? Enamel, I think. Feels like enamel. It's a little pan to cook things in, the sort of thing campers might use. Wait, wait, that, that, that means somebody's been here before. And that means... Whoever was here could come back. Or somebody else could. I, I, I mean, this cave is a place people come to. We're, we're not the only ones. We're not the first. Other people have... They'd stumbled across the little enamel pan I had used to boil my herbs in. I couldn't bring myself to speak to them, but I took a packet of matches, the cardboard kind, and I wrote on it, I am here. Just that. I am here. And... And I slipped it through the crack in the roof of the cave. Three little words. I am here. I suppose the most cherished trio of words in our language consists of I love you. But surely there are times of trouble when I am here is even more welcome. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. And now another tale of the ball and chain. At Kellogg's Special K presents... Presents Last Tango in Pittsburgh. There I was at Raoul's All Right Tango Lounge. My little orchid, will you tango with me? It was Raoul. Mm, you're a splendid dancer. Thank you. But what was that? I was what? That sound effect. Oh, I'm a few pounds overweight, and this ball and chain points out how my extra weight can get in the way. I'm pointing you back to your chair. Our heroine decided to lose that extra weight. She exercised and ate smart at every meal, starting with a special K breakfast, a bowl of special K skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's less than 240 calories, 99% fat-free, and 100% delicious. After a while, she was rid of the ball and chain and back at Rose. Darling, you're looking fantastic. What a happy ending. What an ending? We're just getting started. Well, hmm? get lost. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. And that's another tale of the ball and chain. Give your head to a friend. Give your heart to your heart. Give your cold. <laughs> contact the sooner the better. Hey, I'm back. How's that cold? Rotten. Get the contact? I got everything. Contact, cold tablets, and this liquid. Oh, no. Honey, it's all cold medicine. Well, sure, but it only takes one contact for up to 12 hours, continuous relief from sneezing, drips, congestion. For that, I'd need six of your cold tablets. Two every four hours. Or three ounces of nighttime liquid. One every four hours. Or just one contact. The tiny time pills do it. 
Well, it's all cold medicine. Those others contain antipyretic analgesics, the liquid antitussive and alcohol. They're not in contact. Six or three or one. I choose the one contact. Me too. And I'm the one with the cold. Get cold. The contact, the sooner the better. Six or three or one. When you catch a cold, take contact. Only as directed. It is the disease of not listening the malady of not marking that I am troubled with all. So said Henry IV, according to William Shakespeare. But the disease that troubles Martin Jerome is listening too closely, and his malady is marking too well. I pushed the packet of matches with its absurd message down through the crack in the cave with a little stick. I heard it drop. I knew it had reached them, even before I heard Marion speak. George. Huh? Something just dropped onto my shoulder. George, light the match. Marion, it's our last match. I don't care, light it. I have to know what fell on my shoulder. I, I, I don't like to use George, up our last... George, please, if you don't... I'll... All, all right, all, all, all right. T take it, take it easy. Did you see anything? It hit my shoulder, and then it... Here it is. George! Well, it's matches. It's a whole fold... You're kidding. I'm not. There's something written on it here, Joe. Wait a minute. It says, I am here. Who? Who, who is, who's here? I don't know. I, I, oh, my God. That's the end of the match. I held it till I burned my fingers. I'm sorry. I couldn't. <laughs> All right. What? We have matches now. Can you see? It, it, it isn't signed at all. It just no. says, I am here. The, that's all. But who? Who? Who's here? Who? Doesn't matter, does it? But somebody's here. That, 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 that's what counts. But why doesn't he say something? Call out to us or something. Tell us that everything will be all right. Maybe. Maybe he's going for help. Oh, yes, that must be it. Yes, that, that, that is it. it it's, it's all right now. It, it's all right as, as long as somebody's here. I couldn't stand their joy over my simple-minded message. They seemed like silly children, as silly as I felt myself. For I hadn't the faintest notion what I was going to do once I had made this strange contact with them. I climbed down and sat on the beach staring at the water until I fell asleep. I must have slept the rest of that day and all night because it was the sun coming up behind the horizon that woke me. I went back to the cave climbed to the roof and put my ear to the crack. George, I can't stand it. Where is he? How should I know? Stop asking me. He wouldn't give us a message like that. He wouldn't write, I'm here on a package of matches and then just go away, would he? How do I know? You keep asking me as though I had an answer. Oh, I'm not hungry anymore. I haven't been hungry for a long time. I just feel terribly weak. Damn it, I know. I know. Now, will you shut up? Just shut up. We'll die here, George. Be quiet. No water. No food. We'll die here. I said shut up. Whoever wrote that note must have been a madman. Wherever he was, wherever he was, he's gone away. Yes. And we'll die in this cave. <laughs> I don't intend to die in this cave. Oh. <laughs> and just what do you think you'll do about it? Something. N nothing you can do. I'm just not going to die. Yes. Not yet. Yes. You are. Make up your mind to it. What are you doing now? I'm going to light a match. No food, no water, just matches. George, what? I'm not going to die. Not yet. Not me. George! Not me. I felt as though the world had stopped. Actually, 
I had stopped. All at once, I knew what I must do. Must do. I didn't want to go completely out of my mind. I clambered down from the roof. I ran to the cave entrance. I tried to move the big boulder that blocked it. I knew even before I tried that I wouldn't be able to do it. But my mind was working brilliantly. I ran to where my horse's saddle and bridle lay on the sand. And after taking it all apart, I began working to put it together again for a new purpose. Oh, I used everything. The girth, the reins, the stirrup leathers. And in an hour, I had fashioned a crude device. I led my horse to the cave entrance. Somehow, I wrapped the girth around the boulder and made it firm. The rain circled my horse's shoulders. And then I stood back and gave him a sharp rap on the flank. He moved. And the boulder moved. The boulder moved away from the entrance to the cave. There was room for me to squeeze through. Just inside, I found them. She lay there in a faint. He lay across her. And his teeth... His teeth were sunk in her breast. (laughs) Mr. Jerome, would you like to... Wait till another time to tell me. That. No, no, no. I, I must. I must tell it to you now. I, I, I carried their bodies out and I put them on the back of my horse. I, I threw a halter over his head and led him the fifteen miles to Marsh Hills. It took all day because I stopped every hour to be sure that they were both breathing. There's a doctor in Marsh Hills, and I, I left them on his doorstep. I, I rang his bell and fled. The next day, I waited outside the doctor's house until I saw an ambulance drive up and take the young couple away. They were able to walk, so I I knew they were all right, or or soon would be. I I went back to the city, but not before I had memorized the name of the hospital, which was printed on the ambulance. And from the city, I wrote to the hospital. I, I pretended to be a concerned relative. They answered me. They said that the girl, Marion, had already been discharged, but that they were keeping the young man for a few days more. They would let me know when he could go home. And they did let me know. I remember it was uh, was on a Sunday. And as he walked out of the hospital, I I was waiting for him. He didn't seem at all surprised to see me. I I I took his hand. He came with me quietly. Uh, We boarded the bus. We took the two trains, no trouble at all. And when we got to the city, we... um, We uh, went to my flat. Uh, He undressed, bathed, and got into my bed. And and he went to sleep. That was, uh, oh, six months ago, Doctor. And he's been there with me ever since. He's... He's all right. Oh, he's very well. Uh, I sleep on the floor now. Uh, He sleeps in the bed. I cook his breakfast, come home from the office and cook his lunch. And, of course, I I make dinner for us both at night. And, uh, oh, we listen to music. I read a book, but he, well, he, um, just listens to the music. Oh, yes, yes, he's in in good health. Mr. Jerome, uh, the hour is up. You want me to leave? Not quite yet. You've told me an amazing story. As amazing a story as I've ever heard. But tell me, just what is it you expect of me? What do you want me to do for you? Huh? Oh, why? Why, nothing, Doctor. Nothing? Nothing at all? I I don't want help for myself, Doctor. I, I want help for the young man. You see, in the six months he's been staying with me... He hasn't uttered a word. Not one word. Go see the doctor, young man. Yes, George. He can help you to unburden yourself. He will make the words pour out in full confession and you'll feel the better for it. Why, look. Look what he has just done for Martin Jerome. As the deadly hour passed. I'll be back shortly. 
young I may be, but still I'm a man. Just turned 18 and I'll do what I can to find me a place where I can be me. Get ready for life and be free as the sea. Where do I go from here? Oh, where do I go from here? I finished the school, but what lies ahead? Don't want to get trapped, want to feel free. About the new Navy. You'll get your chance at success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll free 800 841 8000. That's 800 841 8000. Or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in the new Navy. I know where I'm going from here. Seven Wonders of the World, the Grand Canyon, the Taj Mahal, Niagara Falls, uh, and I forget the other four. No matter. Because they are simple things compared to the human mind in all its deviousness, all its twists and drifts. Why, I could sit in wonder at the human mind for the rest of my life. Our cast included Norman Rose, Marion Seldes, John Barragray, and Jack Grimes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. That's impossible. Why is it impossible? It's all right for the simple-minded hicks up here to swallow that superstitious nonsense, but me, I'm a doctor. There has to be a reasonable, logical, rational explanation for what happened to George Morrissey. Oh, there is, there is. He offended the spirit of the mountain. Oh, you consider that reasonable, logical, rational? Would you feel better if I said there's something up in that mountain, a virus, a bacillus, a fungus, which somehow causes immediate aging? It would be a more rational explanation. <laughs> you mean more acceptable. I want to know what you believe. I believe the evidence. If you go up there, you can die. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. recorded message was selected from random phone calls. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sounds of suspense, to the fear you can hear, to the terrifying world of the imagination. I'm your guide for a journey up a mysterious mountain. Dead Man's Mountain is what it's called. Going is really no problem. It's coming down that separates the living from the dead. Doctor, a man simply cannot age 40 years in one night. I wish I knew what to tell you, Mr. Johnson. I saw George last evening at dinner. He was 35. This morning, he's close to 80. But how could that happen? He went where he had no business going. Up Dead Man's Mountain. Is there some kind of disease up there? Some germ? Some virus that can age a man? None that is known to science. Then how do you account for it? Probably the Indian legend is correct. Some 
evil spirit up there hates to be disturbed. Our mystery drama, Dead Man's Mountain, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Alan Hewitt. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. Hi, son. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Junior. Kellogg's Special K presents Junior Gives Up. Junior, why aren't you eating your Special K? It's your favorite cereal. Oh, just because. Just because why, honey? Just because Darla said some evil things about it. That's just because why. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Hi Darla. Darla. Hi, sis. Hi, Junior. Uh, Darla, what did you tell Junior about his Special K? Daddy, all I told him was that Special K is good for her. Yeah, and anything that's good for me never seems to taste good. But, Junior, you already know that Special K tastes good. Who do I believe? Darla or my taste buds? Uh, what's that, son? Oh, nothing, Dad. Son, Special K is America's favorite high-protein cereal. It's got minerals, vitamins, iron, and all those good, nutritious things. But it got to be so popular over the years because it tastes good, too. You mean it's good for me and tastes good, too. Right, son. Right, Dad. Right, Junior. Right, Mom. Right, Right, indeed. Start your balanced breakfast with Kellogg's Special K. It's nutritious and delicious. Right, Dad. When occasional heartburn or acid indigestion is combined with a gassy, foolish feeling, that's what we call gassed indigestion. Digel is made for gassed indigestion because Digel is different. It does more than plain antacids. Digel reduces excess acid while its patented cymethicone gets rid of trapped gas fast. Use only as directed. Digel for gassed indigestion. No plain antacid can do what Digel can. Was I embarrassed? Even though I used an adhesive on my dentures, they still came loose during dinner. And when I had to be... This denture wearer should change to Cushion Grip, a soft, pliable, thermoplastic adhesive that even hot or cold liquids can't dissolve. That's why Cushion Grip lasts and holds dentures much longer than ordinary powder, paste, or cream adhesives you often must apply two or three times daily. For new long-lasting security, new comfort, change to Cushion Grip. R.J. Johnson sits at his desk. Yes, the R.J. Johnson. The mysterious, the remote R.J. Johnson. I'd better explain that. His ways are mysterious, except when his plans include you. He is remote, except when he wants something from you. Then his presence can become an overwhelming reality. Some say R.J. is the richest man in the world. Some say he's the second, the third, the fourth richest. Does it matter? All we need to know is that on this particular morning, R.J. Johnson sits at his desk, as usual, and is formulating plans to buy or sell what? An industry? A government? Somebody's soul? Parker, I want us to maintain our short position on consolidated industries. It's bleeding down steadily, and we should help depress it a bit, too. No, I'm not afraid of anything like that. They won't get a government contract. We can see to it. Uh, Pick up National Computer and Starlight Oil. I want our full concentration on those three. I'll call you back later. Yes, Mrs. Dollard. Come in. Mr. Johnson... George Morrissey is here. And about time. I want hourly reports on Consolidated, National, and Starlight. The see to it that Parker can always reach me. Now, have Morrissey come in. But, sir, about Morrissey... Is there a problem? Well, I... I... You were saying... Perhaps I should have said... Mrs. Dollard, are you all right? Perhaps I should have said... There's a man outside who claims to be George Morrissey. Mrs. Dollard, you know George Morrissey. I... I thought I did. If there's any doubt, check security. I did. Then that settles it. He could never hope to get past the lobby elevators if he weren't George Morris. Mr. Johnson, maybe what I'm trying to say is there's a man out there. And I don't want him to be George Morrissey. 
Have him come in here. Yes, sir. Mr. Johnson will see you now. Do you see what I mean, Mr. Johnson? Mrs. Dollard, is this your idea of a practical joke? Who is this? Please, please, R.J., don't yell at her. I, I can't stand noise. I, uh... George? Yes, George. You can't be George. Look at me, R.J. Look at me. I can't believe it. Uh, you... You don't want to believe it. What happened to you? Please, please let me, let me sit down. He walked out of this office three weeks ago. Yes, yes, three weeks ago. He, he was a man of 35, and now... Now I, I know, I know. I look in the mirror. I could be 75. His hair is all white, He's wrinkled, stupid. And that's not the worst of it. I feel 75. I couldn't even walk without this cane. George, the first thing you have to do is tell me exactly what happened. I I was at Manitou Mountain getting the development deal set, and R.J., listen, we'll have to forget it. Give it up. What are you saying? I'm saying forget it. Look at what happened to me. They said, all the locals, they said, the mountain was haunted. Terrible things would happen to anyone who went up there. Talk sense. Can't you believe your eyes, R.J.? Look at what happened to me. George, start at the beginning. I... I couldn't get anyone to drive up the mountain road. So I hired a car. I drove it myself. I drove it up the mountain and... Uh... Yes, and? Hey, that's all I remember, R.J. I must have passed out up there. But something did happen. It's... It's like a nightmare. I can't bring it into focus. Just flashes of it. Terrible things. Be specific. What kind of terrible things? Shapes, forms, voices saying I was going to die. That my life was falling away. That it was it was disappearing. What kind of shapes? What sort of forms? I I don't know. What size were they? What color? I, I don't you know. You say voices. What kind? High, low? Oh, Jay, I were don't Were they men's know. voices? Women? I can't remember. I can't now remember. pull yourself together. Pull myself together. Look at me. I'm an old man. I've been robbed of half my life. Now think. How long did you stay on the mountain? I... I don't know. Somehow I managed to get the car turned around. I, I drove back to town. I found a doctor. What's his name? I... I don't know. What did he say? I can't remember. R.J., I came here to warn you. The mountain, it's haunted. It's cursed. Give up the project. Mrs. Dollard, call Dr. Watterson. No. No. Doctor can't help me anymore. But I can help you, R.J. Give it up. Give up the project. <laughs> Dr. Watterson? Ah, yes, yes. Keep him on fluids, and whatever you do, see that he remains absolutely calm. That was the resident. About George? No change in his condition. Have you checked the local doctor? The one who saw him first? Well, we called him. He reports he treated a man of about 70 for exhaustion. That's all you could get out of him? And that's all he had to say. And what have you got to say, Doctor? We find that George Morrissey has the physical signs of a man in his 70s. But you know very well he is not in his 70s. Chronologically, no. Medically, yes. Is there a disease that could age a man so radically in so short a time? Uh, I would say a man could be ravaged by some psychic or physical attack, but here we have no signs of trauma. His tissues, organs, nervous system, circulatory system, they show the deterioration that could only be caused by aging. Let's cut through all this, Doctor. How did it happen? We don't know. You don't know. Am I supposed to buy this nonsense about a haunted mountain, curses and all that? I don't have the answer, R.J. Watterson, over the years, I have contributed millions for medical research. I bought this whole hospital for you. So, are you telling me that now, when I need some answers, I'm not going to get anything for my money? I'm telling you that we have no answers, 
at this time. Hmm. Is it possible that George could be faking? Why should he want to fake? Answer my question. The answer is no. I want to see him. He's very weak. Is it important? I don't make unimportant requests. Well, just for a minute or two at most. And please, don't excite him. Club championship, and I was named third team All America. George. <laughs> girls, you should see how the girls would fall all over George, me. George, pay attention. Huh? Oh. Oh, it's, it's you, R.J. Listen. No, 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 George. Don't try to sit up, but I've got to talk to R.J. Listen, R.J., are you listening? I'm listening. Here's what happens to you up there on the mountain. I remember, you see. Now. I remember. R.J., don't excite him, I accept full responsibility. Up there on that mountain, I was told you will lose that which you value most. Told? You say told? How? By whom? I I don't know. How can we get anywhere if you keep saying you don't know? Think. uh, R.J., I order you from this room. He's going to die soon, anyhow. We have to get that information. R.J., I will call security and have the guards throw you out of here. No, no, Doctor. No, leave us alone. This is between R.J. and me. What were you told, George? I I wasn't really told. It was more like a a kind of feeling, an idea that that seemed to, to seep into me. And I realized the most important thing... What mattered most to me was my body. Talk sense. I'm talking sense, R.J. And I began to lose my body. What do you mean, lose your body? The way you really lose it. To old age. Only, oh God, only I was losing it then and there. And all at once. Is that what you think happened, Morrissey? But look. Look, I I got away from there, you see. I got away just before I would have died. But why? I should have stayed. Look at me. What good am I now? Be calm and practical, George. We have the greatest doctors in the world here. We'll beat this thing. Uh, You can still beat it, R.J. You, you can still beat it. Just don't go near that mountain. Just give up the project. You wanted me, Mr. Johnson? As Parker called while I was out. Yes, sir. He reported in. Consolidated stock is still falling. That's good. National computer is rising. And Starlight Oil is doing well with the new government. Tell him to increase our holdings by 10%. Now, cancel the rest of today and all of tomorrow. Yes, sir. Call Chuck Daly. I want him here in three quarters of an hour. Uh, sir. What is it? Well, Chuck's about to leave for Florida. His daughter's getting married this afternoon. Tell him he is to fly me up to the Manitou Mountain area. But, Mr. Johnson... Now, what is it, Mrs. Dollar? You can't go up to Manitou Mountain. Why not? Well, you saw what happened. What did happen? You saw George Morrissey. About George Morrissey. Either he caught a disease... But medical science doesn't know of such a disease. Medical science is constantly being surprised. Obviously, someone does not want me to develop the Manitou Mountain Resort Complex. And perhaps they managed to buy George Morrissey. But I would bet my life on George Morrissey. You must never bet your life on anybody, Mrs. Dollard. The nearest town to Manitou Mountain is Lafayette Center. Reserve a room for me there at the motel. But he is George Morrissey. Fingerprints, dental records. Reserve it under the name R.J. Smith. Mr. Johnson... Are you going up there alone? You know perfectly well, Mrs. Dollar, that the way to get something done is to do it yourself. But isn't it dangerous for you to go? Mrs. Dollar, I have complete freedom of action because, as you know very well, practically nobody on the outside has the faintest idea of what I look like. How many days do you plan to spend with us, Mr. Uh, Smith? Well, that all depends. Oh? On what? Uh, do you suppose I could hire a car and driver? Oh, let's see. I have some cards here. Pick out any name. Tell them Doris Evans over at the motel recommended you. 
Do you mean I need a recommendation to hire a car? Well, it's deer season. Can't expect a man to concentrate on his business. I would think you can if you pay him and he recognizes his obligation. Well, I can see you're a very serious-minded person, Mr. Smith. What brings you up to our uh, frivolous part of the world? I intend to do some sightseeing. Sightseeing? Well, I hear you have some very beautiful country. Oh, yes, we do have a lot of very beautiful country up here. Wild, unspoiled... And we aim to keep it that way, too. Uh, Tell me, is there a doctor in town? Oh, I hope nothing's wrong. I wouldn't want you to get sick on us while you're here. No, I should just be checked every now and then. Oh, well, we do have Doc Stallings. Does he have office hours now? (laughs) His office hours are when he's not hunting or fishing. But I think he'd give up a chance at a 12-point buck for you. Why? Well, he doesn't get an opportunity like this every day. To do what? To treat the world-famous R.J. Johnson. I see. Uh, how did you know oh, I... Oh, I'm sorry. Really, I, I shouldn't have given it away. After all, if you want to call yourself Mr. Smith, we should indulge that little conceit. But how did you know? Mr. Johnson, the whole town knows you're up here. Why, we've all been waiting for you. <laughs> We've all been waiting. Waiting for what reason? Had they also been waiting for George Morrissey? And George was only R.J. Johnson's hired man. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. For children growing up in homes without books, there's a special emptiness. A deep-down hunger for the world beyond the street corner or playground. A world where they could grow up to become... Whatever they want to be. The millions of these children will never find out about that world. Because they'll never know what they can learn in books. Unless you help. Riff, reading is fundamental. He is helping to get millions of books into the hands of these boys and girls. Books they can choose themselves for keeps. And once a child gets into books, there's no stopping him. More than 150 local Riff programs are proving it in communities like yours. Won't you help Riff help the children in your community? Write to Riff Incorporated. That's RIF, care of Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C., 20560. Give your hand to a friend. Give your heart to your love. But give your cold. Contact the sooner the better. Hey, I'm back. How's that cold? Rotten. Get the contact? I got everything. Contact, cold tablets, and this liquid. Oh, no. Honey, it's all cold medicine. Well, sure, but it only takes one contact for up to 12 hours, continuous relief from sneezy, drips, congestion. For that, I'd need six of your cold tablets. Two every four hours. Or three ounces of nighttime liquid. One every four hours. Or just one contact. The tiny time pills do it. Well, it's all cold medicine. Those others contain antipyretic analgesics. The liquid, antitussis, and alcohol. They're not in contact. Six or three or one. I choose the one contact. Me too. And I'm the one with the cold. Give cold. Contact the sooner the better. Six or three or one. When you catch a cold, take contact. Only as directed. One of the world's wealthiest men sits in the tiny lobby of a small motel in an out-of-the-way village somewhere in the Adirondacks. And suddenly he feels that all of his money and power somehow seem to be very far away at this anxious moment. You say the whole town's been waiting for me, Mrs. Evans? Yes, we've been waiting. Why? Well, you own us now. I own you? In a manner of speaking... You own all the land that surrounds this village. I would think of myself as more of a neighbor. Well, we don't think your plans for the area will make you a good neighbor. You had your chance to protest against the project at the hearing. And we did. And after the legislature weighed all the pros and cons, they acted in the interests of the entire state, not your narrow provincial prejudices. You really believe that, don't you? I certainly do. Well, we know why... Certain votes went a certain way. Oh, do you? Suppose you tell me. We know there was bribery, 
And pressure. Really? None of this was found by the special prosecutor's office. Well, I must admit, though, I admire your courage. My courage? To come up here, all alone, without your thugs. Oh, just a minute, Mrs. Evans. Oh, they have clean fingernails, excellent manners, college degrees. But they help you to steal and cover your tracks. In that sense, they're no better than common thugs. You really believe that, don't you? Now, let me set you straight. I have never done anything illegal. Oh, you can't be serious. No court has ever found me guilty of any crime. Congratulations. But here's what I am guilty of. Success. And this has earned me the envy and the hatred of millions of people. But that's human nature. I understand that. What I don't understand is the attitude of the people in this town. I'm not taking anything from you. I'm going to make every one of you rich. Can't you believe it? Oh, yes. We believe it. Do you have any idea how property values in this town will skyrocket when the development is here? Yes, indeed. Then why is everybody so unhappy? You know, you remind me of my husband. My late husband, that is. In what way? He was an unsuccessful version of you. He also worshipped money. But he didn't know how to make it. Now, what happened to your husband? He went up to what your investment brochure calls Manitou Mountain. Dead Man's Mountain, we call it around here, and it... Well, it killed him. How could the mountain kill him? It's an old Indian legend. Unless your conscience is completely clear, that mountain will kill you. Well, it killed poor Sidney Evans, rest his soul. Killed him? How? He was discovered at the foot of it. He was completely shriveled. There must be an explanation. Doc Stallings never found it. He just wrote it up as death due to causes unknown. Stallings is, after all, only a country doctor. That's right, he is. Tell me, how do your high-powered city doctors explain Mr. Morrissey? Who do you know about Mr. Morrissey? Oh, the whole town knows about Mr. Morrissey. Poor Mr. Morrissey, he went up there... Something he had no business doing. I must correct that. He had every business doing it. He was my agent inspecting my property on orders from me. But the fact is, he went up there, and the mountain got him. Have other people met with mysterious results after climbing that mountain? Oh, very few and far between. We may be just country folk up here, but we learn from experience. <laughs> Are you Dr. Stallings? Well, look who's here. They said you'd be out fishing. <laughs> well, that's never a bad guess, but it takes two, and the trout won't play. I'd like to talk to you. Sure. I'm willing to pay you for a consultation. Oh, I intend to charge you. Well? Well, what? Well, aren't you going to come up here out of the water? Well, you see, I got my eye out for a certain brown trout. So you just tell me your symptoms... I'll decide whether I have to examine you. An employee of mine. You treated him recently. George Morrissey. Oh, him. What happened to George Morrissey? Well, I met him at the motel. It was a Thursday night. I go there for dinner whenever Doris Evans serves pot roast. Hey, you're lucky. She's having it tonight. About Mr. Morrissey. Oh, he was a serious kind of fellow. About like you... Same no-nonsense, let's-get-right-down-to-it attitude. I'm only interested in what happened to Morrissey. What uh, happened? Well, he wanted to hire somebody to drive him up to Dead Man's Mouth. And nobody would do it. That's right. Why? Well, you've been told why by now, I'm sure. I'm asking you why. I'll tell you the same thing. That's impossible. Why is it impossible? Oh, I see what you're thinking. It's all right for the simple-minded hicks up here to swallow that superstitious nonsense. But me, I'm a doctor. A product of a highly sophisticated, specialized education. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Well, think again. Because I believe it, too. There has to be a reasonable, logical, rational explanation for what happened to George Morrissey. Oh, there is, there is. He offended the spirit of the mountain. Oh, you consider that reasonable, logical, rational? Would you feel better if I said there's something up in that mountain, a virus, a bacillus, a fungus, which somehow causes immediate aging? It would be a more rational explanation. <laughs> you mean more acceptable. I want to know what you believe. 
And I'll pay you for it. I believe the evidence. If you go up there, you can die. But why? Because a great spirit lives up there and he values his privacy. That's impossible. I saw George Morrissey at dinner one night. A vigorous, athletic-looking man in his 30s. I saw him again the following evening. A broken old man, half dead. And you explain it with this half-baked legend. Uh, well, how do your city doctors, with all their modern facilities, explain it? Your Dr. Watterson, a world-famous diagnostician, he called me. He asked me. This thing has to be cleared up. Why? What's wrong with a nice, quiet mystery? If word of this becomes general, it can destroy the entire project. Uh Uh-huh. Is that bad? Millions of people will be deprived of an opportunity to enjoy healthful recreation in a fresh country environment. Ah, but it won't be fresh country, you see. You'll have super highways and smoke and noise and honky-tonk resorts. I'm convinced that you people are up to something. Well, you tell me what. I don't know. But I assure you, I have the resources to find out. Well, if you ever do, let me know. Well, did you find Doc Stallings? My secretary should have called me on the hour. Oh, she did. We serve dinner till 9.30, but the best time to eat is around 6. From then on, it's leftovers. I'll have a sandwich sent up to my room. Oh, you're joking. I don't tell jokes. You mean all you want for dinner is a sandwich? Mrs. Evans, food is merely fuel. The body is just a machine, and so my tastes are very simple. Whom do rich men think they impress when they say they have simple tastes? Do you have a wife? I never married. Oh? Well, so far we've eliminated wine and women. I can see by looking at you that the, there isn't too much song. Well, what do you do with all your money? I make it grow. Well, whatever you do, don't go up that mountain. I don't think I need any more advice from anyone around here. I would like to place a call to New York. You go up, up that mountain, and when you come down, you'll be penniless. You have my secretary's number there. Please put it through. Just remember, I told you. It's exactly five minutes past four, Mrs. Dollard. I know that, sir. Why haven't you heard from Parker? I'm expecting a call any moment. Any moment was not his orders. I specifically directed him to report on the hour. Yes, sir. Why is there a delay? I don't know. We'll find out. Mr. Johnson, I'm only human. What did you say, Mrs. Dollard? Mrs. Dollard? Operator. Operator. Now, see here, Mrs. Evans. Oh, Mr. Johnson, I was just trying to reach your room. I've been cut off in the middle of a crucial telephone call. Carlotta, the phone company operator, she just told me that we can't get through to New York for a bit. What are you saying? Well, you've seen those signs along the roads. Look out for falling rocks. Well, we just had a pretty good slide on Route 640. But I must talk to New York. A lot of wires are down, but Ev Bailey and his boys will have it fixed before long. Oh, Hi, Doc. Hello, Doris. And why does the celebrated R.J. Johnson look so agitated? Well, he can't make a phone call. Oh, my, my, my. You know, Mr. Johnson, as a physician, I have a prescription that could keep you healthy and happy for years. Doctor, I'm in no mood for your folksy philosophy. I have to make a phone call. Don't you want to hear my prescription? How long will it take to repair the lines? No, maybe an hour. An hour? Maybe less. I would prescribe the following. Chuck it all, Mr. Johnson. Give it up. Settle down here and marry Doris. Oh, I'm not sure I'd want to marry him, Doc. I'm not out to marry anybody. Oh, why not? What's going on in this town? Are you people crazy? Where's the police station? The, the police station? Well, we, uh, we do have a sheriff. Send for him. What do you want the sheriff for? There has to be some kind of plot. Uh, where can I find the sheriff? Oh, you don't have to find him. He's, he's coming in the door right now. Hi, Elwood. Evening, folks. Ah, a gentleman here wants to see you, Elwood. Yes, sir. Sheriff, I need your help. That's what we're here for, sir. My name is R.J. Johnson. Pleased to meet you. Sheriff, these people are trying to... Uh, these people are trying to... Uh, yes, sir. These people are out to do me harm. Which people? Among others, these two. 
Yeah, but Doc Stallings here is the greatest guy you'd ever hope to meet. Matter of fact, he takes care of me. And I personally vouch for Doris. She's my sister. <laughs> Very nice, tidy little town. And the natives are so friendly and obliging. And so concerned with your well-being. But right now, R.J. Johnson feels overwhelmed by their solicitude. As if he is being literally killed with kindness. We'll return shortly with Act Three. Ever see a beer drinker pour his beer real easy down the side of the glass? Maybe you do it yourself. If so, the Budweiser brewmaster thinks you're missing something, especially if you're a Budweiser drinker. You see, Bud is brewed, so it will kick up a healthy head of foam. Exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation make it a lively brew. Well, anyway, pouring Bud plunk down the middle of the glass helps bring out the best in that clean white Budweiser foam and real beer aroma. It also helps you get the full benefit of a taste, smoothness, and drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. Remember, brewing beer right does make a difference. Next time, pour that Budweiser right down the middle and see for yourself. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. I'm Art Linkletter, and I'd like to talk about something that everybody loves. Babies. Play School has introduced a group of fascinating baby toys. Play School, a Milton Bradley company, has been making toys for generations of preschool children. And their baby toys are just terrific. They're fun and safe. Babies will love the baby action ball. They can grab it, roll it, shake it, or throw it. The baby mirror of unbreakable stainless steel, introduces them to the most important person in the world when they look into the mirror, themselves. The Play School toddler truck is great for baby to scoot around in, and it even has a miniature telephone for baby's first phone calls. My children are grown up now, but if they were babies, I know what I'd want them to have, the Play School baby toys. Your children are going to love making discoveries every day with Play School's new baby toys. And every day is a good day to make a baby happy. Are the people of Lafayette Center the kindly, generous-hearted folks they seem to be? Or is this a place of evil where death waits for strangers? especially a wealthy stranger like R.J. Johnson. How are these good people out to harm you, Mr. Johnson? I don't know, Sheriff, but something is going on. And I demand protection until I can get some of my own people up here. Hey, you've got to appreciate my position, Mr. Johnson. There's nothing I can do unless you make a charge. Well, we're only trying to help him, Elwood. You see, I look at this man's face and I hear the tension in his voice and I see his, uh, his color, you know. So I say to him, change your way of life. Settle down up here. Is that harming him? Well, it doesn't seem like it. I recommend a more regular routine. And we both keep warning him, stay away from Dead Man's Mountain. Mr. Johnson? Think about for reasons best known to yourselves, you people are determined to keep strangers at a distance. Oh, we'd only be too happy if more folks would move up here. And so you invented this nonsense about a cursed and haunted mountain. But why? You know why, Sheriff. Because to any man of intelligence and courage, it presents a challenge. But before a man goes up there, you prepare him. Well, gentlemen, you can stay and listen to all this. I've got to serve dinner. By all means, Mrs. Evans. We can continue this discussion at the table. Oh, I thought all you wanted was a sandwich. Oh, no. Tonight, I'm having all the trimmings. Here you are, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Hot roast, mashed potatoes, peas and carrots. Now, that's a cure for whatever ails you. Uh, hold on. Dr. Stallings, change plates with me, please. Why? It's the same portion. Except I always give you a little bit less, uh, Doc. Would you mind changing plates, Doctor? No, not if you tell me why. 
since I'm going up to the mountain, there could be something in this food. A drug, perhaps. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Very well, Mr. Johnson. Here, have it your way. Uh, you say you're going up the mountain? Yes. After all we told you? I'm going up that mountain to prove that it's just an ordinary piece of undeveloped country real estate. Can you stop him? Why well, would everybody want to stop me? Well, look what it did to your Mr. Morris. Suppose, for the sake of argument, there is something dangerous up there. And it gets me. Isn't that to your interest? Without me, there can't be a development project. Well, we have a more basic interest. We have obligations as human beings. Well... Now, I will need a car. There's a road, I assume. Oh, yes, sir. Leads up to the top. But why go now? At night? Because the word should get around. R.J. Johnson drove up this... this dead man's mountain, as you call it, in the dead of night, and just as calmly drove down again. But, Mr. Johnson, You really... have something to learn, Mrs. Evans. You think a man becomes rich through trickery, violence, and all manner of illegal, immoral, and unethical acts. I never said that. But you believe it. Tonight, you're going to discover how I became rich. By daring to do what other people consider impossible. It's that simple. I uh, would still advise you to keep away from that mountain. Let's end the little game, Doctor. I've humored all you people long enough. Well, very well. How do you account for George Morrissey? Very simple. George Morrissey is not R.J. Johnson. Does the spirit of the mountain, going along with the legend, kill everyone whose conscience is not clear? Very well. I'm safe. My conscience is unblemished. Elwood, I still think you should stop him. The sheriff has no right to interfere. I'm merely inspecting my own property. Well, he's right, Doris. A little exercise in morality here. Who would care to accompany me? You look down on me. You are the pillars of virtue. You mean there isn't a clear conscience among the three of you? I'll drive you. Doris. Doris, what are you saying? He's challenged us. But, Doris, you know you can't fight the mountain. Well, we can't let somebody else get killed up there either. Well, what can you do? Well, at the first sign of anything suspicious, I can turn the car around. Mr. Johnson, you've got yourself a driver. And I suggest we leave right now. The moon goes down early around here. Uh, first, I have to call New York. But the lines are still down. How do you know? Carlotta will let us know when they're fixed. Maybe I'd better wait. Oh. Don't tell me you're starting to have uh, second thoughts. I have some very important things to check out. Well, we can drive to the top of the mountain and back again in an hour. How do you know? Have you done it before? No. Just a guess. And I'm ready if you are. What is it, Mrs. Evans? Well, we're here. We're at the foot of Dead Man's Mountain. And there, you see, on your right, mm? is the dirt road that leads upward. How far? Oh, I don't know. Well, what are we waiting for? You won't change your mind, Mr. Johnson? No. I still don't understand why you have to do this. This is another reason why I'm a rich man. I buy stock nobody else believes in. I finance schemes other people think are harebrained. I back men no one else will work with. And I climb mountains everyone else is scared by. I'm climbing this mountain, too. Then you also deserve to be rich. Well, do we go ahead, or do we turn back? One must always go ahead, Mrs. Evans. Then, here goes. How do you feel, Mrs. Evans? All right. I guess. You guess? How do you feel? I don't have to guess. I know. I feel great. It should be interesting. What? Let's assume all you people are right. This mountain is haunted by a great spirit who strikes down all who have guilt. Which one of us do you suppose he'll strike down? Well, I don't have a guilty conscience. I wonder about that. I heard the doctor say you had a weakness for men with problems. Your late husband, 
Maybe he didn't have problems. Maybe you had the problems. Well, we all have problems. Stop for a moment. What's the matter? I think I... I heard somebody. I haven't heard a sound. Uh, listen. R.J., I'll have the security guards throw you out of here. It's Watterson. It's Dr. Watterson. What's he doing up here? Who's Dr. Watterson? He's looking after George Morrissey. I'll throw you out of here. Didn't you hear him? There's no one around but you and me. Now that I think of it, that's a strange way for Watterson to talk to me. He would never have the guts to say that unless, unless he knew something. Look, I think we'd better no, turn no, no, around. No, 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 I think I'm learning something. Watterson, do you know that Watterson is Parker's son-in-law? Well, who's Parker? My administrative assistant. He executes all my orders. Suppose Consolidated Industries is not going down. Suppose it's starting to go up. Suppose Parker is still holding... Oh, come on, Mr. Johnson. Just just relax. Huh? Now, if it's too much for you up here, let's turn back... Tell me, Mrs. Evans... How did you know I'd be here? Well, we, we just assumed. No one told you. Who would tell us? A pilot. My pilot. I didn't even know you had one. He may have been put out because I made him fly me here on his daughter's wedding day. Oh, well, that really wasn't nice. I pay him enough, but he didn't tell you. No. Listen. I don't hear Shut anything. Just listen. There. I'm only... Why would she answer me like that if she didn't know something? I don't hear a thing, Mr. Johnson. I'm only human. I'm only human. Let me tell you about her. She's quiet. She's almost mousy. But she's ambitious. I can tell. I've made her a rich woman. She's in on it. She's in on it, too. She and Parker and Morrissey, they worked it out. And you're in on it, too. Me? They wanted me out of the way. And so all of you got together. You worked up this phony scheme. Look, we're going to turn back. Answer the phone. What phone? Answer it. Hello. Hello. Mr. Johnson, I have the latest quote on consolidated. It's going up. It can't go up. It's gone up five points. Uh, Get Parker. Close it out. Close it out. I can't find Parker. Get him. Get him. Mrs. Dollard. Mrs. Dollard. Who are you talking to? My secretary. She hung up on me. How could she hang up? There's no phone. Consolidated is going up. But there's no stock market at night. Mr. Johnson. It's going crazy. National computer is going down. Have Parker sell at once. I can't find Parker. Mrs. Dollard. Mrs. Dollard. She's gone again. Listen to me, Mr. Johnson. Please listen. Do you know how much money I've lost so far? Please, listen. You, you have nothing to be afraid of. It's just a legend. Who can be sure it's true? Oh, sure, we, we local people push it to scare away developers. I feel weak. As if I lost a lot of blood. Listen, you're R.J. Johnson. You're not to be taken in with this superstitious nonsense. Fight it off! I, I, I can't. I'm trying. But all my strength is going. My money is disappearing. Your money isn't your strength. It is, it is. I, I have nothing else. Please, Answer the phone for me. I, I, I can hardly lift the receiver. The rebel government just nationalized Starlight Oil. What? Well, what is? What, what did you say, Mrs. Dollard? Mrs. Dollard. Mr. Johnson, we're leaving. What? It. It happened. Everything. Everything I was afraid of happened. Consolidated went up. National went down. And Starlight... Nothing happened. It's all your imagination. Mr. Johnson, 
Mr. Johnson. Talk to me. Mr. Johnson. <laughs> Doris, I don't know. There isn't a mark or a sign on him. It's as if all the force and vital energy just left his body. Well, maybe it's all for the best. He was in trouble. Trouble? It was on the news. Some of his holdings went haywire for some reason. Three big companies. He's out millions. He may have died just in time. <laughs> the mountain. The mountain. What what about the mountain? It's true. Every word we say about it. It's true. Oh, come on, sis. How can it be true? The mountain killed him. He took away his money. Doris, are you all right? I I don't know. I don't know yet. I I wonder. What did it do to me? What did it do to Doris? Everybody loses what he values most up on Dead Man's Mountain, as the saying goes. Maybe Doris had fallen in love with R.J., and thus the mountain robbed her, too. I'll be back shortly. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Better Business Bureau knows. For heaven's sake, this store won't give me back my $25 for the ice skates. All they would give me is this credit slip, and they don't even have any more skates in my size. Oh, what am I going to do? Madam, not all stores make cash refunds on returns, you know. Who are you? I'm the man from the Better Business Bureau. You know, only some stores will make refunds because it's their policy to do so, not because they're required to do so. Next time, remember, find out about a store's policy on refunds and exchanges before you buy. I guess you're right. Well, you know, it's just another tip from your better business group. Haunted Mountains. Did this one cause certain stocks to go up and down one day recently? It certainly seems no more far-fetched than some of the explanations people have for the market. The cast in our exercise in The Extraordinary included Alan Hewitt, Bryna Rayburn, William Redfield, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. The only way to learn how to swim is to jump in the water, right? I simply can't make you understand, can well, I? Well, maybe I can make you understand. Ah, forget it. You want to get that dinner ready? I'm hungry. Yes, yes, I'm going now. Uh, look, uh, why don't you change first? Change? Yeah, yeah, your clothes. Get more comfortable. Yes, I think I'd like to do that, George. I, I won't be long. George! George, there's a dog on our bed! A horrible big dog! Oh, take it easy. That's my surprise. That's a teller. Get him out of here. Please, George, take him away. It's only a dog for Pete's sake. He's not going to hurt you. Get it out, George! Please! Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated. Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. KRLD's Mystery Theater presents... Seven thrilling dramas each week. 